you pull the little loop. Is it a hand operated one or a mouth operated slide whistle? Both. There's a hand and a mouth involved. Yeah, I thought the slide whistle. Okay, What's the slide fair whistles enough. without the the slide part? I don't know. I thought you, you kind of like pulled it. Just a whistle. And then as you. Well, there's somewhere like the plastic ones where they have like a little. It's like a cylinder with a loop you pull. And as you pull it, the volume inside the cylinder changes, so it gets higher pitched or lower pitched as as you pull it, because mm. the air going through it passes through a different area. At least, uh, is that I how all of them work? No, I don't think so. I think there are there's a variety of slide whistles from all over the world. Different cultures have different <laughs> slide whistles. And there are slide whistles for different, you know, uh, oh, income clowning. brackets. You have the cheap plastic ones. You have the ones they have, like, the big orchestras. Yeah, clowning um, is no joke. There's a serious amount of work that's gone into it. Over clowning is no joke. Clowning is no laughing business. No. And it's wrong hey, that I'm they keep making movies uh, trying to spread that it is. I personally have no idea what a slide whistle is. Oh my gosh. Yes, but you yeah. do. You probably do. No. That's a lie. I mean, you a whistle. It goes like, <laughs> I, I talk while I do it. You can kind of hear it. Maybe a. <laughs> no, it just, uh, it just doesn't sound quite right. When you you have one of those cheap, shitty slide whistles. No, that that's because I have to like, wish .com. talk into it while I do it, or else it, it don't work. <laughs> you you wish that you had a better slide whistle. That's true. Hey, I wish this I had a like better a slide whistle. That's not a great one. It's better than nothing, though. He doesn't use I a slide whistle in the first or second film. So, yeah, really, what's the point? Like, I don't get what the point of these were, movie. really. Exactly. I wonder if you gave Why that picture to someone what they think it was. If I, if I like saw this without context, I would not assume <laughs> it's a whistle. Uh, I would say it looks like a baseball bat with a mouth. He's like, hello, <laughs> I'm a baseball <laughs> bat. <laughs> it's a cloud baseball bat. That's right, and for some reason he sounds like Mr. Frog, because of course he does. <laughs> Hello. Because uh, he's Hello. brain damaged from being hit with baseballs Hello. all the time? <laughs> yeah, exactly, it's a difficult life. Alright. How Hello, do you think everybody. of the baseball? Well, maybe it's the, the <laughs> baseball has a worse life. That's a hoof. Welcome to yet another bonus EFAP episode, because there's just so much going on. Yeah. We've tried to stuff it all into into everything. Gosh, you know, Rings of Power really just, it was it was just taking up all the room. That big old fat show just sitting on the sofa, and now other other lads are trying to sit in and be like, hey, I'm here too. Like Agatha, like Joker too. And so it's time to get to it. Um, yeah. Can't deny the cultural discussion that's happened already. You all know the vibe. <laughs> it's not a happy one. Unfortunately. Um, we're, we uh, could not put on a happy face, or at least I could. I actually, we haven't discussed anything really regarding this movie, and I haven't watched any reviews. I haven't done anything like that. Um, so, oh uh, well, that's all I've. That's just you, man. I, yeah, I'm a lot more familiar with what's been going on in terms of uh, yes, yeah, I've only heard, I've only seen or like heard because you, you just seen and hear things. I've only two things. I have only heard that it's terrible, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot. Can we say? There's um involuntary um he was raped, okay? That's what the <laughs> memes are about. The memes are that he got raped. And so mm -hmm. that's all I know going into this, just because you see the memes popping up everywhere and I'm like, oh my goodness gracious, what's what's going on here? Just it's, to it's crazy. Clarify as well, someone just said, Wait, is Morla gonna be missing EFAP for this? I think you mean open bar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like <laughs> you will be. The next episode will not have Mahler but, because um, he's missing it for this. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no open bar this week. Hence why we're actually uh, streaming today. It makes some sense. There's a little slot open. You guys are not going to get your your fix. We're going to have to make up for the lack of Scottish with some other stuff. We, look at look at this cast here. Oh my god, so much such variety. That's true. We're very multicultural. Mm. Yes. I'm from America, and Mahler's from. Wales, yeah, land. you got it. Fringy is from the the great from Dan Anda. Nice. Cap uh, is yeah. from yeah. Cap is from Wisconsin. <laughs> Nuts is from Iceland. So we cover all of the corners of the world. I was gonna say that's you the get five to see corners, the whole right? world's perspective. <laughs> yeah, this is this film is a uniting film. It actually unites yes, us all together. And and that it made no money. Wow, <laughs> it made some <laughs> money, but it's that, uh. 
we all united elsewhere in the world that wasn't the movie theater to go to be at. Well, no, it uh, it it made less money on opening day than the Flash and the Marvels, um, and the domestic. I heard it was like off, Morbius, anyway. the Flash. Movie. <laughs> yes, yeah. you don't want yeah, these names propping up funny. when people talk about your movie. They're, they're bad names. Yeah. Uh, bad names. It, yeah. <laughs> Even three, when they say three, well, it was five. better than the Flash, not <laughs> you a good thing to be. No, not a good <laughs> thing. Not even that. Uh, <laughs> it usually doesn't times, need to be said. Three times less uh, money in the domestic opening weekend than the first film, which uh -oh. cost a fourth as much money. Yeah, this one was like two hundred million dollars compared to the first one, which yeah, was fifty-five uh, million. <laughs> Yeah. So, so just said not gonna lie yeah. feels like the usual nitpicking we haven't even talked about it yet we haven't started <laughs> we haven't said we haven't the box <laughs> office is nitpicking we're talking about the box <laughs> office and how it's i'm sure that that's how warner brothers feels right now is they're pulling their hair out watching yeah. the money go up and flame. yeah <laughs> well this is just nitpicking you know you gotta look at the bigger picture here give us a chance to nitpick picture. jeez <laughs> yeah we have not yet begun to nitpick exactly. literally we haven't begun i, I can brag Oh yeah, I can brag that I have slightly contributed to it in making less money because <gasps> my mom's a teacher and uh, she was thinking about bringing her class to this movie, and I was like, no, 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 wait, wait for class. me. <laughs> what age yeah. group does she teach? She well, in my country, it's quite different. They're actually eleventh graders, but she sort of has like an entire class under her. <laughs> okay, but what age is that? Yeah. Uh, 17, I think. 16, 17. Oh, okay. So that's rated R. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be. <laughs> yeah, you were concerned. Well, for perhaps um, no human should be subjected. And, um... what, what is her, what does she teach? <laughs> medieval torture methods or what? No, what is actually. The, the... <laughs> English. <laughs> Similar. Ooh. Oh, they do speak English but... in this movie. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I was like, <laughs> I heard. It's oh. terrible, so wait for me until I see it, so I can like grin, grin light you or grin light it for you. Damn and man, uh, I came out and I was like, "Mom, don't, <laughs> don't, just don't." <laughs> and um, she actually told the kids because of me to not, we're not going to see this movie, and they were like, "Sure," and I'm, I'm happy about that. The kids, for the first time ever, declined the field trip. <laughs> <laughs> to, the, like, oh, to the fucking God, cinema of all places. School. Yeah, they're like, yeah. I'd rather land, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, might, I mean, I told my mom, like, take them to Transformers 1 or something. <laughs> this is <just> fine. <laughs> I've heard Transformers 1's good. Yeah, same. Um, I, thought, I thought it was alright. I, uh, yeah. Eh. It's got more hype. Maybe yeah. it's because it's surrounded by some releases here that aren't doing as well. You yeah, know? Uh, well, I mean, you say it's got some hype, but I'm pretty sure it's not doing too well at the box office either. Oh, no. Uh, Social media yeah. hype, not box mm -hmm. office hype. Um, I don't know if you know Which, about the meme, I mean, but there's like a there's, awesome there's a Twitter that's... account guy who every single viral post uh, makes an effort to market Transformers One. It's quite funny. I feel bad for him because obviously mean, it hasn't not... reflected. Yeah, into... it's not working. Yeah, but, well, but <laughs> you, the best you could do is being done. You know, like you, you got to appreciate he's yeah. uh, he's done what he can. <laughs> if, if maybe know, maybe be like even worse there. off without it. It's definitely a byproduct of just too many. Too many movies, too many Transformers movies that haven't done. Oh, that's that's a bit unfortunate though. Wow, Wild Robot has a budget of seventy eight million dollars and it has made about a hundred million dollars. It's been out for a couple of weeks, so hopefully that. We were gonna go see it today, better. my mom and I. But what's um, going on? I told this. you both to go watch it. We are very <laughs> yeah. busy. We were gonna go today, but we have to talk oh, about it. Joker too. <laughs> Sorry, the way the way that was delivered, it sounds like Friggy told Rax's mom to go watch it. He said, "You too. <laughs> Your mom would love it. Go and watch Friggy. it. God damn it! <laughs> Look, all right, you should. You should go watch it. It's a good movie. I want to go see it. I really do. We we were legitimately we planned to go see it today, but then I was like, oh shit, right." You're talking about yeah, Joker well, 2. Yeah. Mom, we can't go see yeah. the wild robot. I have to talk about the Joker 2 for my job. Yeah, well, <laughs> for my weird job. Um, uh, which... Oh, well, I, I, was say, I don't know. It, 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 it's not going to be a huge shock. We could do it quickly, the, the brawl, because we kind of already... Nuts has done uh, her, her experience, kind of. Her, her perspective in a... In a I was going to say, my, my quick vision would be the... Um, 
uh, the distinct feeling I had when completing it was the uh, you, you guys in chat, you know, the, the Mola feels emoji, but with clown makeup. I don't have that, but this guy, if he had the clown makeup on, that's how oh. I felt. Oh, that's the emoji you sent me. It's very, yeah, it's just that 100%. That's how I felt about the whole film. That's, um, uh, that's quite similar to how I felt as well. Oh, and also I I've added the, uh, I think he's called Peepo Steer in, uh, in your emoji selection. He's become hyper popular. In in, in the Discord, there. can you see him? They, there's yeah. someone posted him in chat. He's he's one of the greatest responses to almost all circumstances. <laughs> that that one. Well, members do it. Yeah, that guy. Yeah, <laughs> he's a good one. See him in chat. There's... <laughs> That's the reaction to this movie. To be fair. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty. It's pretty apt. Uh, that's a pretty apt description. Was that how everybody felt, or did, was anybody more angry uh, about mm. it? I didn't feel angry. I think that that one was kind of like, well, like I got to the end and I was like, well, so that's what they just, that's what they decided to do. That was their, that was their battle plan, huh? All right. Well, yeah. I see why everyone hates this movie. This is not uh, official Joker canon to my brain. I suppose what I'd be curious about is, does, does, does the existence of this film as it exists make anybody feel like they shouldn't have made a sequel at all? Or, oh, yeah. or was there was there a world where there could have been a sequel that would have made everybody go, yeah, you know what, that was actually super worthwhile. As much as it sounds I like a contradiction, I believe both of those things. They shouldn't have made a sequel, but they could have made one that was really good. Right. Agreed. I think there's stuff they uh, could uh, yeah. have done, but honestly, I kind of would have preferred if we just left Joker, that wonderful 2019 movie, as a one and done. Um, yeah. I suppose that's but, easier to say now, though, that this exists. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If this movie was really good, I would be saying, oh, man, I didn't think that they could make a good sequel to Joker, but they managed to do it. Wow, interesting. Hmm. Same way a well, lot of people both... found the first movie unnecessary. Like, why, why are we doing this? But then it turned out to be pretty good. So, yeah. I think it's in a different... I, I think it's different in a sense, where the first one is, yeah, unnecessary in the same way that I guess technically pretty much all movies are unnecessary... But because it's not a continuation of anything so much as we have a story that we want to begin telling. And this just seems like uh, this story was so wonderfully wrapped up after the first movie and it felt complete and just the, had a, just the right amount of open endedness and it had a thing to say and it was thematically, you know, tight. Uh, and, and this feels like an unnecessary continual uh, continuing of something else that I felt was done mm -hmm. yeah i remember right after the first movie came out for a while even todd phillips himself was like i remember that was a huge thing at the time that oh there's no not going to be a sequel this mm -hmm. is not a franchise movie uh arthur fleck is his own character he'll do his, his own thing thing and uh he won't meet batman and there's no need for sequel and i remember that was that was a thing for a while and was, yeah. I was caught really off guard when the sequel was announced because Todd Phillips himself seemed so adamant on not turning this into a thing. Yeah. But it made a billion dollars, though. That's the thing. It made a yeah. billion dollars. <laughs> and that's really how it goes. Like, the budget increase is in large part to, due to the fact that people were convinced to make this movie with money, essentially. That he wasn't <laughs> going to originally, yeah. but... Because otherwise, I don't quite understand the jump from 55 to 200 million. That is definitely not showing up on the screen. <laughs> no. It looks no, better not. than the first movie. Slightly. Um, but it's not like, it, it's not, oh, we quadrupled the budget. It doesn't look that much better. It's, no. it's got, like, it's a very competently shot film. Yes. Uh, it looks good. But. If you were to tell me what was the budget of this, I would have said, oh, 70 million. If the first one was 55, this is like 70, I guess. You know, it got, it got like, it's like the first movie, but a bit more polished, a little bit more, you know, just a little bit more to it. I would not Doesn't have guessed in a million like years, 200. As much money. No, no, way. no. It looks like it has slightly more money. <laughs> Wh which yeah, I guess is the, the, the thing. Oh, uh, sorry, go for it. Go on, go on. Um, to piggyback off of what Cap said, about the idea that it's like the budget seems to be reflective of people needing to be convinced to come back and do this. Kind of <laughs> just makes you wonder like why anybody thought it was a good idea if that was the case. 
if it was a really, really hard thing to get anybody back to want to make another one. This probably that's probably but, happened in history where it's resulted in uh good like like I, I imagine Michael Bay eventually had to be convinced with money to come back to keep making Transformers over and over and over and over and over. Yeah, look at Maybe. the terrible result that spawned. But like you know, there would be movies that would still make the money. So it's like, well, everybody I wins, quote unquote. <laughs> so keep going. Like if this had made two billion, if in some insane world, oh, no. I wonder if they'd be like Todd, <laughs> buddy, we need a Joker three. <laughs> Even with that ending, yeah. For me, when it comes to the budget, like the first film, I have to rewatch it, but um, it seemed so much more grand, and there were so many like various types of environments. This felt so claustrophobic. Like it doesn't. I mean, it might have looked better, but the environments were like a hallways. You were always in the hallways in prison, and in a single like a freaking courtroom all the time and back and forth you don't even really go out uh, in the city yeah until like that one moment so for me it just felt so what what is where is the money i mean there were musical sequences but there yeah. were like mostly sound stages and stuff like yeah, that they weren't so. that elaborate um yeah all things considered so those sort of things didn't seem like hmm. yeah that explains it in terms of like the amount of money generating a scope in a specific regard that couldn't be facilitated by the mm -hmm. story. Um, here's a question for everybody. We'll go right to left on this one. Uh, Damn. ignoring... Yeah, ignoring the I'm existence a of... Ignoring the existence of Joker 2, like, ignoring what its statements are, what was the point, or the central theme, uh, <laughs> or intention of Joker, the first film? What was the what was the point? The in, central in a thing, general sense. The point in a general sense. Um, if I was to pick one, I would say that the primary one is that individuals and society both have a role to play in the well-being of people. And if you fail people, it hurts society as a whole. Okay. Uh, not so. Um. Well, I have like already a 10 page uh essay in the drafts and i still haven't gotten like i i still have no idea to be honest okay <laughs> that's fine but uh jeez i would say for me personally it's puddles i'm glad P puddles in the is in the movie but you talking that, about that's <laughs> the point of the movie joker one or two right now joker the first two. one like what oh, what the, oh the first it, one yeah first what one. i mean is like Independent oh. of what the statements of this film are about what happened in the first film or what it was meant to be about, what do you think is okay. like the central theme? What do you what would you say describes like the character arc for Arthur? Like mm. what's the what's the point? The point of Arthur. Well, considering the second film, again, nothing. I mean, I would have a separate answer if it was like the first film solely, uh, but now saying. it's just. No, no, I'm, I'm saying don't first consider film. the second film. Oh, if, if okay. We okay. Ignore the second before this film existed mm -hmm. to have an impact on your perspective, yes. what did you believe was the point? Is basically the question. Yeah. Uh. Well, it's uh. I listened to like some kind of behind the scenes of Todd Phillips talking about Arthur Fleck before the f second film, and um, he was talking, and it was so he had such an insight on the character that was so fascinating, and. Uh, that Arthur Fleck was kind of a mask he was wearing, and throughout the entire film, like the mask keep, keeps slipping, and like he's just hiding this Joker personality um, inside of him that finally bursts out. So he is playing this character that is this naive, sad Arthur Fleck, but in reality, he wants violence and he wants to sort of uh, reciprocate all the all the cruelty that he's facing so that's what he becomes at the end and that really sort of struck a chord with me and i think that's that's the point of arthur fleck in the first movie it's sort of a slow descent into madness but also like authenticity of the character if that makes sense yeah i get you uh mubes what do you reckon uh, that, yeah, just the, um, it, it almost feels like just an experimentational representation of the one bad day th thing of, of, uh, a whole life spent experiencing all these horrible traumatic events. He, uh, in the film we get to see <clears throat> him pushed to the brink 
and he has a snap of uh, his perspective that alters exactly what he's experiencing and then what he's going to do outwardly and that uh, at first is horrifying to him. I think, you know, for an audience member, it's going to be complicated exactly how they feel throughout the whole thing is part of why I really like uh, the first Joker. But um goes from being like, holy fuck, the the sort of loud, horrifying, bloody scene in the train. And then it and then it like in retrospect he starts thinking about it immediately as kind of freeing. It's a complicated metamorphosis of the character to instead of listening to society and his mum to like constantly do everything he can to be the best and nicest person ever to help people and be a good good guy, he's instead uh, flipping it on its head, and he feels freer and better. And I think it's a commentary, somewhat at least, of uh, what a uh, how a society that's not running as best as possible can destroy itself by creating individuals like that. And uh, you know, by the end, he's reached like a a nirvana of of exactly what he wants to do, and it's having repercussions that are insane. Like the whole world is in chaos, but he finally feels some level of freedom, and he's getting the um recognition he was looking for and then uh <clears throat> honestly like the film there's so many brilliant scenes in it that i'd like to talk about uh that we're not here to do today necessarily but the final one where he's uh you know he's smoking he's talking to the psychiatrist presumably in uh arkham or wherever else he is it's, uh it, it felt to me like a um he's completed his journey he's got a brand new point of view on life he's gonna act differently from now on because he's I enough with like the attempts to try and remain in a particular way or, or to act in a particular way to make the, the world a better place from the perspective of people who don't even understand the kind of thing he's gone through. He'd rather operate on his own rules. And uh, I don't know how, how, how much better it feels for him to do so. I I think it's just, that, I mean, one of the things that people say that, that, that the power of the first Joker is to have so many different interpretations and there's lots of little uh, pieces that support different things, just how much of it was even real and uh, whether or not the character we're dealing with should be referred to with different names and all this sort of stuff. And uh, I guess to, to to lead in, it's just like the Joker 2 has, has um, reduced a lot of those options. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Uh, Cap, what do you reckon? Oh, I thought you were next. Um, I'll let's go see. Last. Well, the obvious message is that you should stop taking your meds. Beyond that, <laughs> I would say... Well, I... I would echo what a couple of people have mentioned already that I wouldn't say there's one necessary, like, you know, there's a lot of different themes and ideas happening in the first movie in the broadest mm -hmm. possible sense. It's like a demented self actualization actualization story in a sense. He's this is someone who is beaten down by society who um, sort of lets out the sort of darkness he has inside of him. And it's sort of, it inspires a whole movement around him, and that finally gets him the attention and love that he's been looking for his whole life, but never really found. And that brings him a sort of joy and fulfillment, but obviously it's a sort of deeply ironic, demented sort of fulfillment he gets from that. I like the dissonance between what... Like, that the What he's really looking for is like sort of love and attention and respect and he wants everyone to be happy and so that he's become the unknowingly in a sense the face of this movement to sort of start something of a revolution in the city and i like the disconnect between what they view arthur as and what he views them as you know there's a real disconnect there not to say that this is a a complete aping of taxi driver but it's a similar sort of idea that i quite like you know where to them, he's something of a hero and he's starting a movement, but he's just this guy that's been horribly treated and just wants to make people happy in a sense. And he finds it in a very sort of dark, twisted way. I think it's a really, really interesting story. Very simple in a sense, but very well executed. I would say that all of you have made observations that I basically agree with in terms of like what the what was happening in the first film and what it was about. Something that I would add onto what you just said, Cap, that I find really interesting in the first film is the idea that he gets what he wants, uh, ultimately, which is like attention, adoration to, uh, to fulfill what he had been told was his purpose. But obviously it's uh, destructive and twisted and dark and 
that a consequence of what he has done has uh, generated his antithesis or what will become his antithesis in the future in the form of Batman. The idea that Joker and Batman were created on the same night, I find very fascinating and interesting. Uh, it's a really, really, <clears throat> it, it's just like a really, really interesting idea. Um, and, and, and then when you pair it with essentially a whole bunch of other things that have already been mentioned, not to mention the idea, the interesting idea that Joker is the more authentic, true representation of who he is and how he feels in contrast with, uh, Arthur, you know, that we see at the beginning of the film, right, trying to force a smile and then it drops instantly because it's not, it, it's not reflective of how he actually feels compared to the idea that when he's in his makeup painting a smile on his face with blood, that that's more representative of his authentic self is uh, quite, it's like, oh, geez, hmm, that's, that makes you think. That's uh, quite uh, grim, isn't it? Um, th there's a whole bunch of these ideas about what the film is, and it's like Mola said, this film's existence starts to, if you, if you treat it as though this film exists in the continuity, it begins to dramatically reduce a lot of your options for interpretation uh about what the first film is about and what it means um and, and in many ways it uh it, it it does things that seem to openly contradict what happened in the first film um in a way that's a bit difficult to reconcile to where like if you can't move past what amounts to like a fundamentally different understanding or even just like kind of a misrepresentation of the events that occurred in the first film or like what they meant uh or the the broader sort of uh themes of that film it's like, well, if you can't move past that, then you, you kind of like that's kind of like the end for the, of the movie in a sense, um, which is kind of a fascinating and very bad problem to have, as seems to be evidenced by the response that this film has uh, garnered. I don't quite like on on just a, a, the first thing you said as well the uh, the Batman element, like the multi class layered cruelty and trauma being inflicted on everybody as part of a society that's just completely corrupted and broken generating a man who would do anything sacrificing everything about himself to save it and another one who just wants to burn it all to the ground with him like that's really fascinating two results of everything that's happened you know and and they you know one of them comes from the family that arguably didn't do enough to to save the city while the other uh decided to ride the train along down into hell essentially for Gotham right like there's there's just so many things to talk about and i find that's one of the biggest uh, strengths of the first film, and it's the complete reverse of the second one. It feels like all roads sort of get cut off the more you try to think about options in the film for interpretation. Uh, well, yeah, I'd say that this film, by comparison, rather than being able to branch out into a whole bunch of different ideas about what it means, this film has like a very specific point, a very specific clear point that's uh, difficult to sort of move away from as a conclusion about what you meant to, you know, essentially what you meant to think about it. Uh, and, and and again, it's like, hmm, it's, uh, I, I really, I really do find it fascinating that this is like a film where essentially if you can't move past its it, uh, interpretation of the events of the first film, it's kind of like, it's like, oh shit, <laughs> damn, this is like kind of a, what are you meant to do, you know, right? Like, if you just disagree, you just have to sort of sit there and watch the story play out while being like, yeah, but that's not, not what happened, though. At least that's not what, you know, you thought happened. Well, it makes a cloud of you, doesn't it? <laughs> you're, you're sort of sitting there thinking to yourself, well, yeah. hot damn, this is me now. Uh, you've got it? You've got to uh, everybody. Yeah, yeah, Goga beautiful. made it. <laughs> it's beautiful. You look Our in the mirror, joker. you're like, oh no, I'm the joker. <laughs> A welcome addition to the roster. Oh my gosh, wait a second. I'm the Joker. Oh no. I would uh while this is on screen, I suppose it might be redundant, but how about how about just like uh everybody's general thoughts, you know, you one minute or less. What did you think of Joker 2? In a in a very in a in a little package. Um, let's room. go left to right this time. Oh right. Uh, I don't up. think it's very I don't think it's very good. I think the story's the worst part in terms of the technical aspects of the film. And I, I even quite liked the music. I think, uh, you know, I, I understand some people don't, but those elements I think are pretty good, but everything that's wrong with the movie is wrong with the story, I would say. And I don't think it's very good. Maybe it's even really bad. <laughs> I have to think about it more, but it's not yeah, very I good. I wouldn't recommend it. I wouldn't recommend it. The more I think about it, the worse the story gets. 
and uh, don't mm -hmm. spend the money to see it in the theater. It's not worth it. Unless you really, really want to be part of the discourse, which I don't know why you would. Um, don't I just wouldn't bother with it. Yeah, just repeat what we say on the podcast. Yeah, exactly. Uh, mubes. Uh, pretty sad by the end. Uh, I take a lot of meaning and interest in the first film. I'm quite a fan of it, and all this film did was uniquely and... Uh, repeatedly rip pieces away over and over again for as long as I considered it canon, which I not only don't at this point because it is incompatible, but simultaneously agree with Cap, but I do not recommend. It was kind of miserable uh, to watch. I didn't get much out of it that was entertaining or meaningful or insightful, um, and I disagree with the author <laughs> like significantly about the first <laughs> film, apparently. I presume when you say miserable, you mean it in a different... Because uh, Joker is a sad movie. That is a sad movie. I wouldn't describe movie. the first one as miserable, as, as crazy as that may yeah. sound. It's, uh, no, it's that's quite an I mean. experience to watch. Yeah. yeah, very engaging. Uh, while the second one felt a lot less... Um, I don't know, like, the, just the, there's not much for me to garner from the experience other than an insecure writer telling me that he did not like what I thought of the first one. I'm like, okay. All right, bud. Go sure. uh, Not so. Um, I accidentally shared my thoughts before, um, but uh, I don't know. It, the exit sign never shined brighter in the theater for me. I just... <laughs> the last... <laughs> I swear the last third act, I think I spent staring at it for longer than on the screen. Um... <laughs> But yeah, I was I was so jealous of anyone who walked out, and they did walk out. So you know. Oh, did people walk out? Yeah, people did walk out. I've heard you a know lot of when, stories about that. Yeah. Yeah, the Fast. last time when Lady Gaga started singing at the <laughs> at the stairway, they that's when they walked out. Okay, so they're pretty close to the end, but still. Tell you what, no yeah. one walked out of Moonfall. All right, I'll tell you this right now. Oh, yes. <laughs> the, the three of us in that the theater, we, the three oh, of us I, in I, the theater stayed till the end. There weren't the many people when I watched uh, The Rise of Skywalker, but nobody left. <laughs> At least not there. <laughs> they had to know. They knew what they were in for, for me. They knew. Know, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. It's that guy that I keep telling everybody about. <laughs> yeah. The guy that uh, there was a few seats down just saying, oh, fuck off. Every <laughs> fuck off. <laughs> <God. laughs> Very amusing. Um, yeah, uh, all right, Rags, mm -hmm. uh, your thoughts. While I think that the film is very technically competent, it's shot very well, there's a lot of really good, you know, scenes and shots with the lighting and the camera work and stuff, uh, and I will, I'll mirror what Cap said in a few things. I, I actually did like, uh, a lot of the, you know, musical stuff. Um, I think that aspect was A-OK, -okay and I, and I, and I like those, and I like the idea behind them, where these are musical things that are sort of, like, it, his perspective on things and his daydreams and whatnot. Um, I thought the film was very poorly paced in terms of what we learn, what we're getting in terms of the, as compared to the ratio of passage of time. Um, I thought it was well acted, but ultimately the story and what they did with Joker was such a massive letdown that there's virtually nothing about the positives that could get me to recommend the movie. This film feels like it's kind of ashamed of the first movie. It feels like it's bitter towards the first movie. And it feels mean-spirited to Arthur Fleck, which is crazy because he's like a sex double murderer. Oh, but it still feels mm. mean-spirited towards him. Uh, I walked out of the theater pretty like, hmm. Um, it, was, it was very much like a, hmm, that's a... Yeah, that's uh, that was a movie um, where it's it's kind of like yeah, I guess on a technical standpoint in terms of like the cinematography, the lighting, um, but like the soundtrack, uh, the choice of songs um, for the the musical sections, the performances. It's like yeah, I mean, on all of these like terms, it's it's like competently made, but like fundamentally, you have to it, it, like you have to move past what seems to me like such an incorrect. Like, like a, just a, an incompatible read of, of, like, even the events that took place in the first film, let alone, like, what meaning was supposed to be extracted from them, what meaning or, uh, themes were clearly intended versus how he may have, uh, 
Well, how Todd Phillips may have uh, changed his mind. I, I, I mean, it's it's it feels like a film that spawned from like either one of two things. Either Todd Phillips didn't understand the film that he made in terms of like what was conveyed, what events happened, what the central arc or descent into madness was for Arthur Fleck, and like what was to be taken away from that thematically. Um, or he changed his mind. Like, he saw the reactions that people had to the film. He saw what people's criticisms were. He saw the meta. And then he changed his mind and, like, responded to it. Which, um, I don't know, man. It feels like that, that, uh, that could yield some really, uh, really, like, bad results in terms of, like, the films that get spawned from that kind of attitude, right? Of, like, of, of, of almost feeling like it's a film that's more so, like, a response to, like, the meta conversation around the first film rather than what actually happened in it. Um, I think so, yeah. I would I would not recommend it. I just don't think that most people would like it. And I think that's um that's become very clear in the following days yes. uh as the as the sort of response to this film is um uh coalesced broadly, which is that most people don't like it. Um I don't even think that should be surprising, uh given given what happens. Uh, so yeah, I don't like it. Wouldn't recommend it. Um, I, I, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see where we uh, settle after we well, um, uh, after we go through it in terms of like we, its quality overall. Before we continue, uh, because it won't sound strange really to any of us, but the way that um, like uh, some of the things you said there and things that we've mentioned before um, about how the 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 creator didn't kind of understand their own work and things of that nature i guess for those who might be tuning in who are not familiar with us uh, hi every from a pause uh we are very uh we're very big on death of the author here um we've talked mm -hmm. about it before we've gone into great lengths about it so uh, it might sound kind of like bold and crazy if you're not used to us for us to say things like the the creator didn't understand their creation um but we here at every frame of pause and I think most of the, our guests and things, we kind of hold that there is a line between uh, that, or that, that does separate what a person wants to create and their intentions for their creation and what they actually end up making. That the substance of what the movie is or the song is or the, the story that they create, that is different and not necessarily the same uh, as the intentions that they made or the thematics that they were seeking to get when they sought out to make it. It's funny so, you um, just, introduce uh, this potential idea like this. Like, I actually think this is going to become one of the greatest examples to help people understand that that is a valid way to analyze art, to ignore the author, uh, this one. Because yeah. we've had other examples mm -hmm. like, um, you know, Greedo shot first, or even if you remember the Polka Dot Man discussion for Suicide Squad. <laughs> oh, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Um, that was bizarre. This one, I think you won't even need to really explain it. You just be like, Joker 2. I think most people ignore that as part of the Joker story. Like, you know, I say that in, in the future. That's how people will probably refer to this. I don't see this having a probably. cultural footprint that'll last. I, Other I than, mean, yeah. essentially, you've got a choice to make, right? You've got a choice on whether or not you want the first film to remain an interesting film that you, that, that you can think about. Uh, or you can attach this to it and potentially severely uh, reduce um, the, the sort of the thematic juice and the, the, the interest of that film. So the decision is yours. I find it easier more and more as, as these, these films come out. I don't, I don't treat the sequel trilogy as a canon, basically, in my Ooh. head. I remember that I said before that it was very hard for me to disconnect it because when you have the same actors yeah. and uh, a sense of legitimacy yes. with a project, that that can sort of almost have an effect. But like that, Terminator Dark Fate, like these, it's it's becoming easier and easier and easier to be like, yeah, I mean, that was just some shit movie that exists off in the corner. That <laughs> you doesn't should be thanking have the sequel the trilogy. Like, sh we why, should be why? like... Why? Thank you, sequels, for preparing us. <laughs> for preparing us to completely disconnect all these other pieces. Where, so that when I see Harrison Ford as Indiana Jones, the sad fuck that they made him in Dial of Destiny, the sequels prepared me to not give a shit. And it's not canon, and I don't right. have to I worry about it I will say, we had some prep for this with, uh, do you remember first seeing Terminator Genesis free? They made it in the trailer as like a huge awesome thing that Terminator 1 gets recreated and then during the scene where it's being created, fucking future Artie kills the Artie in that film, and it's the most, like, what is happening? Well, wait, what? 
you're deleting it. <laughs> yeah. You're ruining it. That's the thing. They think they're having fun, but you'll see they're like, so Terminator 1 didn't happen anymore? <laughs> like, what the hell? <laughs> no, Terminator Genesis didn't happen. That's what Yeah, that's, that's what the happened. truth. It's like, you're incompatible by... I mean, how how well, few people care that Romulus basically said aliens didn't couldn't have happened? So yeah, Rom knows? Romulus didn't happen. No, it's, a lot of people just don't seem to care about that, which is unfortunate. Uh, yeah, well, you know. Anyway, Any anyway, should we, uh, <laughs> yeah, should we, too. we should begin let's, this uh, adventure. I'm sure. Yes, let's, let's do yes. it. So uh, the film opens with a Looney Tunes inspired animation that is entitled "Me and My Shadow." Uh, and the broad summary of it is that it depicts the ending of the original film, so Arthur going on the Murray Franklin show, but it presents it as though Arthur's shadow, uh, the Joker, like his literal mm. shadow, um, well, his literal in this, in the animation, but figurative, you, you get the idea, mm -hmm. uh, locked him away and, like, took his place on the show, uh, and then, like, tormented him and sabotaged him before framing him as the Joker and running away. Uh, as the police then come in and beat Arthur to a pulp, uh, which drenches the screen in blood. So, um, right out of the gate, you're like, but that's not what happened, though. No, that is not. It's weird. No. I've, I've heard Try a lot again. of people say the animation was something they really enjoyed, and I was like, well, I, I, I mean, I like I mean, the I animation, the but... animation, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but I was like, the story it told, I was already so confused. I was like, this isn't the... That's not what happened, though. That's... We watched different movies, like, and I was like, "Holy shit!" This oh, yeah. sets the tone for how this film is going to go. It's like it's almost like a crash course in. So that other film, yeah, this is what happened, and now we'll move on. It's like no, 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 no. There's like a previously on that's all wonky. Well, yeah, like the notion that there was because because it's it's sort of like setting the tone for something that will become a discussion throughout the film, which is the which is the the argument and then the counter to the notion that there was a distinctive Joker identity that you could separate from Arthur, which already it feels like the nature mm -hmm. and how like this is incorrect is kind of complicated to explain. There is no Joker in that sense, but there is the Joker. It was Arthur. Like Arthur was the Joker. He turned into the Joker. He transformed into the Joker. Yeah. The mask slipped. Yes. And it was a very um, meaningful reason to choose that word. It wasn't arbitrary. It wasn't meta. It was Murray Franklin making fun of him, which fucking destroyed him in that in that story. Yeah, line. exactly. Mm -hmm. Well, exactly. I mean, it's it's um something that feels important to mention at this point because it feels like it's an. I something that that sticks out as like important to think about when it comes to the first film is Arthur dancing while dressed up as the Joker first time alone in the bathroom. Um, there's literally nobody around. It's it's just for him, and it's it's like that's that's like what you're meant to take away from it, right? Like he's he's almost he's like dancing in a in a way that could even be described as graceful because it's like authentic and honest. Um, and it's, of course, very dark and, and disturbing that this has happened right after the incident on the subway. Uh, and then you have him dancing as he's about to go on the Murray Franklin show before the curtains are drawn in contrast to him initially sort of acting out like the way that he ought to behave when he goes on it. And then, of course, finally dancing to a sea of admirers uh, as he essentially completes his transformation. Um, these are sort of things that could be uh, like him embracing essentially like the Joker as a persona, uh, beginning with nobody being around. Like it's 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 like they want to move to a point of like, well, yeah, but it was it was in response to like what he saw around him. And it's like, I mean, a little bit sure, but like it's a little bit more complicated than that. A lot of it was independent of the things that were going on in the in the world, and certainly not the idea of like um like. Like, trying to get to this sort of point of, like, well, he was doing it because that's what people wanted to see, right? The, audi the, the, the audience in the universe slash you as the audience who went to see the film. As I, but again, hold on, that's not what happened. Like, that's not what happened in the first film. He was in a, I mean, the train sequence, he was in a position where it's self-defense and then it evolves into something a bit more like predator hunting prey and he enjoyed it. And it felt expressive of his, like it felt relieving, and uh, finally had some level of power and control. Yes, well. and and those desires and the values that led him to do those things are a part of him. Uh, you, if you want to call that the shadow self or shadow elements of his character, <laughs> then um, because th this is where it gets complicated in terms of like it, it shouldn't be. It's like the English language can fail you here because we need more words to better distinguish a lot of these concepts. He's um. 
he's exploring those parts of himself and he's not looking away. In fact, it feels more like being himself, not being an alternative personality slash being the shadow temporarily or allowing the shadow to take control and then enjoying the results. So, you know what I mean? There's so many different ways you could take it, but like from what you see of the scenes in the first film, it came across to me as though these were thoughts and feelings and, and things that he considered his whole life. Like we all do. We all have some uh, wacky thoughts every once in a while, but we're like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. It's crazy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But he did them, mm -hmm. and he was like, you know what? I didn't mind that at all. I actually think maybe I'll do more of that at some point. Not sure yeah. yet. That felt pretty good. <laughs> and that yeah. to me is not I... um, the shadow has taken over. It's more uh, Arthur is exploring himself further. The thing is, like, I don't know, does Todd Phillips want us to think about the shadow in the Jungian sense? Is that, like, what we're... I mean, you know yes, what I mean? that like... seems obvious to me, but that's I mean... what he's going for. The, the, the central problem here, okay, if you want to talk in the Jungian sense about Arthur being possessed by his shadow, sure, he's sort of gripped by, you know, the darker fantasies and stuff because it rewards him, in a sense. He, he feels power and control and even adoration and... um from all the people who see him as the face of the movement. Uh, the problem is, in the cartoon, it's presented like Arthur is completely unwilling. He's like, no, 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 He's no. He's a victim like, of the shadow. Yes. Yeah. No, that is not what happened. Wrong. Try again. <laughs> like, that's, you know, that is definitively not the case. So that doesn't work, for one. And also the other thing that's weird about it symbolically is he's already in the Joker makeup and then the shadow takes over. Like, surely if you were going for this idea that the that Arthur is possessed by the shadow who is Joker, then the shadow should be with the one with the face paint. So just yeah, little things like that. Force it on him, something like that. Yeah, so, yeah, which also wouldn't work for the record, but it's even confused and muddled in the metaphor that it's saying, even yeah. something here. Well, I think... For me, what annoys me so much about uh, Arthur's sort of uh, inconsistency like a character, it's just the way this film, and even the first film, was sort of sold as a like exploration of mental health and mental illness. Um, and that's why it's not going to be like a fully Joker story, because we're going to make a film about, and we're going to explore... A mentally ill person that is Arthur Fleck and it's sold as a very accurate and sort of a very insightful depiction of such issues and uh, human struggle but this film uh, treats that whole concept so just completely aimlessly or just uh, it doesn't care almost and um, the Arthur's sort of a uh, state of mind and um, mental illness is so inconsistent and jumps back and forth between uh, he has a split personality disorder or he, you know, in the first film, he is sort of this um, Joker personality is a part of him. Then we go to, no, it's a split personality, but no, it has been Arthur Fleck all along. So I think that's a very um, terrible job at depicting mental illness and I would say even uh, just very harmful. I think the first one was much seem... more consolidated in approaching him as this is guy. He's working job that sucks. He's got a yeah. home life that sucks. His uh, social services are failing him. He gets, you know, the one bad day aspect I think is way more clear. Like, it feels so much more focused. This film is very busy fighting with itself as to mm -hmm. exactly what the truth about Arthur's yes. personality is, such that the... Um, the intervening events and the surrounding elements, like we'll we'll talk about this as we go through, but uh, the guards for yeah. one, it's like the the story doesn't have a conclusion on a lot of these elements. It sort of throws them in, and then it, and then it's like actually I'm a bit busy right now because I want to have the characters talk openly and to the camera about the state of him. And and um, it you know it reminds me of in a really weird way is Ray. I think I brought this up on um, <laughs> Open Bar was how the film is so. Uh, distracted with discussing whether or not Arthur and Joker are the same person, whether or not there's the shadow self, whether or not uh, the Joker is even real, that it like forgot that it was supposed to be telling a story. It's like when we find out who Ray's parents are definitively, it's like, guys, you took three movies to not give her character. That was insane. You got so <laughs> distracted with this crazy notion when it didn't even need to be answered as a question. The first Joker took care of all of this, but that's the the downfall, I guess, of being like, oh, shit, I guess we didn't agree on what the first one was about. Okay. 
-hmm. Also, Joker 2 is so unfocused that I don't think it comes to any meaningful conclusions about any of the questions that it raises. No, I think it just tells us. It's like, that's the answer, bye. Yeah. You're like, oh. Okay. It feels like, in general, it's just much less of an Arthur Fleck story when the first one was so much focused Which on Which is funny, him. yeah, because everyone would tell you that this is more of the Arthur Fleck story while the prior one was a Joker story. Which is just wrong. Um, kind of bizarre the... that that's even something that would be, have to be said, you know? It's... The discussions around it are kind of annoying. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. with the, we'll get to it. We'll do our best. It might be a long one. Who knows? Uh, also, yeah. Well, yeah. Sorry, go for it. One thing I would mention, uh, that same interview that I mentioned initially about Todd Phillips, I remember the way he concludes that is so funny to me about the Joker 1 is that he says, I don't remember the exact wording, but he says that uh, when he was writing sort of that mental uh, aspect of uh, Arthur and the way Joker uh, and him are integrated or whatever, um, he says, you write that kind of down as a writer, and then it once you write it, it kind of gets messy in your head and it all gets messed up, and you just hope that it works. And that's mm. how he concludes it. And I thought, I thought that was very ironic and kind of insightful as to where he's his head might have been at during the writing of Joker 2. Yeah, it feels about right. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, it does have that more, it has a much less deliberate. Like scattering a bunch of stuff on the table has. and then it's like invites you to have a look. And it's like, what do you think? You're like, this looks like a bunch of stuff scattered <laughs> on a table. <laughs> yeah, I think that's what mm -hmm. makes the second Joker feel so much, so much more, so it's just paced way worse um the yeah. first one it was just it felt so just tight and deliberate and this one feels wishy-washy it feels like it just floats around for a lot of scenes and i feel like it doesn't take advantage of a lot of its opportunities and th and, and a lot of the stuff that it sets up um i mean as Tringy mm -hmm. will probably tell you in a few moments we don't get like our first first bit of proper arthur fleck dialogue till we're like how long into the movie uh and it's it's a while it's like 10 minutes which is an interesting choice and not even necessarily a bad one, but if you don't really do a lot with that decision, then it feels like it, then it becomes very apparent that he hasn't talked and we're kind of waiting for him to say something. Um, but yeah, it just doesn't feel as tight. No, I, I, I totally agree. I'd say that the first film doesn't have any superfluous scenes at all. This one, I, uh, I don't know if I would even necessarily say that there are scenes that jump out as being actually pointless. It's more so that, uh, kind of what you said, this sort of feeling of like, man, everything's just taking way longer and it feels like less is happening per scene. It's like this scene is about one thing only compared to being about maybe three or four things at once. Uh, did anybody else have anything they wanted to say about the opening animation or... Shall Maybe we? this will be style. controversial. I thought yeah. that um, it was okay. I feel like it, it, it with the kind of, especially learning the kind of money and everything that they had, I feel like if they were going to go for that old Mary Melodies, Looney Tunes kind of style, it didn't quite get there. It, it still felt like there were too many modern touches to it, like like the way that it's animated, like it wasn't quite, like it wasn't quite there. Um Felt that too, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I appreciate the idea and the, the, the attempt that was done, but I feel like it was too busy trying to be uh, it, it wasn't it wasn't quite there as being like a like like properly stylized as one of those older cartoons. Um, just it, the way that it was animated, the movements, kind of the pacing, a lot of the uh, in, in a lot of the I I, I guess the it's tough to kind of say. Um, I, I wish I kind of had the words to describe it, but maybe Cap, yeah, I guess you agree with me. Maybe you could uh, help a little it bit. It seemed the... like there were some things that made it feel too modern. And I, this is speculation because I'd have to look at it again, but it, it almost seemed like maybe the frame rate was too high for, for some things. Like it didn't, it looked... know, older animations weren't quite as high frame rate as a lot of modern stuff is. I don't know if that's exactly what it is, but something like maybe that. Maybe was... it was too clean, I think. Um, Something, too yeah. vibrant. Maybe a little bit. Uh, it just wasn't like I re I appreciate the the stylistic choice to do that, but I feel like it didn't quite get to what it was trying to do. As a as a big appreciator of those sorts of cartoons, who watched them endlessly, you know, growing up especially. But 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think All it right. seems like uh, they tried to re uh, recreate that style with the modern technology as opposed to using traditional methods, and it really, it, it always shows when it comes to like. It's like when that people do. Like when people have like high definition cameras and they just put like yeah. a like it make it black and white and they're like, see, this happened a long time ago. And they're like, mm -hmm. no, no, I mean, it's like, like it's clearly uh, high definition, you know. I wonder how much of it would yes. have been that the characters didn't really go off model very much. There wasn't much like stretching or or um or like and and like the movements were kind of almost like a bit too realistic. Like it was. It a was. Bit too Slow. It wasn't as uh, punchy or um, ex uh, you know, over the top as uh, Looney Tunes animation. It, yeah, uh, it yeah. felt like it felt like they were trying to do a style that they weren't all that familiar with. Like they were it, almost like, "Hey, do Looney Tunes from memory," and that's what happened. Instead of them like <laughs> really sitting down, studying the the techniques and the and the stuff of that nature that went into making these old cartoons. Just the you know what we what they really are um but maybe it's a bit of a nitpick yeah. but yeah i figured i'd mention it i mean i there suppose I, I, I didn't, yeah <laughs> i didn't mind aesthetically, but again the big thing is just like man this isn't what happened but okay it was fun to see uh, them do that but yeah the substance yeah, of it i was yeah. like mm. Mm. the shadow uh, huh? mm. what a jerk the shadow guy i wonder who he is <laughs> um, john Cla we uh we find ourselves in the E ward uh, of Arkham Asylum, and the guards are uh, removing the prisoners from their cells and arranging them in a line. Uh, and out steps Arthur, who looks very deflated, uh, very deflated, like very um. Deflated. Yeah, Depressed. like just sort of Stalin. stressed and miserable, and <laughs> and like and zoned out, like a balloon. That sort of uh, Is that like a balloon? <laughs> I'm just, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> he was depressed and zoned out like a balloon. Like a depressed and zoned out balloon. Um, is it worth just summarizing up to the beginning of the conversation he's going to have with that woman? Just because so, um, the subject is probably worth addressing here is uh, the time we've missed. We could probably just say what happened in it. Well, yeah, it's uh, Arthur's been in Arkham for I believe about two years, um, and and we and we sort of get some indications as to like his interactions and how they may have changed over time. Uh, there is a guard called Jackie who uh, asks Arthur to tell a joke and remarks that it's been a while since he's done so, um, and then he gets uh, he gets sent off to take some medication, and get a shave as the guards are telling jokes and he's sort of just listening, but very passively, uh, before he meets his, uh, lawyer who basically just sort of, uh, um, explains the nature of the strategy that they want to employ for his, uh, trial. Um, but before he, before he gets to speak to her, he gets moved over to B ward, which is like the minimal security ward, unlike the one that he's in. And he's just walking through uh, getting escorted by the guards, he looks through a door and sees Harleen, he doesn't know her name yet, staring, staring at, uh, him, and then she steps out into the hallway and mimics the shooting herself in the head, uh, in the same way that Sophie did in the first film. Um, but he doesn't get much time to, to sort of think about that, gets shuffled over to his lawyer, who then, mm -hmm. basically, she tries to make the case that Arthur's childhood trauma caused a split or fragmentation within him to help him cope with the pain, um, and that there's a, a, a psychiatrist, Dr. Beattie, who believes that Arthur has a different person living uh, inside of him who was responsible for doing all of the things uh, that Arthur has been charged with. And then he sits down with this Dr. Beattie, who asks him to speak candidly. And then the first thing that he says, this is the first line in the film, he just asks for a cigarette, which I feel like already, you're kind of like... Because like Rag said, when enough time passes and nothing's been said, you're like, oh, I presume that whatever the first thing's going to be said is going to be really interesting. What what did all of you think about him asking for a cigarette and what that was meant to mean? Cigarettes are highly addictive. And he needed a cigarette because his brain was yearning for those sweet, sweet chemicals. That's any, it. Any, anything else? Uh, <laughs> um, it's... <laughs> Everyone, no, don't smoke. Inside. Smoking is very bad for you, and you shouldn't smoke. 
you should. Well, like I get what you're saying. Like you know, it's the first line, so it's gotta it's gotta be more than most lines a lot of the time. But I have a say. It's like what what do you glean from that? It's like well, maybe just that that's what he's been reduced down to now. He just wants his cigarettes, which is something that comes Uh, up in the movie. Fulfills his basic needs, and that's kind of the best that I could give you for what I for what I could be. And it feels like I'm doing a lot of legwork here in terms of trying to make this more of something. Uh, when he eventually sits down for that televised interview, uh, Marianne, his lawyer, tells him not to smoke because, like, it doesn't look good. Uh, mm-hmm. Makes him look a certain way. So, like, I think she said it makes I him was... look too cavalier. Yeah. So if yeah. I was trying really, really hard, it'd be like, ah, see, he he just wants to be Arthur Fleck, but you know, nobody's gonna let him. That's that's the best mm-hmm. I can do. In terms of in terms of trying to imbue that with some some greater meaning, and I feel like at that point I'm stretching. You know, it's like I mean, come on, like it feels like it's uh it's not that meaningful. And maybe it wasn't. Maybe it wasn't meant to be that meaningful. Maybe it was just he was silent, and then he just said something that didn't really mean much at all. I mean, it's it's it's, uh, it's all he's got in this place. I think is is what I got from it, and so because uh, yeah. this does tie into like what I wanted to talk about first is essentially just uh, the choice to have started the film here if uh, we were sitting in a little boardroom and someone came in with a pitch for Joker 2 a film that apparently none of us even wanted to happen and they said okay so 2 years have passed and and then I'd stop me like two, why 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 are we doing that what do what do you mean 2 years have passed good question 2 years that's a while yeah hmm. Why are we doing that? And then if the person's saying is like, well, because um, we we want to skip past like what's happened to him, which is broadly speaking, he's been taking medication that's made him pretty docile and and presumably had a lot of the edgier and uh, rebellious aspects of him beaten out of him. He's uh, he's back down to where you'd familiarly probably know him from uh, earlier in the first film. And then I'd immediately again be like, what are you? Why? What? Why are we doing that? Why why would you want to do that? And it's like, oh well, because. I got some ideas about where this film is going to go and where it'll end, and uh, that I need that to be the beginning. And then you go through what the <laughs> the ideas are, and then you'd be like, yeah, no, actually, we're not going to do that. That's a bad idea. A lot of people will not like that, actually. Crazy, I know, but it reminds me of um, a little bit of different characters we've come across in stories where they do the thing where you start up the next one and they say, oh, yeah, all these things happened, and so now they're a different character. You're like, well, I didn't see those oh, yeah. things. So you, you like, it's cool to have been a part of that, but oh well. Yeah, like, uh, I guess the the most blatant, quick example you could argue would be like an Alien Three's opening. We were just like, this happened. It's like, no, it didn't. No, it didn't. That didn't happen. It's like, yeah, it didn't. liar. <laughs> it did happen. Um, <laughs> a more passionately, culturally impactful example would be Luke Skywalker. They say this is what happened between Return of the Jedi and, uh, I guess, TLJ to an extent, or TFA, pick your poison. And uh, you'd be like, no, it didn't. That's not what happened. They're like, it did. That's what happened. That's yeah. how it happened. And uh, we're not going to show you all the scenes, but the way it went ended up this way. And that's the character we're going to be it. using. And yeah, and then that's it's just it. like. Mm-hmm. You feel a bit of rebelliousness as a as a audience member sometimes. Like, no, you have to justify that. You can't you can't be showing me this guy and saying he's Arthur Fleck from the end of the first film, plus two years of I guess yeah. misery that turns him into this. Like, I didn't see any of that. I'm not even sure this is what would have happened, no matter what was happening to him. Like, I yeah, I don't I don't know that I agree. Ended. You know. Mm-hmm. And plus the animation. Like I said, I was just put in a really tilted position of what the fuck am I watching? Who is this? Why are we doing well, this? It's, a, it's been reset in a sense, which is already just, uh, you gotta be careful when you do that. Yeah. Um, people don't want to see characters just get reset. Certainly if the events that reset them happen off screen or in the case of, uh, in the case of Luke, right? It's, it's, it's like less of a reset, more of a, uh, you've just transformed him into who you want him to be for your film, regardless of how easy which is crazy. Is for- Viewers to accept. I think that concept is way easier to translate when it's different creators. You'd be like, this is someone else muscling in on, on a character they just bought. Here it's weird because it's like, well, this is the guy who made him doing this. And you're like, oh. Yeah. But that, yeah, it's I not unprecedented, guys. Quickly. We've been here before with the, the same creators yeah, exactly. damaging the shit out of their own work. Mm-hmm. That's why you got to quickly get to the position of, yeah, well, he didn't, either he didn't get it or he got, he. He, he made himself respond and sort of react to the reaction to the first film, which was uh, 
you know, I mean, if he wants to do that, then that's his prerogative, I suppose. But hmm. yeah, Piper uh, for it. was not happy with this, but I was like, all right, fine. Let's see what you can do with it, I suppose. I was happy to see Brendan Gleeson, at least. I just like him. Yeah, yeah. that was yeah. neat. I thought his um... joke about the Catholic dog was fine. <laughs> <laughs> he was certainly me, very proud of it. For me, like, the contrast and the difference between Arthur Fleck that we saw, like, at the very last scene in the first movie, and this is, like, one of the most just... Just the worst character regressions I've ever seen. Because I remember that one last scene. Of course, the scene with M Murray or Murray, Murray. <laughs> in, the, in the first Murray yeah, <laughs> in the first film was, of course, like the one that was very impactful. But what sold me uh, was that last scene of Arthur just just laughing endlessly in a psych ward or wherever he is. And then, you know, murdering the the person and then just, you know, with the bloody f footprints just walking off in the hallway. Which, uh, and... We had to conclude that that was a dream. That was definitely not Yeah, real. we got our yeah. answer. That At was not, not a thing. Yeah, yeah. thanks for letting me know that which one happen. it definitely was instead of leaving me <laughs> to make conjecture uh, and speculate. Oh, well. That's such that guy's toast. character. That's such character assassination for me because that's actually what sold me on the first film and that was like that concluded so well sort of like he's finally happy but at what cost right and so it, it it's such a it's so disappointing to see him at this state and this way in the first film it really gives you like initial kick in the gut as to what you're in for with this one a lot of things I don't like about especially the two years that have passed here. One is that, well, there's a few things that they establish here. One, that he's on his medication now, and I think that's what a lot of people will point to to explain this change in his character. Um, but yes. they also establish quite clearly that he has a pretty good relationship with the guards. We never see it until later. But it's basically established that he tells them jokes and they like that about him. He's sort of a model prisoner because he's not killing anybody or doing any harm. He just makes them laugh and tells jokes and stuff. And so they're always looking to him to tell more jokes. And when we cut into the story, he's stopped doing that. I guess eventually he, it's sort of worn him down, I guess. But then I'm not sure why it would wear him down so much if he's like has this positive relationship with the guards in the prison, I would think that would actually lift his spirits and make him feel good. So I don't quite buy. Especially that if he gets some totally... cigarettes as a pragmatic thing there as well. Yes. Uh, so you I don't think quite that buy. He'd find, like he'd settle into some kind of even maybe contentment that he gets some, yes. something from it. Like he would, that, not that he's like actually super mega depressed and completely detached, it seems, but that he's just sort of content and almost in a weird well, way normal -ish. He wanted to be a comedian, right? That was his goal. And it's yeah, like, and well, now he's, he's the a comedian in Arkham, right? Yeah, he's getting paid in cigarettes and the guards like him. And that's, you know, that's attention. That's positive attention. He gets to do what he wants. I don't believe the character at the end of Joker would at first willingly want to take this medication, but then secondarily be like, I don't think he would, he would simply say he is. Um, and then if they forced the medication down him such that he became docile, he would still remember, as he does in this film, what it was like before the medication, and once they stop forcing it, like making certain that he's taking it, you probably go back to not taking it, pocketing it, or, um, you know, hung in it such that it doesn't go right down and then tossing it where he can. That sort of stuff, like... The idea, because you're right, that is absolutely what they want to say to you, is that in two years he's had all the medication and he's been beaten down, this is the guy now, and that's how that happened. And it's very unsatisfying, similarly, that's why Luke was brought up, in that it's like, well, Luke tried to train mm -hmm. a family member, they went crazy, and uh, that's, that's made him disenfranchised with training people in the ways of the Force, it's made him uh, unwilling to get involved in events because he makes them worse, and that's why he's abandoned everybody. It's like, that's... What no. can you say except, well, I guess? Yeah, it's one of those things where it's just like, are we good? Is that enough? And you're like, not really. I, I, like, uh, I don't believe that's how those events would play out if I saw them, but you're telling me that's what, the, that's what it is. It's just like, mm, deeply unsatisfying. 
I, um, what I would add to this is that I don't believe that two years have passed before he even goes to trial. This is like one of the most high profile cases yeah. in the world. I don't believe they would take this long. It's also a very clean case, as in like the it wouldn't take too long to just be like, yo, he's no, fucked. especially if he's yeah. not he's not even saying he's innocent. He's saying he's not guilty by reason of insanity. So mm -hmm. they're not even denying that the events happened. This should move along pretty quickly, and there would be a big incentive to move it along quickly. And then on top of that, the well, world doesn't really Wayne, seem to... What? You know, do you think that all the stuff that happened with, you know, Wayne and them would really be a, a super big part of this, and all oh, the riots that killed Wayne? They'd want to make an example. And, uh, yes, exactly. And then the other yeah. thing is the, the, the state of Go um, Gotham doesn't seem to have changed at all in those two years. Yeah, because there was an election. So, that, so that's at the another end thing. Of the, you know, at the <laughs> Joker is about an election that's upcoming. The cultural impact feels like we're uh, we're not even going to address it. It's like, what happened with all those riots? What happened with all the people and like the movement, so to speak? And and this film is like, eh. yeah, eh. it's still around, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> we're not really uh, it's like, hmm. paused essentially over those two years. The appetite for revolution is still there. They haven't really. It's all just kind of paused, waiting for whatever happens in this movie, but that doesn't really yeah. follow. Yeah, like, turns we back up no in the third act. Yeah, there, there's no follow-up on, like, well, who won the election? What did they do with the riots in the state of the city? Are people kind of coming around? Do they feel like they need the Joker anymore? Are things actually looking up? Is the desire for that kind of a figure, has that kind of drifted away over time? Or do we need him now more than ever? This new mayor sucks even worse than the old one did. We don't know. Mm -hmm. The thing is, for me, in the first film, I feel like Gotham as a city, to me, it registers as some kind of, like, uh, supporting character, sort of, like, uh, it's just, it has such a huge presence, that city, and uh, its environment, its political state, and I think it, res I remember at the time, it quite, uh, it resonated with so many people at the time because you know people were drawing parallels to their own cities and their own lives and their own political realities and it was really impactful uh, the gotham and its state at the time and for this movie to complete i i'm not even i'm not even exaggerating when i say it completely removed that aspect of storytelling from this plot in the story it's it completely misunderstands its audience and not even intentionally it just does not understand that that's what people liked about the first movie and resonated with and want to see more of outside of just joker and it's pretty heartbreaking well it, it was really almost like, like a aspect. character in get, the first movie yes. yeah like a couple of seconds of seeing people outside that's like the most mm. other than the third act we get a sequence but it's not very long and Mm -hmm. And also know. how it was even, it's yeah, we'll get to that. Anyway. Um, so in terms of continuing with sort of uh, muddying the interpretation of the events of the, the first film, uh, during this session, Dr. Beatty asks um, if the, the, the three guys who attacked him on the subway triggered him or if he like blacked out. Like the idea of being almost like, you know, like he didn't even know what happened. Uh, he responds with kind of like a grunt that's a little bit hard to tell, like what it means. Um, and then when he gets asked about Murray Franklin and sort of his experience of that, he claims to remember the music. Um, and, and then he gets asked whether he remembers coming out dressed as Joker dancing to the music. And he sort of moves over to how he used to watch the show uh, with his mother Penny. Uh, before kind of imitating her, putting on like a like a goofy voice, um, and then he gets asked if he ever heard her voice, uh, and and if it had changed after uh after she died, which uh, he doesn't seem he doesn't like respond to the question or appear to understand what the question is. Uh, and yeah, he's then, like, what do you mean? Yeah, like it's, it's just like I don't basically he he doesn't really get the the sort of where the direction it's going in. And then uh, to to end the scene, Doctor Beatty asks to speak to Joker as if he's a different person, like sort of a disassociative identity disorder kind of deal. And then Arthur stares at the camera, yeah. and then we cut to the next scene. And so you're just sort of sitting there, like, man, I I I really did not. This is an angle to sort of go at in terms of like yeah. trying to re-examine the events of the first film, like start to 
suggest um, and build up the notion that there was like a distinctive, different personality that uh, manifested. Mm -hmm. I'd say it's the worst of both worlds. We get a whole bunch of questions to open up a whole new line of point of view that we may not have even had in the first one necessarily. And uh, by the time you hit the end of the film, all of this is kind of superfluous because they lock it off. Yeah, because at the end they're like, well, no, that's not what happened. It's like, oh, well, it's like, like, well yeah, yeah, I know. Interpretation I know that I never had. Yeah. yeah. Like, he's like, well, I, knew, I knew it didn't happen. I watched the first movie. Well, see, it's like if they said, what if he's a tentacled alien monster? Then at the end they go, he's not. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh, okay. I mean, that's yeah. good, I guess. Yeah, you know, I didn't <laughs> yeah. think he was, but now I, all right. I guess we, I know for sure. The only thing I like about it is that it makes sense as his defense's strategy, um, yeah, as but it doesn't yes. make yes. it doesn't make any sense to present it to the audience. Like, oh, d is that what's happening? Because no, no, that's isn't. not what happened. Mm -hmm. We saw it. Well, we saw the. We don't even. We don't even really get Arthur's like perspective on this. Is what we're going to tell the people no. to try and get you like a lighter sentence to say that it's criminal insanity because you have multiple personalities. I don't know what Arthur's perspective is on that. Like, would he be like? Where was the point where he said, no, that was me. That was all me. All the way, it was Joker all the way down. You know, that was, that that I am a leader by implication. passive right? right now. Yeah. Right now, yeah, he's just his, sort of passively going along with yeah, what's well, happening. He's, he's a different I feel that he would now, have a visceral so. response yeah. to that. To be told no, by he, his lawyer after all this time, we're going to like, we're basically going to say that it was just like a crazy different person inside of you. You'd think that after the events of the first film, he would be like, no. Like right off the bat, he'd have a, he, a, he'd be like, Joker is like me. That's my deal. That's what I, that, that's what gave me great catharsis despite everything that happened in the first movie. Nah. Yes. The movie's logic is, well, he's passive now. But then again, like, when would he have heard about this strategy? Probably before right now. Well, but what it's presented in a very. Them? expository way when he mm. talks with uh, Marianne, his lawyer, like it's, what have they been doing the for the past two years? I, well, yeah, especially since like, what, there's only like a few weeks before it's headed to trial. It's like, hmm, what, you'd uh... think you would have figured this out a bit sooner, but okay. But the audience needs to be told this, so this is, this sort of, this is like one of the first sort of instances of a few in this film where it's like, man, the writing is just sloppier. It's not as good, like, yes. in terms of yeah. just relaying information to you or, uh, or progressing the plot. Yeah, it's such um, a, like, exhausted yeah. trope to be like, oh, I, I, I hate this. I, it's such a pet peeve of mine where it's like, oh, it's a split personality. This, when we're trying to sort of defend a character and justify, not justify them, but, you know, not make them into a bad guy. We're like, oh, they actually have this evil man inside of them, but they're actually not this person. It's it's such a cop out as a, and it's such an exhausted trope. I hate it. Which the I first hate one felt like it avoided. Done. This one felt like it was like, yes. no, this is me, and I did it, and I'm doing it again. <laughs> yep, Arthur yes. made his and... decisions. He's on the hook. Yes, and again, it's such a, it's such a misrepresentation of actual mental illness and how it works. It, yeah, and then because... it villainizes all those people um, almost. Good. Also, dissociative identity disorder isn't even a real thing. It's 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 largely a fiction. It is so. a it is a highly contested and uh, controversial. But you yes. say Moon Knight didn't happen. Psychological community. First off, I don't think Moon Knight actually did happen. What? Nobody so, ever talked about I, it. I don't think <laughs> nobody it did ever talks happen. about I'm, it. <laughs> <laughs> it might actually be a figment of our combined we owe, imaginations. You guys remember, that's one of the things we owe our audience is a Moon Knight breakdown. <laughs> well, never... we watched all of that goddamn show together. Listen, if they like, make a yeah. season two, out. maybe we'll pop it out, yeah. all right? <laughs> we never um, got around to it. <laughs> that is a show that just <laughs> happened. <laughs> Episode five so, uh, eight. The uh, Arthur, we he's in the courtyard and he gets approached by an inmate called Ricky, who uh, Ricky. was told was told by the guards that Joker is a good kisser. So then Arthur kisses Ricky and then goes over to hang out with the guards, uh, and they give him a <laughs> cigarette. Wasn't even a good kiss, so um, lame. Yeah, and so then uh, <laughs> then um, Jackie basically presents Arthur with the opportunity to go over to Be Ward and join a music therapy session, the one where he saw uh, Harleen singing in, and he just sort of basically like silently agrees to participate, and then that's life The that starts playing um, as he acts out his routine, but a little bit more... I don't know, it's not like... 
actively, but I, I don't know, less, less, uh, less grimly, you know, it's like, he's just sort of, you know, he's, he's like, huh, you know, that'll be fun think, seemingly. And then, yeah. Uh, th this is a good example of, um, I felt the script was weaker. This, this isn't even a, a flaw, but when, um, he says, I've set you up for that in my head, I was like, a bit odd, isn't it? I thought that the, uh, the Brendan Gleeson, the Jackie character, he's a bit of a, a bit of a dick. Just a classic sort of warden type character. That's uh, it sounds like he's doing that just for just for Joker. And then you have these lines that are like, "I get to sing too." It's like, ah, that's why you've done it. And I was like, oh, eh. I thought I wasn't very <laughs> like. It, was, it felt like um, the person at the time of writing thought to themselves, well, Jackie wouldn't do that. we got to make a reason. Have have him say that he wants to sing too, and then have someone else say, ah, that's why you're doing it. It, it just mm -hmm. doesn't feel very um, efficient. It feels like a 5 out of 10 sort of answer to the question. It feels... Like, wouldn't this have been properly nailed anyway by showing us that he's singing? Remember the, the shot where uh, Arthur's walking off and Jackie is singing, and he looks at him, and then he just carries on singing because he's enjoying it? Wouldn't that have been enough already to know that that's why he did it? You yeah. think so, but no. It's, it just felt a bit awkward to realm me. Of, yeah, it's like it's in the realm of it's logical, but it doesn't feel like earned, you know? Um, like it's halfway there. Well, and, and I guess what I'm getting at is the normally speaking, I think I just totally fine with dialogue like that, but Joker 1, I felt was a really high quality uh, a high sort bar. of script. So I, I was mm. already just struck a bit by like, a, oh, because uh, there was something earlier too. I forget. Well, to be honest with you, I forget if this was earlier or later, but there's a moment where one of the guards says, it's, it's something like, maybe you can help me out, it's something like, um, you, uh, maybe you shouldn't have killed five people and one live on TV. Something oh, like, I remember uh, that line. It felt a little uh, clunky. Yeah, and I was like, okay. This is what <laughs> happened in the last movie. Yeah, yeah. Do you not remember yeah. what happened in yeah. the last movie? Person who did those things. It's it's so odd. Cause I was like, I feel like you don't need to worry about that, right? A person, you'll be fine. We, most people remember, and if they don't, uh, it's you don't need anything other than he's in prison for murder. You don't need to be like he killed five, and one of them was on TV. You're like, uh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, not on TV. Right, yeah. Um. So the next day, he gets taken to B Ward by Jackie uh, to join this music therapy session. And he, uh, he gets, uh, put next to, uh, Harleen, who calls herself Lee, um, and, uh, like, you know, some time passes, and then he heads out to talk with her in the hallway, and so there's a, there's a few important things that she says during this scene. Um, she says that she was beaten by her father and committed, uh, by her mother because, uh, she set their apartment building on fire. Uh, and then she also explains that she's basically like a big fan of of uh, of Joker. She watched the TV movie based on him a lot. Um, she said that she grew up in the same neighborhood, and then, and she also says that she took that staircase to school every day. Which um, when I heard that, I was like, is there any reason why like the Joker stairs would be iconic in like in universe? Did he tell anybody about the stairs and their significance to him, or um, you know well what I mean? The the only thing that it could be is that the detectives chasing him found him dancing on the stairs and then chased after him. So if they sure. told their story to the people involved, either making the movie or in their reports or whatever, that's the only way. But it does it feel very meta. I, it it oh, feels yeah. incredibly meta to me because the yeah, Joker stairs bleed. are like iconic as a thing in, you know, obviously in our world. It's like iconic imagery from the film, but like... The Joker stairs, he danced down them alone. It was only those two detectives, and would they make a big deal? Like, man, his dance was pretty sweet. It was pretty iconic. <laughs> if someone had a camera, it would have been really dramatic. <laughs> but like and and this is not the this is not the last time that the stairs will come up again as like as like being relevant. And I I, I really don't get it. It definitely feels like he didn't realize that nobody was around and that the Joker stairs mm -hmm. wouldn't be I would likely not be iconic. Uh, well, in same this with world. Harley's like finger guns to her head. Like, why is that a thing she knows? Well, how does she know that that's yeah? How does she know that that's something that so? I was going to ask Who about that. He even did it because he never does that in it. a public. Like, he doesn't do that on Murray Franklin, right? I don't think. No, no, no. He does that because she does it in the elevator, and then when they get out of the elevator, uh, he does it to her um, in the first film. But like, that's it. So. You know what I mean? It's well, like how would I guess that would, one's yeah, a coincidence. Well, the justification, I suppose, would be um, when she tells her story either to news or to the people 
making the movie or police or whatever, she might have described that when he was in her apartment, he did that as well. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But even That's still, true. it does, it's, there's a thin justification for it, but it does feel very meta. But that seems like the whole purpose of the TV movie. Like the whole, the mm. whole purpose of the TV movie in this story is so is that people it, can react so, to. Yeah. Yes. They, they can justify the meta stuff and be like, well, yeah, it was in the movie. So now everybody knows. We're not oh, supposed to think of the okay. TV movie as the Joker one, right? I hope not. I don't think so. That would, it wouldn't be Hot literally a TV movie from the eighties. Yeah, like it would just. Uh, uh, I, I would kind of hate it if there were if there were like yeah, it's like a meta <laughs> sort of. That's what you saw, and it's not a true. I just like. Oh uh, well, <laughs> I sorry. I don't, yeah, that's that's not the case. Oh well. Um. And uh, so Lee repeats the knock knock joke that Arthur told on Murray Franklin's show that, you know, like the knock knock who's there, died in a car crash, he's dead um, joke. And uh, Arthur laughs and then he apologizes and he laughs again. And they both have a little laugh over that joke. Uh, and then she says that she was watching Murray Franklin and the whole time she was hoping that he would shoot him and then he did, which that feels like, well, that's. I don't believe that. I, I highly doubt that you Why were expecting did you hate that Murray? was something that wasn't going to happen. Well, I think it's just like, come on. Like, you, that, that feels like a story that you're telling afterward, which it may well be, right? As, especially with what gets revealed later about her. Um, and then, and then she, she says that, uh, that as she was watching, that for once in her life, she didn't feel alone. And then she sings, uh, she... What's the song? The, the song that she sings? The the exact title? The the like forget your troubles, get happy. That one is that what it's called? Come on, get happy. Uh, I don't actually know what it's called. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. But this is one of those. Uh. Because I had a. Th this feels like the first instance of them sort of moving towards doing the musical component of this film, even though it's you know it's just the character singing. Has, and there's nothing particularly theatrical about it. Um, it also feels and, to me the think... first step toward positioning, and I don't know how much you guys would agree with this, that uh, Lee in this film is representative of the audience that they were not happy with in the first film. No. Um, hmm. A little <sighs> bit. But I mean, but that that's already sort of there in the first movie in that, like, well, the people that view him as the figurehead of their movement, they're already misinterpreting you know, what Arthur stands for and what he wants and who he is as a person. So I don't I don't know why they felt like it was necessary to try and comment on that or to distance themselves well, the, somehow. I, I, again, I mean, we've gone over it kind of, but the, the this to me felt like a exploration of an insecurity for the fact that it was like you, you took the wrong thing away. And so they've like developed her to have traits and expressions that I think match a lot of what they thought would be the reaction they didn't want people to have which is to see Arthur's story and feel like I'm not alone and it's like no you weren't supposed to think that you were supposed to think this is a really bad downfall of a mentally ill man who needed to be taken care of not you're not supposed to find like camaraderie there or, or meaning in a sense of you know what maybe I could have done the same thing if enough things went wrong and that in a way isn't even my fault because society should do better to, to look after the, its members that sort of thing like, um, there's a lot of lines from her in this film that lead me to believe she was almost stripped of being a character and instead injected with all of the traits that they believe you shouldn't have had regarding the first film, and that would be crystallized by some of her last scenes. Uh, Something disappointed. I... I don't know, like... Uh... When it comes to her character, she's so stripped from any type of context. It's really like pure speculation as to what was the intention with her. If I if I had to guess, I think like they tried to mix Harley Quinn's personality of being obsessed with Joker, and that's what she that's why she comes off as like fangirlish. Um, and I, don't I mind think being it's just girl. that. <laughs> Like, that's fun. And that, it's, it's real, right? Like, it happens all the time. Mm hmm Yeah. And uh, that mixed with Todd Phillips' sort of pretentiousness about his previous work. And, yeah, that would be my take on her. I don't know. Well, I she's, suppose... she's quite an empty shell, and it's easy to project whatever. 
Yeah, I suppose the the core idea of someone who thinks he's amazing and likes everything he stood for and all that, that makes sense in the logic of the story. I suppose when we get to later scenes, you can elaborate on what parts make Kerr not feel like a character, I guess. Um, something that I, like, noticed, uh, it, was, it was sort of a thought I had as I was watching the film, uh, in terms of the nature of the songs that were being picked in the lyrics, like, especially if you, you know, because, uh, she sings here the, the lyrics of forget your troubles, come on, get happy, you better chase all your cares away, sing hallelujah, come on, get happy, get ready for the judgment day, and of course, you, you know, based on what happens in the film, it's like, okay, yeah, so the, 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 the lyrics are relevant, sure, but, like, but they're relevant to, a, again, a story that already has had, like, a massive, that that stands in opposition and in contradiction to what happened in the first film. So, like, I don't know how many points I feel like giving something like that, right? Of, like, yeah, the lyrics are, like, foreshadowing and thematically relevant. It's like, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd expect them to be, but... <clears throat> yep, I have a random like, song you just picked, I suppose. Yeah. Sure, I'll but, probably, you know... Um spend some sections of the stream uh, chiseling out my belief about her as a character and the intentions I had with her, but um, one of the things that's worth mentioning is um, uh, when the saints go marching in is, is like throughout this film, yes. keeps coming up mm -hmm. and uh, I started to have an idea of that combined with some of the things that happened in the songs combined with what I think the intention of Harley was, was that a uh, first film doing what it did right if, if if your goal as the creator of the first film is to say you're supposed to come away with how tragic that the joker is like this this skin and that underneath is a mentally ill man that no one actually cares about people care about joker because he's an icon and he can stir a movement but that ultimately no one actually cares about the man and that this film i'm gonna make sure you understand that by having that be pretty explicit that uh Arthur Fleck is the one underneath it all who went through all of it, and no one actually cares about him. It's it's Joker that everyone cares about, and that reflects the audience and their reaction to the first film, which honestly was not a good thing that happened, guys. You gotta we, we need to focus on the the man underneath it all, and uh, the looming song being over and over again, right? Uh, when the Saints go marching, could be you'd relate that to like uh, reaching the end because you just mentioned judgment as part of the other song as well. It's like. Mm. Uh, combine that with Harley shooting him in his uh, sequences. I have a feeling the idea is supposed to be that she gasses him up being Joker again, which is inevitably going to lead to him having to come to decide who he is as a person and make definitive statements about it, which will invariably lead him to separate himself from the Joker, which will invariably lead to him dying. Like, the, the film is foreshadowing so, with the um... songs that he's going to die, because... This film mm -hmm. is going to make it clear that the Joker is not him. The Joker's not real. He is just a mentally ill man who made mistakes. And then, uh, as a result of making those decisions, which in a way were forced in by Harley being into him in such a way that was not accurate, much like the audience of the first film, we make that clear. And then, as a result, <laughs> like I said, we're jumping around. The real Joker yeah. kills him. You know, and that's what, mm. and remember, Harley says, let's give the audience what they want before pulling the gun on him. As if yeah, in a very then, cynical way, we're it. saying the audience doesn't want to deal with a real person underneath all this who's going through trauma. They want the fucking Joker ripping his sides of his cheeks open with a knife and being like, ooh, hoo, hoo, look at me, I'm crazy. That's what they want. Which, uh, especially because that's that the lyrics of that song uh, to do with like the idea of having a successor as well. Uh, when they cut back to that, because the they you know he gets shot and then we don't see that, we come back to it at the end of the film and then yeah. he starts. Well, and it's like it's it's again it's like yeah I know that the the lyrics are like relevant but like they're all relevant to what is a fundamentally like inaccurate read of the events of the first film and this weird like reaction to the meta of the first film. So. No, I, I find it also, you know I mean? like, I just don't enjoy this journey at all, because uh, <laughs> as we made clear, the opening choice, I'm already askew, and so every question I have regarding everything they do forward comes back to that choice immediately, and then it, there's other stuff on top, and I think um, right before he gets shanked at the end, uh, they're whistling when the saints go marching in, like one of the one of the gods, and I was like, yeah, okay. Like, this is this, yeah. it's just the whole film has been like, he's gonna end up killing himself because of the choices he's going to make to be authentic, and that's really sad. And I'm just sitting here like, whatever, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> that was, you made this story that way. It didn't have to be that way. Mm -hmm. 
So, yeah, uh, what's the message? Like, what is uh, what is the message? I mean, we asked this question, but it's so crazy because in the first movie, it's sort of like, okay, he's this crazy person at the end, and whatever. And now we're like, oh no, actually, he owns up. Like, he takes responsibility for all the shit he did, and this is the inevitable end that he needs. So he can't win. It was just what are we trying to what it's so so stupid i think, I think yeah I'm... based on what you're saying that that's that's the mean spiritedness that rags mentioned earlier like even if he does try mm -hmm. to sort of disown the horrible things he did and that persona and everything it means to the worst people in the story um he's not really rewarded for it either he's just well mm -hmm. dealt with unceremoniously you could say when i and i think yeah. todd would say it's like just... that's 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 life. That's what happens in life. A lot of the the yeah, people underneath it all. They even played the song "That's Life" when it happened. Yep. So yeah, yeah. If that's right. Just like in the first film when they played it, "That's Life." What's the takeaway? Mm -hmm. that <laughs> shit, <laughs> life sucks. <laughs> that's it. Actually, life well, really is shit. So well, I suppose mm, what's maybe you should have thought about that when you were enjoying joke. I suppose it's interesting <laughs> to think about as a contrast because um you know the lyrics that are uh, that Arthur sings at the end of the first film are. That's life, and as funny as it may seem, some people get their kick stomping on a dream, but I don't let it get me down because this fine old world keeps spinning around. And obviously in the context of the first film, it's like, yeah, there's a lot to make of that as, uh, as, as, as the last thing that he says in the film, uh, compared to here where it's just like, yeah, are we playing it because that's like the song that played at the end of the first film, <laughs> and that's life and he's dead? <laughs> like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. The whole thing just seems like... Yeah, okay, yeah, all right. Um, so uh, after uh, this conversation, uh, as he's getting taken back to, uh, as he's getting taken back to the other side of Arkham, uh, Arthur tells Jackie a joke. We're the first one in a while. Um, the two of them have, have a little chuckle. Uh, but then when Arthur uh, places his hand on Jackie's back, Jackie like smacks him across the back of the head. Uh, which pretty clearly sort of cements the nature of the relationship, right? It's like, they, you know, like, he's not going to let him believe that they're, like, friends at all, or that they're in the same position. Um, yeah, yeah, having been given the context we have, right, I have to start trying to appreciate the decisions they make, despite it being built on things I don't like, as in, you know, take some of these things in isolation and, and give them, uh, you know, praise and criticism where I think they deserve it instead of constantly referring to how this shouldn't even be happening um what i quite like about that interaction as well is not just all the things you just mentioned but also the body language jackie has he makes this like stance of i am ready to fuck you up if you make any decision after i've hit you that is violent you know like yeah. i've hit you and you're going to be submissive that's how this relationship works and another thing i got from that which maybe i'm being too ben uh, generous but i really did consider it was that they do have a history where Arthur maybe in his first few months was quite aggressive maybe um maybe. And he doesn't and he doesn't want that to come maybe. back well and, and Jackie would have seen on TV that he shot uh poor old Robert De Niro in the face so I would say it's more so that yeah. well, well my because point they, is just that um it's he's he's aware of what he's capable of and he is ready at a moment's notice to fuck uh Arthur yeah. up if he even considers being violent and I and I again, it's it's a weird compliment, but I, I Brandon Gleeson is just he does everything right in this movie, and uh, I quite yeah. like that little yeah. moment as a, as a sort of praise of him as an actor as well, uh, physically as well as mm -hmm. uh, verbally. I think the only yep. thing to compliment, uh, I mean, besides like it being like competently shot, I guess, is the acting. Like acting is spectacular from all sides, but the writing. <laughs> Hmm. Is terrible. The character Goes, work is yeah. just empty for all, for everyone equally. Man, I wish it was empty. I wish this. Was, I wish this was a nothing movie instead of a movie that made <laughs> me feel like I feel. Mm. Uh So next up, as they're walking through, they they the sort of the TV room, I suppose. Um, Harvey Dent is on TV. Harvey Dent is uh, prosecuting Arthur, and he, he basically says he believes that Arthur is a monster who knew exactly what he was doing, and that they're pursuing the death penalty, uh, which promised one of the guards to be like, ha, ah, you're gonna fry, uh, how's that feel? And then Arthur starts singing in his mind. Um, th so this is like the first musical number in earnest, 
uh you could call it it's it's just yeah. him walking around the room singing not particularly well which i presume was the point i presume that was like the intention yeah because he's, he's yeah like he's not it's it's not it's not like what you would imagine in you know i guess the typical musical right where the characters break out and it's a song and it's it's you know it's like it's like very polished and and like quality and they're really good at it um this definitely feels like it's uh Joaquin Phoenix as not a singer, which I presume he's not singing not particularly well, which I, I wonder about that as a choice. I wonder if that's a good idea. I wouldn't, or I I wouldn't say played. it's bad. I would say it's not like hyper polished. It's kind of rough around the edges, especially towards the end of some of the musical numbers he has. It gets kind of like gritty and I, I quite like his vocal performance. I I think it would come across as strange if he was an excellent singer. I think I think that would be a strange <laughs> choice in the logic of the story. <laughs> I think I think I understand what you mean. I think I get you. I suppose if he was wonder. like like transcendently good. I'd be like, what, really, <laughs> Arthur? <laughs> like, damn, I... golden pipes <laughs> there, flexing yeah. him. I, I, I imagine I... him belting out Elvis voice. I thought the quality of his singing and his performances were pretty good, though I have minor nitpicks about what felt like the occasional use of pitch correction. Hard to prove mm. that sort of thing, but I got the vibe that there were moments where I'm like, I don't, this feels a little, <laughs> it's, it set off the, the, the auto tune detectors a few moments, but not, it wasn't super heavy handed. It wasn't nearly as heavy handed as that Agatha song that was making the rounds. For example, oh, what the witch's road one? Yes, holy that shit! The auto tune on yeah. that, awful. So it was I it was, Yeah, I suppose the thing is that um, because I I suppose it will, the conversation will be invited the further that we progress. But like the actual song choices, like I broadly like I like the songs choices, but I don't I don't necessarily like how they appear in the film, uh, or like how they're presented in the film, and maybe like one way of might be too early to say this, but like, I kind of felt that the nature of whether or not the song was like real, as in it actually was sung in the world, or if it was like imagined or uh, particularly theatrical, came across to me as like somewhat arbitrary. Like, I, I'm not sure, I'm like, unless there's something I'm not seeing in terms of like the reason why specific that. songs, like and it... when they appear, are on a stage, right, with like them playing you know, with, like, Harley playing on a piano and Arthur dancing in front of, like, a crowd. Yeah, some of them, whether or not they actually happened, doesn't change much. In terms of well, just... Yeah, yeah, this okay. yeah, he's singing it in his mind. He's singing, you know, like, for once in my life, like, yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm so happy. And it's like, right, because he had that one conversation with Lee, right? Because mm. he had that one convo. Which is... Like, I guess okay. in character somewhat, he uh, gets taken away with women pretty fast. That's fine. I just yeah, uh, it does feel a little like you know, be it be it like there's someone. What, what's the lyrics for that? He's like, finally, I've got someone who won't leave me or something like that. Yeah, along those lines. And it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> that's, uh, that's even yeah. a bit of a jump for you. I think I don't know. Um, I think the way I took it is he's so he's been so deprived of love and compassion throughout his entire life. I think it kind of makes sense why he would be taken with her quickly, uh, especially we will soon learn that not soon, but <laughs> that she's a uh, quite a manipulator. Mm. But um, or at least she's intended to be. Um, but I mean, when it comes to musical numbers, for me, they all just blend together, and it's just like. How many songs? How many love songs? Like, how many times are they going to confess to each other? It's so completely nonsense. <laughs> I mean, I understand the, like, idea. It's so campy that you want to do it, I guess, as a filmmaker. But there are just so many of them, and they all do the same thing. Like, they don't really accomplish much outside of like initial few ballads think, it just all gets I think, repetitive i think Something they go on like... too long as well oh yeah uh, in, and a lot of this it might be taste but i think a lot of these sequences instead of having um shorter like bursts of daydreams as often kind of happens in real life especially if you have a lot of stuff going around you mm -hmm. your daydreams are short and they're they're interrupted by other people 
which gives you a lot of opportunities to try all sorts of different smaller ones. These just, I, I think they overstay their welcome. I think they go on and on oh, and yeah. on. Right. And it's weird that in these scenarios, he wouldn't, he would be able to daydream for that long without something like getting his attention, somebody touching him, talking to him. Time works him, differently inside your head, Rex. That's right. I, it I does. think that's the logic, Fair. yeah. Uh, I would say I mean, yeah, something, of, something of the opposite. I feel that it's the story that's not serving the musical numbers. And I think that if mm. the story, because I actually don't think everything. the musical, I don't think the musical numbers are actually much longer than most. I think they're actually shorter than a decent number of musical well, numbers. I was going to say, like, that was my complaint well. on Open Bar was the, I felt like they ended super fast, a lot of them. Oh, interesting, so, interesting. There, there's so really I, I think... like none that lasts more than like maybe two minutes. They're, they're not, uh, compared to, there are a lot, a lot of musicals are just musicals, like the whole thing. Mm. There's no well, talking or shit singing, so. Um, not a lot of them. Uh, am I, I saw Cats, didn't Cats, wasn't Cats like all song? <laughs> I don't well, think it's all songs, but I haven't seen Cats. This, this could be a matter but... of what we're both thinking about when saying those things. Is it like, <laughs> Friggy, obviously, you're, you're, you're suggesting that the ratio is often higher than it is in this film for songs versus it, yeah, talking. Yeah, like in this film, you think about like, because uh, I mean, a lot of other films will be like, you know, maybe like five, ten minutes go, like a lot of Disney, the Disney, you know, Renaissance films, it's like five, ten minutes, then song, then five, ten minutes, then song, like... In terms of the ratio well, of the it, songs, a lot of people don't yeah. even count the spoken songs in this. They're like, "Nah, that's not. That's just that's it, like like it's a weird middle ground of dialogue versus musical." So oh, to speak. a lot of people. I, I'm talking. I saw the musical Cats. I haven't seen the movie. I, I saw the actual <laughs> musical. Nobody's Cats. allowed to see that until we record it for you for that movie. <laughs> oh, there <laughs> was a there was a movie. You're right. Holy shit! Yeah, there was, remember it was that, that is, movie. Comic. I, I haven't seen, uh, I I haven't seen that movie. I saw the musical. That film is notorious, and I look forward to us all reacting to it for the, the first musical? time. Musical. <laughs> oh. But, oh wow! Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the um, okay, so Cats is unique in that it is almost entirely songs. Most have stories in them, but most actually have musical numbers that are longer than the ones in this. I think part of the reason Definitely. they feel yeah, so cool. long is because the story that has preceded it has given you little or nothing or worse to think about and chew on. So when the music starts, you're like, oh, but I didn't get anything of substance before this, and now we're taking a break and. Very few, if any, of the musical numbers have plot beats in them, which isn't actually super unusual in the world of musicals. But because the story that preceded it is nothing or insulting in some cases, when we take a break from that to do a musical number that's just all in his head, it really drags because, you know, you're not getting anything other than just the music. And if you're still thinking about the story, then it's... It's not a it's not a fun experience. <laughs> On that note, I think yeah, comparing it to stuff like um, I'm not very musically, uh, musically <laughs> educated in the sense of musicals. I don't watch many, but Sweeney Todd would be an example of I really like that in terms not just the songs being very good, the but format. a lot of stuff happens. Yeah, the format that a lot of stuff happens. And there's so much emotion and earnestness and plot things and character stuff happens while the songs are being sung that it's almost like the, the, the story's just continuing. Like the movie just keeps going on. We're just in a musical part of it now. And then we'll exit the musical part and then the story will just keep on going. It doesn't feel like we have um, we've sidetracked from the story. It just feels like it's cleanly carrying right along. We're just singing it now. Yes, um, it, it's certainly not helped by the fact that most of these musical numbers either are daydreams or things yeah. that aren't happening. What what this reminded me of is uh, a lot, especially this being sort of a love story, um, is La La Land. Like, I feel like Todd Phillips just watched La La Land and he was like, oh, I want those sequences in my movie. And this this was the outcome because it does like La La Land has a has that exact thing of like daydreams at the time stopping and the characters just you know singing love songs to each other and but in that movie it actually like moves the story forward here we just pause everything just to have this number <laughs> and then break out of it. Um, well, and like the whole time I'm sort of sitting there going like I know the lyrics are relevant yeah but like they're relevant to a story that's already like. 
you you just deviated significantly again. Well, so I, don't it's that, I don't know if this is uh, yeah. moving too far away from that criticism or it wouldn't be compatible, but one of the things I got uh, a little struck by was events would happen, I'm following them, I'm not happy with them, and then the songs uh, just didn't give me much of any new information, and half of them were presented in such a way that I didn't find that interesting. But we can get to the ones that are more interesting, mm -hmm. of course, but uh, for example, the one we just went past, I was like, yep, I got most of that from yeah, the exactly. events of the story, yeah. and so that felt yep. a little like... You're hmm. just reminding me of the thing I hate, thanks. Um, <laughs> yeah. It wasn't even... <laughs> song now, it? <laughs> I just meant that, like, uh, I feel like a, uh, expressing yourself through song gives you the sort of impetus to be hitting on some things that maybe weren't so obvious, and you can, you can get away with being a bit more explicit, but almost all of them, I was just like, mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I The only thing I want to push back on is I've seen this take quite a bit, and I just saw it again in chat, that a good musical pushes the plot forward with the songs. Actually, most don't. So I feel like, like, I feel like there's got to be lots of Damn, things you can chatter. achieve. Well, no, here's, the th here's the thing. Like, pushing the plot forward, not necessarily. Like, elaborating on character motivations and things like that. Usually they sort of erupt out of a scene where we're already sort of establishing... Uh, you know, dynamics between the characters, and then we elaborate them, elaborate on them in more detail. It's actually not super common for the musical number to introduce a plot event that is an important part of moving things forward. It happens, but it's actually not as common as you think. Well, a lot of them I are think... like declarations of character, you know? Like, yes. Especially think about a lot of Disney musicals, right? I just can't wait to be king, pretty straightforward. Or uh, Bell. It's just like, yeah, these are songs that essentially is like, this is the character, this is what they value. Well, you know, yeah, a like musical where so you've got a bunch of guys in a barber shop reading the newspaper, and then one guy gets up, starts dancing, singing, doing all kinds of things, and then musicians come in, and then it ends, and the guys with the newspapers are still sitting down. You can sometimes have the question of, did they hear any of that? Did that, did that happen? And, and uh, sometimes musicals yeah. deal with whether or not the characters sort of impact on the world was actually felt or that that was for the audience alone and um there's some musicals i've watched that even like address that question i can't remember if the scrubs one did or not but i know the buffy one does it uh kind it's of like, like turn-based combat in video games <laughs> what just happened guys what just happened just to be clear what what just happened there when we what, what no oh okay we're, we're carrying on okay like like and, the song will crescendo the and then one character who was in the scene but didn't do any dancing or singing goes sorry what just and to the people of, in hmm. chat who are pointing to individual musical numbers that do move the plot along, yes, I know. That's why I didn't say none of them. I said most. Oh, my God. I, 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 this, this is fine. I, I, it, what, it seems to be what he's saying is that that should not be the sole identifier of whether or not the musical is working, which I think I can agree with. I agree. Yeah, yeah I agree. Um, so that musical plays out and it ends and uh, back in reality, Arthur, like, chuckles. But he's being glared at from across the room by the uh, the inmate that's going to stab him to death at the end of the film. Woo. Whoa, um, what? Damn. Spoilers. Yeah. I already mentioned that. Not, not spoilers. <laughs> yeah, not spoilers. Well, I already mentioned it. Everybody yeah, knows. I mean, sort of. It was... No. <laughs> no, no I made not. a big point more about it. <laughs> yeah, more explicitly I, talking there was about a... it. I, I don't know. I think that it was sufficient. This is Fringy's fault. No, you're just wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, Rags. Uh, I can't. Anyway, I wish to take the blame you're putting on Fringy. It is my fault. I've spoiled it already. Yeah. I decided it was important. You're in cahoots. That's the fine. both of you are in cahoots. Remember um, in 2019, if people wanted to, like, when Endgame came out, and if someone wanted to piss someone else off, they would just go, like, Iron Man dies. Have a good day. Bye. And that would be like a whole thing. I feel like this ending and the spoiler is like the op exact opposite of that, but it still pisses people off in the same exact way. But um, to, a really good parallel, I think, would be to say that uh, it is now used as a way to protect people. Like, Joker gets shagged by the real Joker at the end, quote unquote, don't watch it. <laughs> like, yeah, like, oh, exactly. okay. Um,. And then, and then Arthur is just standing in the rain, tied to a post and laughing. Right. Yes. It's, yeah. What, what's that about? He's nervous again, so he's laughing. Because that's why he why would laugh he before. Why post in the rain? Because, because that's his recreational time. Um, but that's not... He walks around normally in recess anyway, right? Like, we've seen him do that without a little line, but yeah. And there was nobody around as well. He was just standing out there, tied to a post. It looked like he was tied to the post, I'm not sure. And it's but weird, because obviously it's 
raining, like, is this a punishment they're doing to him, or is this something he wants? I don't know. I have no idea. Not sure. <laughs> um, so, uh, next up is Arthur is on the phone with Marianne, um, and she she's, like, desperately urging him not to talk to the press, because they've got an interview set up. Um... And, uh, seeming, basically, the, the seemingly, he, he almost feels, like, more compelled to talk to them because he's been talking to Lee, uh, or had that interaction with her, um, and then he hangs up, and this guard is like, hey, can you sign my book? And he whispers very loudly as Arthur starts signing the book about how excited he is about how much money the book's <laughs> gonna be worth when Arthur gets electrocuted. He's very loud. Arthur can definitely yeah. hear him. Um, he's right he on. He does, and he looks at him, and then he writes... He, like, whispers instead. past Arthur. Yeah. Like, yeah, he's, he's standing right next to him. Like, I don't know what he was expecting. <laughs> like, he could obviously hear him. And then, of course, he, he then writes, I hope you get cancer, smiley face. So, yeah, that didn't... That was I mean, cute. I, I suppose yeah. that doesn't diminish what the book's going to be worth, but still, I just don't <laughs> understand why he whispered it so loudly. He might as well have just said well, it out loud. It also, because I thought the, the message was funny, but the... the He'd already convinced Jackie to give him the time, so to add that on top, I just felt like it was unnecessary. I mean, I, I can think of all the reasons why he would have done that. It's like, yeah, but he's got to prompt the funny line. I'm like, okay. Yeah. And I guess that's that. Uh, which then brings us to a movie night. Um, they're watching uh, The Bandwagon, Arthur and Lee, uh, with, the, with the rest of the like music therapy group. Um, Lee wants to leave, uh, stating that she already knows how the film is going to end and that everything is going to work out, but Arthur just shushes her. Well. And then she sort of, yeah. I feel like there's a bit of meta going on here. I Let's mean, get out of here. Yeah. They'll shoot me. Come on, we know how this ends. Like, like, like oh, because there's uh, so many yes, references. Very clever, Todd. Well, I just very don't, I, I don't appreciate it, really. I'm like, what do you, like, what? It's inevitable that Arthur will die? True, he is mortal. I mean, as long as it's been ordained by Todd, I guess then so. yes. <laughs> yeah, because Rags, this yes, is the DC I universe. Suppose. We could have Darkseid come in and imbue him with God Emperor powers, okay? No, Live forever. he... God Emperor Joker. <laughs> <laughs> you want to hear a funny joke? And he draws the anti-life equation. <laughs> <laughs> um... So, uh, Lee reaches out her hand to, like, hold his hand, but then stops, uh, before getting up, walking to the other side of the room, lighting a fire, dropping it in the piano, uh, and then just sitting back down. What a waste. And a sort of, a, a, well, I feel like somebody would have noticed <laughs> before, it, before it got as bad as it Maybe was. Maybe if they're all on it really, really long. good behavior, and I mean, they're relatively trusted, and yeah. everyone's looking at the film, maybe. I guess you don't expect that, yeah. Because a lot of people go off it's to smoke, the... right? So it's like, she was just smoking. Yeah. So. I, it's just that the fire gets really bad really quick, and you even start to hey, see Fringy. smoke sort of appear on, uh, yeah? I guess you could say she was arson around. I feel like ars arson and horsing are not quite similar enough for Fringy. that pun that's, that's a joke. No, that's a joke from uh, uh, Curse of the Were-Rabbit. Oh, was it? Yeah. When? When? When, uh, when the when the police constable, <laughs> uh, but right when everyone's like vegetables and stuff was were getting eaten, he say uh, the the constable guy comes in and he's like, "It was arson," and I was like, "What?" I said, like, "Arson is like yeah, some some young kids arson around." Ha 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 ha. The joke from your movie that you like. I Rags, need to rewatch. Uh, he's having trouble because he thought it was a bad joke, but now he can't say that because it comes from that movie. That's right. You fucked him over. <laughs> That's right. You bamboozled me. Gotcha. <laughs> it's um, a good joke from a great movie, <laughs> but I thought I thought you didn't like from that a, from from a very great movie, movie. Curse the Were Rabbit. Yeah. yeah. Um, if it came from a movie. It's good. If it came from Rags. It's bad. Easy. <laughs> no, it came from. Look, I would. I didn't even say it was bad. I just said I wasn't <laughs> sure if Arson and Horson were quite similar enough. <laughs> <laughs> that's all <laughs> but hey maybe i'd feel differently if i saw it in the funny british accents in the no, fun did not, play movie not... yep what yeah yeah i agree they have yeah, british accents so. yeah oh wait um oh, yeah. we might actually be in a position where we can say the movie's joke was good and rags's was bad because it's a play on arsing around in the movie oh, it's british of arson, oh. whereas rags's was playing on horsing why didn't you correct me when I said horsing? Damn. 
I can't believe we actually I, got oh, to a fine. point where Rags we're made not, the bad version of the joke. <laughs> Uno I'm trying to, five, I'm trying, just to be clear, I'm trying to recall oh, from memory a joke that was in a redeemed. film I haven't seen in many years. Redeemed. And I thought that I would just do something nice and bring it up from a movie redeemed. that Fringy really what, likes. What a roller coaster was that was. Mistaken. That was a roller coaster. That was some good writing, uh, EFAP writers. Good yes. stuff. <laughs> really, really good. I can't believe that this has happened. This is unbelievable. I just thought I would do something nice for Fringy, but I was so wrong. <laughs> Apologize for um, the specific way that the joke was worded from a movie I haven't seen in You're such a joker, Rags. Look at you go. Oh, look at you, Joker. Now we need a Rags mark with Rags with the Joker makeup crying. <laughs> I used to so think uh, that this I used to think this podcast was a tragedy. Yes. Um, so uh when she sits back down, the lyrics uh in the, the song or uh, the lights on the lady in tights or the bride with the guy on the side or the ball where she gives him her all, that's entertainment. And she says, now that I understand. What do you, what's, what's that mean? Um, I mean, it's, it's an exhilarating moment. This is a big old change for him, right? He's finally living again somewhat. And uh, I also think it's supposed to reflect how we engage with Joker as content as a, a thing of like, this is about a man whose life is falling apart, whose brain is shattering into pieces, who's attempting just to try and live a happy life, and we're all entertained by the carnage, by the chaos. I assume these are pieces of what it's going for, but as was mentioned before, the story that is being built to facilitate these little pieces are actually like so annoying and frustrating and contradictory to, to what I see as the story as it's supposed to be, that I'm finding this less and less meaningful and more and more indulgent. Yeah. I'm inclined to agree. It's a kind of running theme. Yep, I get it. The lyrics mean something, but they mean something in a story that's dumb. I'm annoyed was... with Harley for interrupting the movie. He seemed like he was having a good time. Yeah. Bad influence. Yeah. <laughs> he even said, like, yeah. yeah, they're about to start the song and everything. And especially if you live in B Ward, where, like, life sucks. He's like, I get to watch a movie. I got a cigarette today. You know, he's trying to take the, the dubs where he can get them. Like, quit talking during the movie. <laughs> uh, so the fire, um, like, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, I'm so confused. I mean, I'm not the most competent in prisons, <laughs> but, uh. No, you're not? Are they, <laughs> are they that, uh, is cigarettes and, uh, like, lighters and stuff so available there? Available? Well, she, she was using, uh, Matches the, the, yeah. in that in that sequence, and she is in yeah, what was it, the still, B ward. Like that, it's like the trusted which is ward. Like minimal security. Because remember, so, she's a volunteer, yeah. right? Or rather, she volunteered to be in there, so mm -hmm. she's considered like she's safer. It's so confusing to me. And it's also because Arthur too smokes quite a lot, and it's just wouldn't that be a little bit more limited? Um, well, so he's not allowed to have cigarettes, from what I gather, other than the guards doing it as a favor, which they have seemed to develop some kind of rapport with that mm, yeah. exchange. But with her, in their ward, I assume they're allowed to have cigarettes of their own. And, and they're probably... The yeah, it's, it, it's, well. it's an earlier era where security probably isn't as uh, strong. Or rather, maybe that's not security, Smoking that's just like regulations just aren't as strong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. So Thank you. The fire breaks out, it gets really crazy. Uh, and as everybody's clearing out of the room, Lee kisses Arthur, and then they, they both, they run, they run outside, they like run away from the guards, and run outside where they start singing and dancing together, which uh, I suppose this is to be taken as, uh, the singing, like it's real, basically, this is yes. happening, this is not a dream, uh, a dream sequence, they are singing and dancing outside, while, while the fire is getting quite big. Um, which you presume that there would be serious consequences for, for, uh, mm -hmm. for, for Lee, but, um, I mean, I'm jumping ahead, there won't be. The fire is big, it's quite big, it spread to multiple rooms. Is, yeah, um, it looks like my building's on fire. Is there dialogue to say that they knew she did it, or is it considered an accident of some kind? Well, the thing is, is that later on she says that she's being taken out because there's a bad influence, but I guess we're, we're but that's, that's, like, not true. Right. So... Mm -hmm. So, I, I, but but even then, you'd expect it's like, dude, you, you like set the building on fire. Oh yeah, that's what I'm um, saying. If they knew it was her, she would go to jail. <laughs> this uh, you can't set a whole fucking building on fire and get away with it. Yeah. Well, it's just 
Arthur was sitting down the whole time, so he couldn't have done it, and it would have to well, be no, either him or... the story would have to be, like it's an unfortunate accident where a fire started, and we don't know exactly yeah. why. Or rather, that they would have discovered it was matches or a cigarette mm. or whatever, which I think there's no way to pin it on her, specifically. That's yeah, the... that, that, yeah, 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 that's true. But uh, they're dancing and they're singing. I believe it's the same song from the the uh, the film. Like, That's Entertainment. I think that's the song. Um, I believe so, yeah. Mm. Yeah, and, and they're, they're singing and they're dancing. And then they run over to the gate where all of the journalists are. And they try to climb out. Uh, but, of course, it doesn't work. They get grabbed. And Arthur is very violently placed into solitary confinement by Jackie. Um, so, yeah, that's that's that. That's, that's, uh, that's them dancing. Which, again, it almost feels like, is there any reason why this one doesn't have any additional theatrical embellishments? Why is this one entirely, like, literal? Though, though it, it, of course, it can't be as well, right? Because there's no music playing to them singing. So it would just be, it would just be her singing in silence. Well, not in silence, this, but as this one function and as fire and everything. This one functions more like most musical numbers in musical movies, where mm -hmm. it's, you know, the music is just like part of the, the artifact yeah yeah it's in the world but it's not in the world at the same time um but but that, i guess this is what i mean though it's like so that's happening and that's like just played as straight but then as soon as arthur gets put in solitary confinement now it's like a new musical number but it's in his mind and it's theatrical and they're on like a stage with a backdrop and it, it says like hotel arkham and everything um, it's just like, okay, now I guess this one's happening and this one is in his mind. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? It's just like, I don't, I don't see the, like, the rhythm or the, the, the sort of, like, reason behind why any of them are happening at any particular time and why they're happening in his dreams or not. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't feel as deliberate as you would expect it to be. Well, um, even in a broader sense, you know, the first movie was very deliberate and meaningful in playing with what scenes are real and which are in his head or what elements of yes. the scenes are in his head. And in this movie, I don't feel like you're rewarded for thinking about it. Like, no, well, no, a lot of it doesn't require much no, thought. No one's thinking this is real. This scene yeah, isn't. exactly. And so, like, by the end of the movie, I don't know if there are any scenes that make you go, oh, that wasn't, that wasn't real or that was real. Like, no. It's no, just, it feels like it's easy to delineate between what's real and what's imagined very and they easily. Don't, and as we mentioned yeah, earlier, impact anything. some of them, even if they didn't happen or did happen, doesn't change a lot. We're just like, oh. No. Well, it's, and, and in terms of, again, like it feels like there's not much to say about the song. It's just Lee singing about how she's in love with Arthur. That's, the, that's, that's it. You know, it's like, well, that's the meeting. That's live. Uh, so, think... go ahead. Yes. Uh, for me, the musical numbers, even detached, like I enjoy musicals, um, even detached from the story, even when it's done like that, I think it should add some kind of artistic value to the whole thing. Um, and for me, these sequences are quite luckluster. They look pretty, but they feel like I've seen this done so many times before and so much better in other musicals and other films. and. Uh, yeah. Well, you expect it's... that with two hundred million dollars that they'd be particularly, yeah. potentially very uh, extravagant and uh, very well choreographed. Lots of mm -hmm. you know backup dancers and singers as well, but especially to help contrast his imagination with reality. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't think it's especially artful. I don't think it's creative or motivated in any way. I don't think they have any vision outside of just reason. I don't think they add much of a value to the film. But no, that's I mean, my I, but yeah. subjective take on it. I think the best part of the musical numbers for me what were like the arrangements, the actual music itself. The actual songs, did, yeah. Yeah, I think they did a very good job. And I, I, this is probably the highest point of praise I would give the whole movie is that I think they did a really good job of making the arrangements for the songs feel as if they exist in the same musical world as the score. So like mm -hmm. we're hearing Frank Sinatra songs or songs from old 50s musicals, but there's that there's the sort of uh, dark sort of cutting cello underneath it, like that we get in the score from the first movie. There are little dissonant flourishes that give it a sort of demented feel that is definitely not in any of the original versions of those songs. So I thought they did an excellent job with that. I thought, you know, I agree. 
Because it's a it's a jukebox musical, which is something of a rarity these days. You know, none of the songs are original to the film. And so they're like repurposing them for this story. And in terms of just how they're arranged and how they're performed, I actually thought that stuff was really good. So I enjoyed the music when it was happening. That was really the only time I enjoyed the movie <laughs> is when the songs were <laughs> When you got to listen to songs and it's like, hey, I like that song. Yeah, I don't like, like, I don't yeah, like what I'm meant to take of it from this film and like the lyrics and what they relate to for this film. But exactly. songs um, themselves then, are good. And then the, the other thing, oh God, I just lost my train of thought. There it goes. Never mind. Uh, that's okay. It might it might come back. Um so uh yeah that, that song plays out and then um uh oh, oh and I suppose the thing that's worth noting is that this is the first musical number where uh you know imagined or otherwise he's in his Joker makeup. Um which I I don't know, I suppose you could be like, ah yes, see it's the beginning of uh it's the beginning of starting to sort of head towards that identity again. Well, um, she's explicit. She says, "I want to see the real you," right? Oh, oh well, sorry. No, you're no, saying no, you're saying in the, the in the song. The imagine, yes. Well, yeah, because one that's... thing you mentioned as well was that Harley uh, admitting that she like loves him in it, and it's like, well, it's, it, it, we are supposed to believe it's taking place in his head, right? She's got nothing to do with it necessarily in terms of her in the real world. It is him no, no, dreaming no, no. about her, expressing to yeah. him, yeah. Which I suppose it's interesting then that he is wearing the Joker makeup because that means that jo that he must believe that that's like specifically what she wants to see. Which I suppose, you know what I mean? It's like I guess I guess if, if yeah, to um, he's come to that conclusion for himself that he recognizes that that's like who she wants to see. And well, which be would with. be coherent if he believed that element. The that. makeup is all yeah. him. Yeah, that's all him. There's yeah, no exactly. one and the other. But uh. But of course, you know, as as we progress, it will become apparent that that's yeah. not the case. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, uh, Arthur wakes up in his cell uh, and Lee's there, and she says that um, that she was let in by one of the guards. Now, as I understand it, people speculate on whether or not this happened, mm -hmm. like whether or not this is real or ha a hallucination. But again, if 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 it feels like it's it's got to be real, right? Given uh, given yeah. Things that are said later. Well, it's this the only scene real. we see th that being justified by an actual event, but maybe they they had other times where they were able to do that. Mm. Which is weird because when I was watching it, I'm like, "There's no way this is real." They would no, never. No, I thought there was no way this person... is real. I actually yeah, thought, I, I thought this was, was the nuts. film's no explicit way. reference to how you will encounter scenes that aren't real. Like this was the film saying, "For example, yeah, this too. isn't real, but it's up to you to figure out the rest." But it has to be. Well, but it can't what, be. It's nonsense. What what? Well, it's what says later. <laughs> well, I mean, it's not well, impossible that she did some guess, kind of favor for a god, and he let he let her in for you know what I mean. Like it's not I, impossible. I guess, I, I, I guess what I'm saying is that, but it has to be because of she of her claim that she's I just said later you, you could try and argue yeah. that they had other opportunities to do that. Um, ah, uh, sure, I guess, but. But they probably didn't know, right? <laughs> like, well, uh, this is the thing. I feel like it's probably it, it, you know it's a movie, so there's plenty of things we didn't see. But I don't know. Like, I'm with you. I understand what you're saying. I just uh, yeah. I'm I'm also with rags of the, of the of the whole like I couldn't. I was like, this is obviously fake. That is like, well, I mean, yeah, but but it seems like it's not. Like another scene that seems like it must obviously be fake, but Todd Phillips himself said was real. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. You know, so we, we can talk about that one later. Um, basically, the, well, the gist of this scene... Can I just be yeah. quick, though? Like, this is an example of, if this scene is real, that's that's fine. If it's fake, it's like, all right. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't yeah. actually change much no, of anything in terms of... Mostly, the only yeah. thing it changes is whether or not it makes sense that it could happen. <laughs> it's not like yeah. it's changing much on the character side of things. Um, Lee explains that she's being sent home because Arthur is a bad influence on her. Uh, and she, but she spins this in a positive way, saying she'll be able to attend the trial every day before he gets out, at which point they're gonna build a mountain. Um, yes. And then Arthur declares that he stopped taking his medication. Um, it, she said, like, you gotta stop, and he said, oh, well, yeah, I have stopped. Uh, and then before they, uh, before they have sex, she applies his Joker makeup, claiming to want to see the real Arthur. And uh, something that I would say that I... In terms of, in terms of, uh, because it feels like we're not going to actually like take advantage of any opportunities to praise the production aspects of the film. 
uh, because there's so much to be said about the writing <laughs> and the storytelling, but uh, I really like how the lighting, like the light that's coming through in the window kind of casts Arthur's face in white. So like, she's not actually like applying the white portion of the makeup. She's just doing the, like the eyes and the, the mouth. Yeah. Oh, the you're light right. Lighting it kind of looks like it's a complete Joker makeup. And it's like, that's, that's like a neat detail. I liked the, when he was thrown into the solitary confinement, the light on the door just highlighting his face in the whole room. I thought that was neat. I liked the yeah. the night after, I think, that he'd first met uh, Lee, where the door closes, yeah, it's when pitch he's black, the... and he's lit up by his own cigarette. I thought cigarette, that was good shit, yeah. too. This yeah. is this is reference, because we did say broadly that the film has got plenty of good-looking shit in it. It's just hard to <laughs> feel a lot for these shots when you, the story is annoying you so hard. Yeah. yeah. That makes yeah, it even more heartbreaking to me. A little bit. Well, yeah, because yeah. imagine if it was good. Imagine if it was yeah, a good exactly. movie. <laughs> that would have been nice. Um, so our next up is Arthur getting prepared for his interview with Patty Myers, uh, the interview that got set up for him by Marianne. Um, she basically is urging him to show the public who he really is, that he's not Joker, but Arthur Fleck, uh, who was, you know, like, sick and ill. Uh, and then Arthur kisses her just out of the blue, which uh, stuns her and, and prompts her to suggest cancelling the interview. But uh, he sits down and it proceeds as planned. Um, and during the, uh, the the conversation sort of starts with uh, talking about, like, you know, if he remembers what happened and uh, having a hard time telling the difference between what's real and imaginary. So it seems like he's... Um, I, I feel like it's hard to tell whether or not it's a case of him being, like, on board with this as a narrative to present, or if mm. he's, like, being convinced of it, or if he believes it in earnest. I have no you know idea what I mean? his perspective is, and I feel like that should be a very important part of his character in this movie, is if he's, is he going to accept, well, essentially, is Arthur going to accept the lie that it's a different part of him that isn't really him in order to maybe get off with a lighter sentence, or is he going to fully adopt it? Even if it will give him potentially a harsher a harsher penalty. I honestly, I th I think the people who adore this film slash Todd Phillips would likely tell you that's actually not <laughs> important compared to Arthur figuring out for himself who he is and what the Joker is in reference to him. He is not thinking about his sentence or the results of it at all. He's just thinking about his mental state. Yeah. Well, don't don't we get a little bit of that by implication, like when. This interview, you know, he eventually, he doesn't seem to accept the story. He doesn't say so explicitly. And then later when he will eventually fire his lawyer, does isn't that kind of an indication of how he views this lie and whether he wants to go along with it? Um, I guess the thing is, is that that also has to be packaged with the whole idea of, oh, you know, Joker is a performance and he's felt compelled to put on the performance, <clears throat> but then no, like, yeah. he realizes the bullshit. Definitely all of that. It's just, it's got nothing to do with avoiding sentencing in any way, shape, or form, even though that would be a very practical concern. And it is brought up to him when he's watching the TV in one of the earlier scenes. It's just not something that seems to phase him at all, whether or not he's going to get executed, I guess. Which, you know, is partially in line with the fact that he's always been ready to kill himself, I guess, uh, from the first film. But mm -hmm. it does feel as though the first film rejects that aspect of him by the end of it, right? Like, he's moved on from that. He isn't in any ways yeah. ready to die anymore. He doesn't believe that's the right result. So I think there was definitely room for it to be explored in this film, especially considering just how much in this film doesn't need to be there. Yeah. <laughs> like 99%. Anyway, as, the, uh, <laughs> as the interview progresses, he starts getting a bit more... Uh, uh, well, so um, he, he gets asked about... Um, you know, like, when talking about going on the Murray Franklin show, he says he was planning on killing himself uh, on TV, but changed his mind because Murray was a bad actor, uh, which then, pro <clears throat> pardon, which then prompts Patty <laughs> to repeat the line, you get what you fucking deserve, um, and saying, like, well, you know, that's not funny, that's not a funny joke, and then Arthur says, I should have told a better joke. Um, yeah, I'm so, uh... <laughs> joking now? Uh, um... It's it's weird to see Steve Coogan in one scene, uh, just it is weird being very serious. Uh, though you can't do that, it's fine with me. I'm just it's just kind of strange. Well, I even um, this is what I do. I'm just thinking about Hot Fuzz. I mean, <laughs> oh, I was gonna say I think about Tropic Thunder first instead of Hot Fuzz. Like interesting. The f I, I'll never forget in the cinema watching 
so to speak, the conclusion of his story. In this, and I was fucking blown away. I couldn't believe that happened. I thought it was hilarious, the, uh, specifically Tropic Thunder. And, I'll, and that's like my favorite Steve Coogan role at this point now, um, other than the classic sort of thing. But what I was going to bring up was um, I find it interesting on a meta level, just the Steve Coogan and Brandon Gleeson talking in the background that's muted while uh, Arthur's talking to his representatives, so to speak. Um I wonder if they're having real dialogue or if they're just having a conversation. Cause, oh, Scott. <laughs> yeah, because like, they wouldn't need to have an accurate one to their characters. But, you know, you could you could have them do that, but you could simultaneously just like, I wonder what they were talking about. Maybe just like, hey, this film's pretty neat, isn't it? And the other one was like, not really. <laughs> have you read the full script? They might not have even read the full script. That happens sometimes. Oh, yeah. Um. So uh, Arthur starts to get a bit more flustered when he gets pressed on the notion of this idea that there is an alternate personality called Joker who took over. Uh, and then he starts calling him low IQ. Uh, like, Pat starts calling Arthur that, like a IQ loser. Yeah, the, the interviewer oh. calls him that, yeah. <laughs> it's a bit like, okay. Uh, and, then, and then Arthur gets big mad uh, and scolds him for not caring about him or how he's changed compared to before. Like, that that should be the focus, that he's he's feeling better before. Uh, or he's feeling better than he did before. And then so when uh, when Patty asks him what's changed, Arthur says he's not alone anymore. Um, obviously referring to Lee, who at this point we already know is, uh, it was in the papers. There was a shot earlier where... Uh, where you see her face in the newspaper, so it's you know it's kind. Of, she's yeah, already the, like a known element. The film is not going to play with the idea that she's not real. We're definitely she's definitely real. No, she's definitely real. Um, mm. definitely real. And then uh, Arthur starts singing. Um, he, he starts singing, but of course this one is for real. Um, and I suppose something that's interesting. I suppose it's interesting because I, I feel like it goes nowhere. Is that Jackie seems to be almost like taken aback kind of like disarmed a little bit by seeing him sing i'm not sure if any of you got that impression it looked like he was kind of like almost stunned um, oh i get what you're I saying mean, the expression is that of like it's almost strange in terms of like, what is he huh, thinking about you know huh. that sort of that sort of reaction but I, yeah I, like this is I, weird kind of oh I, I meant more so like almost in a positive way almost like that he's it's like it's it's kind of like having an impressed. effect um, not impressed. Not it's impressed, kind of like, but yeah. Like a, just sort of a positive being taken aback. If there was a chill no vision of in yeah. awe, it, it's not quite in awe, but, yeah, but yeah. somewhere further down, but in the same vein. Something like that. Um, yeah, it is an interesting I, I, reaction from him. I don't know, it's just, I, 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 don't know what, I don't know what's really to be said. It's just like, yeah, he starts singing well, and, and sort of performing to the camera. Something about this conversation that I felt again, because I feel like the kind of whole film's doing this. When you have um, Steve Coogan saying, "What are you? What, what are you saying? It wasn't you. It wasn't Arthur Fleck. It was some killer clown, some creature inside of you that did all." That. And I'm just sitting there like, "No." Why are we doing this? Yeah, Why like, is this even, like a big conversation. And I think someone could say like, "Well, yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that's what happened. It's just being explored by the characters." But I'm just like, we're wasting so much time talking about something that's not true just for the film to say it's not true when none of us thought it was true. What's the point of this? <laughs> exactly. Yep. Yeah. And it's such a such a movie dialogue too. It it's not realistic for them to be to be talking this way to each other. I feel like it just. For the, as you said, for the movie to get across the point it wants to get across. Yeah, I just, agree. I, yeah. Do we remember why they're even doing this interview? Uh, the view is that this will... Essentially, the view is that this will allow them to see the real Arthur... But the real Arthur in this case being the, the, the argument, right? His argument in terms of his defense... Which is that there's Arthur, and look at Arthur, look at him, he's he's just a sad, mentally ill fella, and then there was Joker as a different persona, and that that's like the point of the interview, is to try and present that case. I guess in, in the public opinion, right? In the public, because, yes. Yeah, okay. PR. Pretty much. I suppose, I suppose that makes enough sense. Hmm. Uh, but outside, uh, Arthur singing, it's, it's, it's being broadcast on TV, and so Lee is watching... And so she smashes a window and takes the TV, which would turn it off. So, not really sure, unless she doesn't own a TV, or she just felt like smashing a window. <laughs> I thought it was funny, she, she, like, she like, tears it out of its cables, I was like, you need those. Yeah, <laughs> you need those. 
you're just you're just taking a TV that you can't watch now. Yeah. So what's the point of that? Um, it's it's <laughs> dramatic. But another thing that would can, is is still. Sorry, I'm just I'm still so confused as to what she was trying to do there or what what she, she wants the TV. Let her have she it. Wants but the it doesn't TV work. Watch the <laughs> moment, she so she breaks it and she can't watch it, and it will be over what? by the time she gets home. Why? Yeah. So. Why? <laughs> it's so strange. She's gonna, she's gonna cuddle the TV. Really what she did. Uh, yeah, I guess so. <laughs> it's a tiny little one too. I don't. I don't. Yeah. Know. Well, it's because that was probably the easiest one to carry. Yeah, you can't be <laughs> carrying a big old TV. <laughs> <laughs> this thing's been really heavy, man. One year, though. Um, so I was just going to bring up. Just... Yes. Uh, real quick, in in the when you're speaking to the interviewer, um, that would still support what I think the film was trying to go for a lot of the time. And he does say in response to all those claims that nobody wants to know who he is now and yeah. i still think yeah mm -hmm. like fully referencing the whole like nobody wants to know the man everyone likes the joker and that's what that's what lee i don't know man it feels like the first film was about understanding the i man, disagree so yeah i thought that that, that film yeah. more than any other inter interpretation of the joker was trying to say look at the man that became the joker usually you don't do exactly. that with joker that was the controversy on, Todd? what's happened yeah it's like so you don't care about arthur flex like no the whole that was everyone did care that's why people liked the movie yeah, stop trying mm -hmm. to convince people to that that's not what happened. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing, Todd? Very Jeez. annoying in a meta sense, but also just in in the story. Why would he say that? I don't. Yeah, well, I don't believe he would say that. Well, yeah. Like, how what? much attention is he even paying? How much attention is he paying to like the conversation surrounding him in the real world when he's in prison? And he's he's not like reading newspapers or anything. You know what I mean? He's also he wrong even have, like, because in which to make those assessments. His representation of desperately trying to argue that he is Arthur Fleck and that we should care about that man and not the creature that came out briefly and made him act in ways that were not him. You know what I mean? Like there are people who are trying to advocate for him specifically to help him. But like make it. Yeah, it, do, it does right. feel like another bleed, a meta bleed. There's a lot of that in this film. Yep. Mm -hmm. Which uh, the brings us to him going into the city for his first day in court, and while he's driving there in the car, he, he's like practicing faces that he's supposed to put on. Um, which in particular, this as a thing that was happening, the idea that he was there, sort of practicing how he should look. It's like, man, so we have like outright totally because this was what he was doing in like the first movie. This was like a thing that he was he was trying to do was figure out how he was supposed to act rather than simply being as he as he as he uh should be. And it's almost like it goes unrecognized. You know what I mean? Don't like uh, wasting time and repeating time. Why? Why why why? Why must you I mean what's the point of making a film if you're going to do a sequel if you're going to just repeat beats from the first film like this? Why yeah, it's like it's like a really bad case of sequelitis plus something else. <laughs> humor i got yeah. some small enjoyment out of watching him in this scene just because he's a really talented actor and yeah. he's given a good performance yeah. and i think there are a lot of scenes like that where i'm just like oh look at you go joaquin look at oh that was an interesting yeah. <laughs> look at you go buddy <laughs> look at you go joaquin <laughs> <laughs> you got paid a lot of money i presume yeah, for I this so, so. You, know, you got that bag um he uh he rolls up to uh to the to the courthouse and there's hundreds of adoring fans cheering him on like yeah good Woo. job Joker woohoo mm. and he he kind of like gives him I don't know what you call it like a sort of like a yeah I'm here Casual thanks up, yeah well he doesn't he does I don't think he actually uh puts he does a thumbs up it's more like just a wow. yeah look at me and then smiling yeah. Well, so, so does he like all the attention he's getting, or does he think that no one cares about who he is as a person? I don't know. I don't know. Well, I guess I don't aren't, think we getting, he... aren't we getting both of those back to back? I don't think this yeah. movie allows him to think. It's, it's pulling him <laughs> well, in all different what directions. Is, a little. Yeah, what is, how does he see his relationship with all the people outside who dress like him, who idolize him, who want to help him out? Like, they don't what care is, about what him, Rags. Opinion... They care about Joker. All right, Even though then. he's clearly Moving happy on. to see them, that's that's yeah, the point. It's like... it's like, it just doesn't doesn't really line properly. Because wouldn't that make more sense uh, to have him looking almost apathetic or um, 
lamenting if that, that audience. Was, if that's the direction they were going in. But again, that's not what he should be thrilled. Well, it's just like, it's almost like the first, the first film, film is actually creaking through here every once in a while. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's, exactly. it's almost like they're reminded when they make these scenes, like, oh yeah, he loves mm -hmm. he loves attention, he loves being known, he loves ha having people recognize his existence. That does come up explicitly in this film, and it's just like, man, fucking watch the first one more. <laughs> like, you can watch yes. it a few more no, times. No, but we, we don't have enough time, because we got to bombard with more meta, because mm. as he's getting taken into the court, he starts singing, keep on smiling, because when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. And then, okay, showtime. And then he steps in, he's like, yeah, see? Showtime, he's putting on a show for you fuckers. <laughs> that's, the, that's the point. That That's all I got from that. Well, like, yeah, yes. Uh, there's stuff like He's that throughout the film the as well that ends up, it just creates this little like brew of gross and miserable. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Because I, I don't, I don't, I don't just, like yeah. the, the explicit like, you only like it for the chaos, you like it for the suffering, don't you, audience? I'm like, oh, shut up. You're Leave here to see a crazy story. It's, it's like, yeah, it's a, it's a film. You're making a film. Like, people are here to see your story. And you <laughs> can't get cringy. mad at them because they're interested in seeing your story. It feels like anti-honesty. And I'm not saying a lie. I've said, like, it, it, it's like, I'm being so <laughs> fucking brutally honest here. And it's like, no, yeah, no. Nah. People say this all the time. It's boring. <laughs> it, it, that specific moment didn't bother me because what when I when that moment happened, I was thinking this was like, oh, this is more like the first movie. You know, because we we had just seen him in front of the crowd and like being really thrilled at everyone being there for him. And this felt like almost like a little remainder from the first movie where he's like, where he's more that character still. Like, I was mainly referencing that... the experience of the film, not necessarily this individual woman, but Karen. Yeah, no, I, I, I get that. I'm just saying like there, there there's like a, what I was getting to is that there's a chunk in the middle here where... He like gets his mojo back, for lack of a better way of saying it. That feels like, oh, finally we've gotten yeah. closer to where he was at the end of the first movie, and that's sort of where it was. I was most hooked again because I'm like, okay, cool, we're finally back here. Yeah, I don't know why. Happening. After uh, this yeah, is the guy I remember. Having spoken to a couple of different people when it was first coming out, the the consensus was this was the most entertaining the film got. Uh, some of the sequences yeah. here, especially one we got coming up that I think everybody would consider the best scene. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, I don't know why we regressed him a bit, but I'm glad we're back. And then, oof. And then we fucking took an thing. hour of our time, Cap. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Give it back. It's not yours. <laughs> <laughs> um... So, uh, yeah, I mean, because it, it, sort of in continuing with that, like, Arthur comes in and he's gleefully greeting his fans um, as, as he steps into the courtroom. Uh, but then he's just sort of looking to see, he's like, oh, is, is Lee there? But but she's not. Oh. Uh, and then you get the judge basically saying, like, all right, I know there's, like, a media circus, but you all need to chill out. Like, this is going to be an orderly trial, all right? So, you know, shut up. Um, yeah, and if only he actually did that. No, I know he doesn't really. Inf he doesn't do a great job. Oh, he's terrible. <laughs> Actually, yeah. he's such a bizarre horrible. character. Yeah, they're they're having their cake uh, and eating it too. Yeah. They're like, see, we've got a reasonable, straight laced judge who's going to treat this properly, and then he just doesn't. <laughs> like, he lets no, so many talk, insane no things action. happen. Why would he have allowed exactly. him to dress up as Joker? Why? Yeah. Well, because technically he said, oh, I looked through the rules. And yeah, but he, yeah. he seems to have the final decision on it. Surely you'd have, even if there is precedent, Listen. you'd be like, this is unique circumstances and this will, we know, we already know this guy riled up the whole fucking city to riot. Why would we let him dress up as the fucking Joker and then represent himself? Represent himself I can buy, not dressing up as the Joker. I was like, nah, I don't think he would fucking do that. Impressive. There's no rule that says the dog can't play basketball. All right. True. <laughs> we need to end this right this discriminatory racism Listen, against canines was... and in sports. Okay. <laughs> there was no rule that prevented Catwoman from playing basketball. And we still <laughs> that happens. <laughs> oh no. Um, well, the the face yeah. paint and the mask of Joker is just it's it's at this point it's been so it's been two years. It has become a symbol of rioting and reb like yeah. rebelling and everything terrible. And the last time this guy wore that fucking sorry makeup is when he committed the freaking murder on a live TV. So, I mean, and to allow him to do that same thing on in the court 
They should have um, is... they should have had a judge character who, on the surface, kind of comes across that way. But we maybe get one scene to let us know this is a judge being like, "I'm going to make my fucking career with this. This will be the biggest case of the year. I'm of course going to let a couple of things slide because this will, you know." It'll be famous. It'll be all over the TVs. Everyone will talk about this forever. So, like, the implication being is like, I need order in my courtroom. And then he's like, hey, yeah, dress up as a joker, do it. Mm. Well, remember, that was uh, kind of an element of um, the the People vs. O.J. Simpson show. You remember? Mola? Yes. Kind they... of like, you know, sort of speculation on whether the judge was, uh, like, how much he was going to try to calm down the sort of media circus surrounding it or whether mm -hmm. or not he was more Play chill with it. it. That is like an angle. Yeah. But no, this guy's just, he is meant to be like the straight laced, you know, this is going to be an orderly proceeding, but so many things happen that are just so clearly not orderly at all. It's just craziness. Um, Lee, Lee is outside and she, she sings about that's entertainment and then she goes inside. Does anybody have anything it's another, to say about Another great that? example of, uh, yep, okay, oh, mm -hmm. nods, like, uh, yep, all right, that's happened. Yep. That was time. Now it's time that's gone forever. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, so the, uh, there's a doctor, Dr. Liu, who's, uh, who's being called up by the prosecution who is testifying that in his view, there is no evidence that Arthur suffers from multiple personality disorder or that the Joker is a personality disassociated with himself. He believes that he was sane when he committed his crimes, and that he fakes his mental illness. Um, and, and then uh, uh, Marianne, his lawyer, retorts that he only spoke to him for about 90 minutes and was in no position to draw any real conclusions about Arthur's psyche. And so uh, 90 minutes? That this... That's a decent amount of time, actually. It... It is a decent amount of time, to be fair, but I suppose my broader observation is, like, we're spending a lot of time on a debate that's pointless. Yes. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a pointless debate. And I, I think this we film know... actually kills it, its own, like, argument for these sections by having one that people like, and it's because it's all about character. It's not about, so, is he multiple personality bad? Is he, is Joker real? Is <laughs> we're all just saying, like, shut up! I want to talk yeah, more about, like, like, things that... Ugh. We have to spend. I saw an the hour first forth. movie. I know the answer. Yeah, because Arthur's not really in a position to do anything while this is happening either. He's just sort of sitting there, looking around and looking. It's like, oh, look, there's Lee. Oh, hello. While this this whole debate that's pointless is happening so, and taking up minutes of time. Uh, I really don't like this, but I think the idea is to recount all of the events of the first film, to rebuild, to re-experience, and to reignite the Joker. That's what happens, right? I guess so. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's gradually but like, sort of happening. Doesn't that tell yeah. you just how much of this film was a bad idea? It's like, what do you mean? We're gonna we're gonna recall all the events to make him experience it's the meta. same thing he felt in the first one to get him I'll back to being the Joker. To, uh, to spin those events in a way that we can recontextualize so that this story can make its point. Yes, that's that's how this film feels as well in a meta sense that it retells the first one but changes the ending. It's like he released a director's cut. <laughs> And then, so should. these stories, like the only thing that they offer is like, well, I guess that would be the defense's position and that would be their strategy, but we're not learning anything new. And I don't think the, the movie does a very good job at all making compelling courtroom arguments. You know what I mean? Like there, okay. there are worse examples as we go on, but this is one of the worst courtroom dramas I've ever seen. It's <laughs> awful. You know, totally. and I really, I really like courtroom dramas when they're mm. good, you know? I, I find, you know, the way lawyers make arguments in court very interesting. And what this was... has basically nothing of value in that regard. Bring you, what was the one we watched that was, like, amazing? Uh, oh, The Verdict. Yeah, that film's really good. The Verdict is excellent. That's a great film. Uh, That's a really good film. Courtroom drama I fully recommend. The Verdict. Okay. Anyway. A few, a few Good Men uh, is also awesome, yeah. <laughs> A few good men is really, really. You can't handle the truth. It's iconic for a good reason. <laughs> and then I immediately think of the Simpsons reference. I shouldn't have said it. I'm sorry, but it's true. <laughs> Look, you're right. The Simpsons has a reference for everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So, uh, uh, when um when uh Marianne starts talking about Arthur's childhood trauma, he's like pretty visibly distraught about it. Uh, and so he starts drawing Joker in his notepad while Marianne is arguing that Arthur retreated into his Joker persona when he was attacked on the subway. And we get a few flash, you know, sort of frames of, of, uh, of, of that event. 
And I'm still thinking there, it's like, what are we, what's, what, what, what are we, what are we meant to, what are you, what are you getting out of here, Todd? Like, that, that as she's making the case that he retreats into the Joker persona to, to, like, get away from these horrible incidents, he is actually just sort of sitting there zoning out, drawing Joker in his notepad. But the film says no to all of this speculation. Yeah, no, I, I know, that's it's the so, thing. It's, this is like, I can't even entertain like talking Arthur about it. Hyatt. Because the person, at least what we said before, right? Like yeah. everyone's sitting there with an interpretation, or at least a, a handful of different ones. Someone bursts into the room and says, "It's this thing," and everyone goes, "No, it's not." And then that guy says, "No, it's not," and leaves the it room. This thing, and let me let me talk about. He doesn't leave the room. He's like, "Let's let's spend two hours talking about my <laughs> interpretation." Well, yeah, he says, "No, it's <laughs> not," and then says, "It is this other thing," and then everyone's like, "No, it's not that one either." Yeah. But then he locks Just... the doors and he's like, hey, let me <laughs> let me explain it to you <laughs> here, nice and slow. <laughs> and it's not even Todd interested Phillips... in... Go ahead. Uh, I'm going to say, Todd Phillips is so incompetent at understanding uh, human psyche. And I'm not even a professional, but it's it's bizarre the way the way he presents it as like... He's just so full of himself and it comes across so much during all these speculations because this is not a light subject to speculate on so openly and then discard it and then re then replace it with something else that fits your narrative better for the no, character. Yeah. Completely it's, agree. It's, uh, uh, he like insulting. reformats his mental illness into something else he, like yes. he, he, and he's playing around with it a lot in this movie because as we just mentioned puts a lot of lines of dialogue a lot of characters beliefs into a particular place and then just says all of that is nonsense like why did you do all of that yes. what's the point of that why are you because the first one quite bold in the sense that a lot of people said like what is this going to do for uh people who think about mental illness and and you know like very serious conversations this one's more of a what the hell are you doing uh, to the point where it's like he's mm -hmm. the joker He's fucking around. <laughs> like, he doesn't know what he's doing. Because he's not even, to, uh, you know, going off what you just said, he's not even interested in answering certain questions that you might think would evolve from this premise. Mm -hmm. He's not interested in the question of what it actually means to punish some. Like, can you actually be so mentally ill that you're not considered responsible or you don't, you shouldn't go to prison? You know, none of those questions. They're like, what does it mean to. How do you achieve justice with someone who is like severely mentally ill who did something horrible? Like he's not interested in any of those questions ultimately. And it's like so yeah, why is he filling them up? He's an no, like is it, he's yeah. he is so distracted by the question of was it Arthur? Was it the Joker? Was it both of them under the same person? Was it neither of them? Is the Joker real? Is Arthur real? And you're sitting there like, what the fuck are you doing? Am I real? Am I yeah. Real? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Too meta, man. Mm. Uh, the next day, or uh, it might have even been a couple of days later in, in the trial, uh, his social worker, you remember from the first film, she's, yes. uh, she's on the stand and she, she's reading his journal entries about uh, Sophie um, that was written on the same day that he, uh, that he killed Randall and Murray. Um, and Arthur, Arthur gets a bit, he's like, oh, you know, these weren't meant to be read out loud. He just grabs a microphone and says that. And then the judge is like, hey, shut the fuck up. Um... And uh, basically, the, the, the question uh, asked and answered is um, that the journal reads as though it was written by Arthur, not a distinctive Joker personality, before she then proceeds to say that his jokes aren't funny. Yeah, that felt weird. Mm. <laughs> it's yeah, like the low IQ bit. comment from the interviewer. <laughs> a little bit, yeah. It's, just like, oh, <laughs> it's like, oh, that's kind of a... You're, that, you're, oddly, that's just a jerky oddly, thing like, to say. Needlessly just bringing that up. There's no point. Well, uh, There's nothing. Uh, to yeah. Like we can be, strange. we can be more straightforward about it. It felt to me like it was put in just to have him go. Mm, I don't like that. Oh, yeah, ouchies. To get, to get yeah. Brain hoodie his, his ego is being wounded. See, that's his ego. Yes, Jung. Anyway, yes. Yeah. Like, it's like you could have been know, a bit. <laughs> Why wouldn't you present it as like it was uh, it was known that he was a failed comedian or something like that instead of saying his jokes aren't funny? <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay. Yeah. I mean, she's also meant to be a professional therapy lady. Yeah. And she is in a court in front of a mass murderer. It's just so out of character for her to ever make such a... No, it, it, yeah, I agree. It doesn't match the the woman from the first film, who 
tried to like level with him about how people like them are screwed over by this system. And this court is trying to decide just how much of what happened to Arthur in his early childhood, which he has now got like full awareness of, had an implication on, on how and why he did what he did. And she's just so, like, just blood does it to say he wrote unfunny jokes. Okay. I feel like it would be more appropriate for her to talk about, like, see, this is what happens when you shut down public services. Stuff like this is what She would what take happens. that chance, and, yeah. Yeah, oh, she, I feel sure. like that would be something she'd say now that she's in this, you know, the spotlight, yeah. so to speak. And in the first yeah, one, she basically mentioned... said, like, point blank, like, that I don't give a fuck don't give about, a shit you, about us, Arthur, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's so terrible that the, this movie completely discards that notion because it's such a such an important message to get across and it, it doesn't give a single It was another single F. small element of the boldness of the previous film building up to just, I think, being a bold film in general. The fact that he's like angry at her in a very normal protagonist way and then she says they don't give a shit about us. Even though she's the, you know, the professional social worker in that scenario because you're like, oh shit, that's how much this, uh, mm -hmm. things are crumbling. Like she's leveling with him at that really level, level with him, yeah. yeah, and trying to bring him out of his own sort of like, like inward looking self pity and everything. Like, no, it's not just you. You know what I mean? It's not. It isn't it? Isn't the world against you? There's a lot of us that feel mm. this way in a sense. The it's, movie's just not interested in in a lot of these questions. It's not it, like you could have someone like Harvey Dent who is really intent on for you know for the sake of winning the case not having people sympathize with him so much because he's interested in like he, for him it could be like that's sort of irrelevant whether he was born or made what he did is horrible and he needs to be you know punished for it you know we could explore some of these questions with different characters who have different views on what justice is and how I, that um... relates I wouldn't have done it myself, but you could have begun the film with the beginning of the trial. And these questions could have been explored thoroughly if you wanted to make that film. Um, again, we, we could talk forever about which film we would have made if we were forced to make a sequel. Uh, but yeah, because I, I, com I completely agree. A lot of the much more interesting questions that haven't yet been addressed by the first film in regards to all of the broad things that are happening maybe get played with at best... But most of this is just having characters come on stage, say things that would annoy Arthur, and then he breaks out into his uh, I am I am the Joker again. They joke at me. Here I go Joker in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm juking! Which, uh... <laughs> It's weird. It is so weird to like sort of realize how much time you've spent just getting back to where you thought you were at the beginning, but you weren't. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, as we mentioned, just have the, 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 having all that take place in either cell blocks or the courtroom. And you're like, man, we're, yes. we're through a lot of this. And this, it's almost like not even a filler episode of TV, more so a, um, some guy telling you about what happened between scenes, especially with mm -hmm. how, uh, undone and redone things are. It, it's really a strange fucking movie, honestly. Yeah, the amount of ways strange. you can be critical of it. It's one that you can, like, when I walked away from watching it um it, it did leave me with that kind of like weird kind of empty feeling mm. whereas mm. the first joker is like oh i know what they're trying to say it was executed so well uh it was so you know well crafted this one just felt it felt it feels like a weird empty movie like one of those zero zero calorie kinds of movies but it tastes mm -hmm. terrible you mm -hmm. know the first one like... had go yeah. ahead no 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 go um, the first film had a lot to say about important topics, like societal, you know, issues. It felt mm -hmm. like uh, we could kind of learn from it. It had an earnest message about society and how we treat each other and the role of, you know, uh, the role of normal people in one another's lives and what we can do to kind of, you know, help to fight against mental illness and mm -hmm. depression and those little things that we all have to deal with. It was a very personal uh, and relatable. Even if you're like a normal, well-adjusted person, it's still very personal and relatable because we all have the sads yeah. and we all have, you know, those rough patches in our life. And that's what makes it doubly strange that this movie doesn't have anything to do with that. It doesn't have anything to say it's very that's bizarre. like meaningful. Um, you didn't take the opportunity like you did with the first Joker to make that relatable, interesting 
you know, quasi timeless sort of message about the human experience and how we treat each other. Mm -hmm. I almost wish that Todd really like continued the tradition or the legacy of the first movie with sort of paying homage to um, sort of uh, films and stories that came before because now I wrote this down um, in my whatever <laughs> script and that I do think that from the first Joker I get a sense that he is a t type of director that operates the best under some kind of pre-existing prompt and uh, I do think that this completely misses the mark because he really didn't know what kind of what he was trying to say or what kind of story he wanted to tell he just knew that he wanted he needed to make a Joker sequel and he was high on the sort of uh, the reception of the first movie. And I, I'm guessing you ki kind of get an ego from that sort of like, I really can't go wrong with my characters or my, you know, story progression. And I mean, to me, this movie seems like an execution of that. It definitely would have given him a sense that he can't really fuck this up because mm -hmm. people especially the context of the first film being the the funny comedy guy is going to try and make a serious film okay and then it did mm -hmm. as well as it did got a lot of respect and from now, a lot of people what kind of movies is he going to be making well uh a lot of the respect he gained back on the Warner Brothers lot. got fucking it's like he staked himself <laughs> in the heart with this one uh with how people talk about him now yeah. Well, he's making fun of him, right? The news that he was sitting, that he went like to, where was he when the film came out? Wasn't it like he went to some cabin ranch or, or something? whatever? Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the bunker. <laughs> he went to his. Bunker. I suppose yeah, what's funny about that is like he's not going to help you. Like you're going to get that avalanche of information one way or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, such a such an interesting position to be in because like there are so many kinds of stories you hear, like George Lucas like completely dreading the the premiere of Star Wars and then you know it's, it's so interesting how different directors deal with different kinds of stories different kinds of movies and their outlook is always interesting to hear before it premieres and before they get the initial reception I'm looking forward to the days where we do colonize Mars successfully and so people can actually say, like, I'm just going to go to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to deal with this anymore. <laughs> I'm going to Mars. I'm going to climb yeah. a mountain, get up and on the, that mountain. Speaking of which, um, uh, D D Lee said they're going to build a mountain. She, she reprimands uh, Marianne, that saying that everybody wants to see the joker that felt odd by the way did they have a relationship at all <laughs> those two have they spoken uh, to each other before the first time, this was the first time that they had had a conversation i was just like okay this is happening i guess yeah i, I don't know that, I, like i mean it, it's it's pretty funny because like lee is just being like very uh plain saying like uh, well she doesn't say it but she basically implies everybody wants to see the joker not that loser arthur and it's like, man, imagine if, uh, <laughs> you know, imagine if yeah. Martha sort of was aware, especially considering all the journalists that are surrounding her. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I feel that's basically it. She just says that, and that they're going to build a mountain out of a little hill. It's like, yep, that's the song, and mountains and molehills. Yep, all right, um, cool. So, uh, which then uh, brings us to the next scene where uh, Arthur's sitting in his his cell, uh, like in the court. And um, Marianne's basically saying that, like, Lee lied about every facet of her life, that mm. she lives on the Upper East Side um, with her parents, one of whom is a doctor, and she voluntarily checked into and out of Arkham, uh, and also mentions that she went to grad school for psychiatry, um, and basically says, she's playing you for a fool, but Arthur's, Arthur's kind of just like, you know, it's just like, oh, uh, yeah, whatever. And then he imagines, and then he goes into his head again, and he imagines them on their own talk show. It's like, oh, okay. Another, yep, we're doing another one. Look, it's the Joker and Harley show, which, I don't know. Yeah, all right. I suppose what's, what's funny is that this is actually, like, the most important one. Um, this is the most important, like, sort of imaginary dance and song flashback sequence because this is the one that is tethered directly to the ending of the film. 
Um, I mean, yeah, basically... because it has that it has that turn where she pulls a gun on him. So it's that's right. The mo- it's the most for establishing that, like, oh, maybe this perfect, you know, romance we have isn't perfect. That something's going to go wrong and all that. Well, yeah, because um, they're, I... they're singing, and then yeah, I think that's possibly like the more obvious read while like i said earlier i think that the point is supposed to be that she is going to be the death of him not in this conventional way that she will kill him or that their relationship will kill each other or anything just that by meeting her she gasses him up and then he has to realize that he's not that 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 is not the way he wants to go and by doing so gets him killed like so she in a way is the reason he died yeah i i think um, because in in this particular scene, it really just seems like it's the surface level read. You know what I mean? Just oh that, sure, like, but oh, I don't know if I can trust her. By the end, they they recycle like the the moment in this scene with uh, him dying and the getting shanked, right? Yeah, I, I, oh, right. I guess yeah, I get yeah. what you mean when you when, when you say that, Cap. I, I suppose it's still almost like bridge the gap, but it would be like this. Now you could read it simply being like maybe like she's actually deliberately sabotaging him to fuck him over. You know, like the nature of how she's going to wrong him might be a bit unclear, but then when it get recontextualized, it brings it around to like what Moller is saying, the idea that she will be the death of him. Um yeah. I mean I mean, I suppose it's you know, it's it's bearing in mind some of the things that they say to each other because um they're singing, uh, and then Arthur stops singing before Lee does. Um, and he's like, oh, you're making it all about yourself when it's meant to be about me and, and how I'm great. And then Lee says, let's give the people what they want, and then shoots him. And it's like, ah, right, okay, yeah, see, let's give the people what they want. Here you go. This, I mean, this is incredibly matter, right, of, like, the people is the audience. You know, give them what they want, and, well, and, and I guess the like, what you want will destroy them, so fuck you or something. It's like, what do you, what? I can't <laughs> resist the read that, you? um, it's like the making it about like again if she is the audience which i do believe this film is trying to push on us absolutely the audience is making it about themselves instead of understanding this is a story about a broken man who needs help they're instead seeing how they fit into the story how they're inspired slash they've lived a life that's similar and what they think the joker could represent and how he could unite blah 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 it's like no that's not what this is the joke is not real it's it's about Arthur, the poor man who was broken down by a poor system and he made mistakes and he needs it. You know, that, that sort of thing. And then give them what they want, which is Joker, and that's going to require killing Arthur. we got to get rid of him. Which it's is like, just so okay, miserable, yeah. dude. Okay. It's such yeah. a fucking miserable message. <laughs> it's, yeah. uh, it's pretty nihilistic, isn't it? Yes. It's, I don't uh, often uh, like to pull that card on any film. I feel like people use it a little <laughs> too flippantly sometimes, but I really oh, probably God. would apply it to this one. Yeah, maybe you should have thought of that before you liked the Joker movie. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I guess it's, you know, something that we can keep talking about as a thing, right? But, like, there's kind of, like, a fine line that you walk in terms of, like, challenging, essentially, the audience's expectations to get something out of the the, um, the art that they're consuming. I don't know why it's coming to mind, but, um, how many many of us here have played Spec Ops The Line? How familiar is that? I only know of it. I haven't played it. Well, you played it, right? Oh, wait, sorry, what did you, you asking if I played Spec Ops The Line? Yes. Yeah. So, um, I guess without giving too much away, because if you haven't played it, it's a game I would recommend. Spec Ops The Line is a game that essentially challenges um, the default assumption of players in terms of, like, engaging with, essentially, like, first-person, like, first-person or third-person, like, military shooters. It's sort of like, it starts to challenge a lot of your assumptions about the things that you ought to be doing in the game questions about whether or not you should be continuing with something if it's not like meeting your expectations of what you expected or whether there's something wrong with your expectations that you that you brought into the experience that you're um that the experience that's presented before you it sort of challenges the idea of like players paying attention to what they're being asked to do or the context for why they're doing any of the things that they're doing and whether it should be reaching a point where you should be questioning whether or not you should even be continuing with the experience. So these sorts of things. It's, yeah. it's very much a case. Of, it's very meta. It is a very meta video game. Even the uh, even the the loading screens break the fourth wall um, and start to and start to become more confronting and challenging as the game progresses. But obviously, the reason why I'm bringing it up is because. When you can do it really well, when you can start to mess around with and challenge like people's expectations and 
um, interest when it comes to engaging with media. You can get some really like interesting, fascinating. Um, you can you can evoke some really fascinating reactions from uh from the player or the viewer. Um, in this case though, one of the big problems that it has is that it's it's trying to assign something to the audience that for many people is just not going to be applicable. That being their interpretation of what it is that they found interesting or fascinating or compelling in the first film and their interest in seeing that story continued in a sequel. Like, if there's a mismatch, you can get some really bad results, as I think is the case with this yeah. film. There is a mismatch between what Todd Phillips has taken to be people's interactions with expectations of and desires when engaging with this story um, and, and what people actually took away from it. Um, so, so then when it's like, ah, oh, see, like you're, you know, fuck you, huh? For what, for wanting this, this is what you get. You get what you fucking deserve or something. It's like, what are you talking about? Like, it's, you've, you've got a different understanding of the first film. I don't know. It's just like, it, like, it just sort of comes across as like, oh, okay, Jesus, calm down. Something like that. There's a scale for this, mm -hmm. but like, there's a little trophy shelf for the best examples of like films that I think manage to and this is this is tough intertwine the experience of watching it and the medium of watching it like the, the actual format as part of the storytelling um the games i would pick soma has been one of the greatest examples of using the fact that you're playing a game to help tell its story you have um mm -hmm. something like sicario that is using your experience as a first-time viewer to help you understand the journey of a character who's experiencing similar things but in a different context it's like very important that you understand how she feels and thus you can as being a viewer of a film for the first time who's not understanding the situation. There's, there's a couple of examples. Spec Ops Alliance is another uh, example of trying to use this. And I think when it's at its best and its maximum, it's like uh, uh, kind of amazing, like master level work of just, wow, you managed to incorporate the experience of watching the thing as part of the storytelling. If you fuck it up though, I think it can, I, I think this might be the best example of that. Where it's like desynced entirely and it's actually just actively needling and pissing off the audience constantly. It's like your Yeah. You know, this this constant reference and idea of of like how you feel about this story, I'm addressing it in real time. Even in the scenes as they go by through a character, like how you feel about this, I'm aware of it. And I'm doing and you're just sitting there like, I know what you're doing. What Stop <laughs> it. It's like, I know what you're doing. What the fuck are you even talking about? Shut yeah. up. It feels That's jabby so and funny. preachy and Kind of like, like you're upset. Well, I like enjoyed you're not, your last you're not movie. Whatever you think you are, like everybody knows exactly what you're doing, and it doesn't. It doesn't like evoke or prompt any inward reflection. It's just kind of like, yeah, no, I know, I know what you're doing, but like, but like, it it, it begins with a total mismatch of uh, understanding of what happened in the first film, and the reality is that you're the one who has forgotten what happened. You're the one who's contradicting what happened. Um, not the audience, at least not, I, I don't know, I mean, obviously you can't speak for everybody in terms of their reaction, but, like, it really does just begin with th this, this, um, this, like, disconnect and, and contradiction of what, the events that actually took place in the first film. Not the meta surrounding it or all of the conversations and the cringe, what happened in that film, what you clearly intended for that film to be about when you made it. Kind of like, um, I said, someone mentioned it in chat, right? The Last of Us 2 feels kind of almost somewhat uh, adjacent yeah. to the thing, you know what I mean? Of like a, yeah. man, what you if just Joel was shit, actually? What? It's like, oh yeah, remember when Joel did that evil thing at the end of the first game? And it's like, what? No, <laughs> what I don't. No one does. <laughs> yeah, no, yes, it was. It was very evil and he deserves to die. <laughs> What's up? No. It's like, oh, okay. Okay, uh, all right. Thanks. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, so you know, um, we get we get pretty close to one of the the more like baffling scenes in the film, honestly. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, the in Arkham, you know, Arthur's sitting on the bleachers. Uh, Jackie gets up and's like, "Hey, you got a visitor," but and the other guy's like, "Get off our seats!" And then Arthur imitates like shooting both of them, like you know, like finger, like pew pew, um, and then mm -hmm. he just leaves. I don't know if anybody has anything they want to. This, uh, I guess his, his yeah, his friends there with him alongside him. I he just needs yeah, to be around he, in some scenes. Yeah, Ricky, yeah. he's just there again. You know, I don't. I wonder know when he's gonna die. <laughs> like that's <laughs> I just like I was waiting for it in the movie. Um, yeah. but I was like, oh, he's here again. Hmm. I wonder what their um, relationship is. Wow. I, 
Yeah. I don't quite understand <laughs> his antagonistic relationship with the guards that's developing here. Obviously, it's going to get worse. But, like, you know, earlier he had a, a... Before the movie starts, he has a pretty good relationship with the guards because he tells them jokes and they like him. And now that he's got his... Then, then he gets depressed for reasons that aren't entirely clear. I guess it was just the medication. Now that he has his mojo back, he's, like, being a bit more antagonistic with the guards. I don't really know why. I think it is Maybe. just the idea that he's becoming more like Joker, and that's what that means, that he's just, <laughs> like, antagonistic to everybody. But doesn't Even he though have the a Joker relationship is... with the guards, you know, following on from the events of the first movie? Are they trying to say, like, the more confident he gets, the more cocksure he gets? Like, he can't manage his his personality when he gets confident or happy? Which is really odd, considering that he's about to have a conversation with Lee about how she's lied to him about everything. So, yeah. you know what I mean? It's almost weird yeah. that he would be, like, particularly upbeat or optimistic. Compared to in the first film, where the highs and lows make a lot more sense, there is a portion of the film where it seems like he's starting to get into sort of a swing of things that's more positive, but then, you know, terrible thing happens, and then that creates, like, a new slump, and it, and it declines from there, mm -hmm. you know? It's very to strange. Me... I just, like, go ahead. Yeah. I was just gonna say that we're, we're starting an arc here where he falls out of favor with the guards and starts antagonizing more and then things get worse and worse ultimately leading to a scene that people in the chat have been dying for us to talk about. Um, <laughs> and I just don't know if it makes a lot of sense to me, the falling out that they have and the way it progresses. It seems and to, to me the guards start here. just come across as very, very one-dimensional. They're just there to, you know, do evil stuff when they need to do evil stuff. And that's the extent of their characterization. It's really, well, it's, it's really bugging me. Between now and that scene, right? That scene. Yeah. There's only like one or two more interactions between then and now. Uh, between then and, mm -hmm. and, and this point in the film. So, yeah. Um... It almost just seems like, oh, well, you need a seed that you need a scene that uh, plants the seeds, sows the seeds of of that conflict, and so this is one of them. Mm -hmm. I'm just Arthur being a little bit more antagonistic towards them. I don't know um, why. Also, they they don't really respond the way I would expect them to. Of almost being like, in that what the scene, fuck was that? Like, why is in the scene where that? he's like going pew pew, shooting him with the finger guns, and like taking a while to get out of the seat after being told to. You know what I mean? Yeah. You think they and, and, clock that behavior as like that's not normal? Yes. What's going on? I mean, he he mm -hmm. reacted pretty stridently when he touched him earlier, yeah. and so now he's like deliberately disobeying him and like finger gun acting like he's gonna kill them when he's killed people. You know, I they they're sort of nonplussed about it. It's strange. Yeah, I think I agree. Um. So Lee, uh, Arthur as a visitor, it's Lee. Um. And I mean, obviously, it's challenging, challenging her on on the lies, and she pretty casually just admits that she was lying just because she wanted uh, Arthur to like her. Um, yeah. Like she's pretty brazen; like she's not even really like trying to hide it at all. Um, <sighs> and then she she says that she cares about Arthur, unlike his lawyer, um, and that she's moved into his apartment building so that they can make a home together when he <laughs> when when he gets out. To which she points out, like, I don't want to live there. <laughs> it's a shitty apartment and it's full of terrible memories. You watch the TV yes, movie, it's yeah. not a good place. <laughs> right. so she wants to be there. This she is wants the apartment to where Arthur Fleck yeah. was evil. No, but you see, he should have noticed because he doesn't care about her. Uh, she doesn't care about him. She cares yeah. about the um, the fantasy. The She's the audience. She's doing the stairs in the apartment ah! wearing the makeup. Yeah. Oh. And then, um, <laughs> well, yeah, because that. And then she says that she's pregnant, um, and that with Arthur's child before singing close to you. And it's like, oh, okay. All right. Like yeah. she just starts singing and kind of dancing in like the 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 sort of the meeting room, the visitor room. And it's um I don't know, it's just like and then of course it's like, why is this one why is this one real and not imagined? Why is this a real musical number that's happening mm -hmm. in the real world and not not in his head what what is the reason for any of them being imaginary or not i'm gonna keep saying it because i i really i just don't see the the reason behind it yeah 
and, and they aren't treated the, uh, like an okay. escape. They're treated as like actual random kind of daydreams and just whatever he's thinking. But yeah, I mean, I I feel like you're right. We just don't we don't get the chance to take advantage of the whole dream sequence stuff. Mm -hmm. What I'm also curious about Lee uh, is that she does she have some kind of like. Does her surgeon father sort of uh, help her out in cer certain situations? Because, like, in the beginning of the movie, she very obviously, and I think it was it was obvious to everyone, uh, that she tried to break out a pretty dangerous prisoner, but she got no consequences for it. Then, you know, she keeps doing these deranged criminal, borderline criminal stuff, and nothing for her um and she's still free to roam around which is so bizarre to me and the only way it could be explained is that someone is taking care of her but the movie never confirms that or never even you know alludes to that so sort of vaguely rely on the whole like well yeah but she's wealthy so you know she's not like getting seriously like re yeah. serious repercussions for the, any of the things but but I mean, she she like That's nearly burnt down writing. Arkham. Yeah, I mean, it's just sloppy writing. It's kind of the thing about this film. It has more instances, even putting to one side the just massive disconnect in terms of the um, intentions and and themes. It's like, yeah, th there's just like more sloppy writing. Thing things just like make less yeah. sense. There's this one feels like it. Like, mm. This one feels like it accidentally broaches a topic that was very clearly part of the first movie, which is like the classism that was in the city. And I don't even mm -hmm. think that this film meant to do that intentionally. It just sort of, like, I guess you could interpret this as maybe being that thing in this movie. Yeah. But it's not. <laughs> then you get the uh, the iconic trailer shot, which is a good shot, all right? God damn it. Where, yeah, um, there are good shots in the movie. The movie's got the, good uh, shots. The smile on the glass, and then Arthur turns, and he smiles, and he's smiling with the... The, the smile that was drawn on the glass. It's a good shot. Yep. And then he dances in his cell for a bit <laughs> before he goes into court. <laughs> uh, which then brings us to... It's uh, Sophie. She's uh, she, she's testifying on the stand. To be and clear, I, I feel all, like in this case, all these elements yeah. seem to be a laborious like redoing of getting him back to Joker mode. Like, all of them. Mm -hmm. when Everything she dead, says to him, to that little shot then him doing the joker dance while smoking and then this sequence with her and then the big musical number like all of it feels like i've got to justify getting him back into joker mode while we're all sitting here like, like you did that to yourself that. yeah you reset him dude you have done that yourself obi-wan would um, not like this movie i suppose for for this part i feel like it's worth because just of harley some... quinn <laughs> this part, I, I figure it's just worthwhile to almost just, like, run through all of the things that she says, just to sort of get them all lined up. So, um, she basically explains that after what Arthur did, her life became difficult because of the media circus uh, surrounding him. And then she goes on to say that uh, his mother, Penny, thought that he was a loser. Uh, that she said that there was something wrong with Arthur, and that he lived in a fantasy world, and he had a dumb laugh. Uh, Penny made up a story about the laugh so that he would feel better and wouldn't kill himself. The story was that he was put on Earth to bring joy, and she couldn't believe he based his whole life around this fictional story. Uh, she thought it was ridiculous that Arthur seriously believed he could become a comedian when he wasn't funny at all. And while all of this is being said, Arthur is getting big mad <laughs> as all yeah. of these things are being said. And he's just kind of like, holy shit, it's just like bombarding about how much his mom thought he sucked. Like, just like all at once. I just, it's just a worse version of the first film. When we, yeah, I, I love the 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 relationship they have with him and his mum in the first film. It's much more, dare I say, realistic in terms of the the pieces of torment we see and what we can assume it was at its worst. But just you know, for example, he's talking about his life goals while taking care of her, and then she he, she says like, "Don't you have to be funny to be a comedian?" And it's such a like, mm -hmm. you know, yes. like. Thanks, yeah, it, it just feels much more real, um, as opposed to, she thought he was an idiot that wasn't yeah, funny and exactly. told him. Especially with the neighbor about how he's a loser, and he, she couldn't believe well, like, that he believed the story that he was put on Earth to make people smile and laugh. To, to tell a kid from, like, raising them that their job is to make people smile, that's why they're here, and then for him to have pursued 
being a clown as like a job and trying to do stand-up comedy, it just feels really mean-spirited again to be like, what an idiot, he believed me. It's like, exactly. Okay. This feels so mean-spirited. Mm -hmm. As it's zooming in on him getting really mad about all of these things being said, and the music <laughs> is ramping up too. It's just like, what the... Why? Okay. All right. Uh, um, and this, a, this... Yeah? It's such a... Like, such a cop-out writing to this hearsay oh i met her uh mom one time in the elevator and she told me this and yeah. that about there is yeah. like, like what are you such a stupid stupid scene why why are we doing this we gotta get him to joke her out he's gonna joke her here he goes which is, which is <laughs> he's, he's gonna, he's gonna yeah. joke out dr joker okay. and joker and mr fleck <laughs> He sinks into his mind and performs another musical number uh, as the Joker, so in his makeup. And he sings about being a lonely fool while beating the shit out of Harvey Dent and the judge. Um, like, he just, like, I, I mean, I'm not, uh, like, I'm not really sure how to describe it other than, yeah, he's, like, singing. And then he, he doesn't just like the judge and the... <laughs> Dead. And Harvey Dent, he just smashes him with a chair. And then he, and then he beats the judge with a massive mallet. Um, about, and then, like, the... And, this this is uh this wasn't because all of the songs are based on songs that are like they're, they're all based on existing songs right yes yeah because this was like the joker is me or something i think that's uh i mean those are the lyrics anyway how can you have yeah the joker beating a judge with a gavel to death and it mean almost nothing to me <laughs> like, I'm, well I'm... no because it, well the thing is it means nothing because i mean the context is he's just fucking he doesn't like the joke. Sure. Yeah, like, like that that's joke. what I mean by it. You'd be like, what do you yeah. mean it's meaningless? He fucking hates that judge and this he doesn't like this whole scenario. I'm like, yeah, that's what I mean by meaningless. <laughs> like it's, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Like, but, but that's like the obvious that yeah. that on the surface, that's obviously what it means. But normally it's a little really bit more it. clever than that. There's a there's You'd think more. there'd be more. Yeah. 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 But there uh -huh. isn't more, so we can just we can move right on. <laughs> yeah. Also, a bit odd that, that he like takes it out on Harvey and the judge, and not the person who was just humiliating him in the fantasy. That feels so, cowardly to me. Um, actually, beat yeah. that woman. Yeah. yeah. I mean, let's be honest. Her if yeah, this movie lacks that. It's it, it's a very insecure movie. It doesn't want to uh, go one the wrong thing direction. Outlaws had going for it. It fears going uh, in particular directions. So it's like yeah. one thing outlaws had going for it. What that K punches Lady Stormtrooper beating the shit out of women. <laughs> Ninety percent of the Empire are women now. <laughs> Look, their decision, not mine. <laughs> Look, I just punch them, and it they are what they are. I don't know what to tell you, man. I guess uh, something to add is, as as is happening in this scene is that uh, Lee is like she paints a bloody smile on her face and is dancing in the background, like the idea that she's vicariously living through this, which is a little bit weird considering that what's happening in the real world at this point is just someone talking about how Arthur's mom thought he was a fucking loser when <laughs> he's imagining her, like, you know, vicariously, like, having fun while he's imagining losing his shit. Well, it seems a bit like kind of wires crossed sort of thing. The whole um, idea that he's gonna, he, he's like delving into this as like an escape. Like, I don't even want to, they're describing the loser. I want to be the Joker because he's a different yeah. personality and she likes the Joker and I'm powerful as the Joker. I can knock out the judge and save my own life. And then it ends with him shooting himself in the head. Again, I just assume the point of yeah. that being we're on the journey of him. He's going to kill himself as a result of all this, you know, metaphorically. Mm -hmm. I. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I mean, he, he, he shoots himself and then, and then back in the courtroom, he's like, oh, I'm going to represent myself. And the gallery just breaks out into like, into applause. Yeah, you're fired, attorney. Get out of here. Yeah. Let me get a quick you kiss know. real quick before you go. <laughs> yeah, he does that again, which is, it's just like, oh, okay. And by the way, um, we don't, correct me if I'm wrong, we don't see any desperate, passionate attempts from her in the rest of the film to save him. She's just gone. She, she does like an interview mm -hmm. on the like on the radio or on television that plays like during a montage, but that that's it. Like she never shows up again. She doesn't. It just feels so try odd. To do anything? Should have been well, a part of his life for so might long. Even be trying to should be trying to even even if he wants to represent himself, trying to like provide him with advice or anything, but not really. No. Is she just, a public uh, defender or someone who took the case because she's really passionate? The impression about I got was that she would have taken a personal interest in trying to help him. Like she thinks. I, I could be it wrong seems on that. that way, but if, at the same it time, it's well, like, wouldn't maybe... it? 
Wouldn't it be interesting you know, if instead of a public defender, she turned out to be a prestigious lawyer who took a special pity on him for the, the plight of his situation and hearing about what was going on with people in the city. And so she volunteered to, to do this. And it was well, like I mean, a big deal that she now, was staking her reputation on helping him. Now feels like a good time to mention, you know, she's been brought up plenty of times during the discussion, but every time we just sort of glide past because there's nothing to be said for her, really. Which is a big um, problem. She's like kind of a nothing character. Because she is the answer to a lot of what Arthur's complaints are and what of Todd's points are. She's like a contradiction exactly. in the story. She cares about the man. And you'd be like, yeah, she does. But broadly, people don't. It's like, you can't do that. You can't have her get <laughs> sidelined and ignored when she's the one you're saying we all need to be. Like, if you're going to suggest yeah. that uh, it's not even... It's Arthur himself who's, who's advocated several times people need to know the real him. She was the main advocate for that. Now she's gone. And he booed her. He was the one that did it. Yeah, he did it because he was big mad. And I think if if you're supposed to like reverse engineer some meaning there, being like, yeah, it was his mistake to make, I'd just be like, I just don't think I don't think that's the story you're telling at all. Like the you would justify the notion that he is self sabotaging to the point of doing things that are anti to his values. Like why wasn't her name mentioned then in his final speech? You know? Yeah, I, I don't know. Along other mean? names, maybe. But then again, I guess she wasn't advocating for the same thing that he ends up concluding. Because this film is a mess. She was saying that the uh, the he created an alternate self to deal with the trauma while he was arguing, nah, it was just me. Yeah. And then well, it was, well, that could have been something they could have played on. The idea that she it wasn't just a legal defense. She really believed that he was truly innocent and that truly was the actual state of him. Oh, well, that's it. She's oh, well, I guess out. she's, she's just not yeah. a character. All right. Yeah. Bye. Um, bye, lady. Bye, uh, lady. <laughs> Lee visits Arthur and says, "Oh yeah, everybody's gone crazy, and you can do anything you want. You're the Joker." And then, uh, and and then as there uh, is he's getting taken back to Arkham, you've basically just got like that, right? So the the accounting of the events of the day, and then the interview, which is the last thing that, that the lawyer Marianne gets to say of like, "Oh, you know, like nobody cares about Joker, and this is bad." Uh, and as 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 that's happening. Uh, Lee is walking up the Joker stairs, and it's like, oh, all right, yep, those those ever important Joker stairs that everybody knows about, which is pretty funny because if everybody did know about it in universe, you'd think that there'd be more, like you know, that there'd be st like graffiti or, um, or um, especially consider, you, you know what I mean? Like since this is yeah, like yeah, decaying yeah. Arkham, you think <laughs> yeah. that it would be there'd be more evidence of people's awareness of it as an iconic place. I mean, or, or even, like, people visiting, because in the real world, like, people visited the Joker stairs, like, the real yeah. Joker stairs. Um, if you're gonna do movie, the meta thing, why not have, like, show people doing that? The stairs need to be empty for all of the important scenes and conversations that are gonna oh, happen. Oh, right, true. <laughs> Never so, mind. So, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, uh, he gets back into Arkham, all the inmates are praising him, and they all start singing When the Saints Go March Again. As Arthur laughs and all of the guards start losing their shit and, and, and grabbing everybody. So it's like, oh, look, he's causing chaos. Look at him go. Hmm. I mean, I feel like there's nothing to be said. It's just like, yeah, and then the same He likes the in. attention. Yeah. He likes but the, like, that it... he's sowing seeds of chaos, I guess. <laughs> this he enjoys is this. Getting close to what I would have assumed would have happened when he first entered Arkham. Yes. Exactly. That it would be chaotic. Like, what the fuck was all of- why did we spend so long not doing the film until we're now running out of time? Like yeah, half an hour left. Yeah, because at this point, for reference, yeah, that we're, we're, we're getting real close to the end. <laughs> we're well past halfway uh, at this point. The so, thing that um, bothered me about yeah. this scene is that he's clearly the thing that's causing all the chaos, and they just and start just tackling him. everyone else. Mm. <laughs> like, take him out of there. Mm -hmm. No, he needs to be up there and keep laughing. It's more cinematic. Uh, <laughs> shut up. Um, well, on that note, <laughs> when he stands on the yeah. table, the guards are pretty chill with it. When the next guy stands, they're like, hey, you get down from there. And it's like, why wouldn't you have said you that? You're not allowed to stand up. Yeah. Yeah. One person on a table at a time limit in this hospital. <laughs> he was their first. Person, whatever we are. He was their first. Wait until he gets down. Wait for your turn. So, uh, next day in court, Arthur's there in his Joker makeup. Uh, the judge is like, yeah, you can do this because precedent, but take it seriously. A, a warning which he does not enforce very well. <laughs> no. Uh, 
or at all. All right. I'm gonna allow you to dress as a clown, but please don't be silly. Yeah, don't be. And then yeah. like, <laughs> it's just the funny. To say, don't, like, I'm not gonna let this courtroom be turned into a circus. Like, yes, you yeah. are. You're doing. He's it a right clown. Now. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and if, if to prove him correct, um, so Gallery Puddles, he gets called up to the stand. Arthur waves at him. Hey. We we come to remind everybody with, uh, who Gary is. He's yes, the little... he, was, he was the short guy that Arthur, uh, that w was fr friendly and nice to Arthur, and so was spared uh, from his wrath when he killed Randall. Great little element That's of the Gary. first film. And yes. You know, just... That's one of the most brutal scenes. Yeah. It's, but, like, there's so much to draw mm -hmm. from Gary's story in that film as a little, like, almost ray of hope about some of the nature of how we treat each other things and, and the, the things that come out of it and stuff. But... Uh, and I will say, like, I'm not, I'm not even knocking this film. I, I really like what they do with Gary in this. I yes. mean, I think he does a great job as a, as an actor. Um, yeah, he was in uh, uh... Game of Thrones as well for uh, I think two episodes. Mm. Um, I right. haven't seen him in anything else, but I would echo everyone else. Like, well, he's earned himself a chance to be in other things. I think. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I wish, I wish Gary stayed the same and his writing was the same, but he was uh, face to face with. Other kind of Joker. I thought you, I thought you were going to say, I wish he was taller. And I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> oh, no. Um, no. It, it's, no, so, no, no. If, it, if it was relevant to point out in the context of the whole, you're not going to turn this into a circus, Arthur immediately starts doing the stereotypical southern lawyer accent. Yeah, the fucking Futurama yeah. joke. Yeah, he does, yeah, he does the, the, the bird. The, the like... Now look here, mister! <laughs> like, I don't understand, uh, like, it was... Okay. I know, loads of people commented on this as just being an element that was like, why did you do that? This, this, I mean, yeah. I, I'm not gonna say it's like ruining anything, necessarily, but uh, we just got him back to Joker, he has a way of speaking as Joker, and now you're giving him an accent. <laughs> yes, oh, he, briefly, he briefly turns into Vorst doing the, uh, the, the Southern Plantation. Voice. <laughs> I feel like this. <laughs> My Kentucky Fried Chicken is some of the finest in all the style. He just eleven like, herbs and spices. I, like I don't even like. It's just so like. It's like yeah. He actually becomes like the from Futurama. <laughs> the chicken like man. The, or the what's his name? Le... Leghorn. No. The... Funnily enough, that would be relevant to what I'm about to say. The guy from Knives Out. Oh, uh, uh, Benoit, uh, Blanc. Oh. Benoit, Benoit Blanc, yeah. Not LeBlanc, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it I, is... don't, I don't know. It's, you would think that the judge would immediately be like, shut the fuck up, stop doing what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, just <laughs> stop. We know that's not your voice, stop it. You get three strikes or whatever the fuck. But Southerners yeah, just, are not allowed in this courtroom. <laughs> not fake ones. He's he's the stolen valor rags, don't let him have it. Stolen valor. <laughs> it's, this um, scene is like... Oh, yeah, the best of this movie meeting the worst of this movie, and it's just that's a good way of describing it. Hmm. it yeah, and it, it's it's the most engaging because of it because it's so like, what am I watching? Because yeah. you're fascinated by the Gary parts, but you're so like off put and just completely weirded out by the entire Joker thing and the contextualization of it all. So it's a very fascinating sequence, I would say. It's my favorite uh, in the movie. It's uh, it's basically so the the um most of most of what he says is skipped when he's being questioned by Harvey Dent. Uh, but he he basically asks him, "Hey, can you uh can you point out you know who 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 killed Randall?" And he points to you know so he's sitting there on the table. He's got the clown makeup on. He's wearing a red suit. Um, and then that's the end of our Harvey Dent's questions. And yeah, Joker gets up and starts doing his Southern lawyer accents, before asking you, like very direction. Go. Yeah. Sorry, it just it, no, go for it. Okay, Harvey Dent is just now at this point in the trial establishing who killed certain people. That's the first thing you do, and he never de he never denied any of the murders. Like, you know what I mean? Like everything about the legal process here is wrong. Like well, yeah, the whole detail. the whole point that he needs to be striving to achieve at this point is establishing the idea that he had a guilty mind 
that like yeah. he knew exactly what he was yeah. doing and he executed on that. Uh, it's, it's funny you bring it up because I mean to jump ahead a little bit, this is the end of, of Harvey Dent's case. Yep. Yes. Gary is his last witness. He he rests after this. And it's Which like, is oh insane. Is he okay. not the prime witness or one of them? If not I mean he's one yeah. of the I mean, yeah, for Randall, yeah, yeah. absolutely. He's super duper important for that one. Um, but, but yeah, you're right. It's like, oh, I mean, amazing. for something that is a courtroom, but I mean, the reality is like the courtroom stuff only takes up like 30 minutes of the film in terms of like Which, where it starts and where it ends. And it doesn't even comprise most of the, it, it doesn't comprise the majority of that. Which is really time. notable because so many people in their initial reactions were saying we spent so much fucking time in the courtroom. It was mainly a courtroom drama. It's yeah. like, guys, the first, we the spent first so much hour, time in Arkham. Yeah. I, I think people like, such. yeah, because the Arkham portion, that hour plus, is kind of like, you know, it's just like we're, we're back to where mm -hmm. we were by the end of it. So it's like forgotten. And then the the story as we see of new things happening, or at least somewhat new things being progressed, is the courtroom. And then it ends. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like, well, that was a courtroom it movie. It ends pretty close to when it starts to get a little bit more dynamic. But you're right, like, the screen time yeah. total of the courtroom is actually very small as a fraction yeah, of the like film. Yeah, 20 minutes or something, really not that much time. Actually, uh... the funniest... Sorry. No, go, go, go ahead. Um, the funniest experience of mine with this whole courtroom thing is that it's kind of embarrassing. I did, I did hear the name Harvey Dent in the movie, and I was like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> and, um... I learned after watching that, I don't know, maybe I'm like blacked out or what happened, but I completely missed the fact that this other guy was supposed to be Harvey Dent. It just did not register oh as God, that at all. Oh my God, you and you didn't realize. Wow. <laughs> he was Harvey oh, Dent. and um, <laughs> yeah, and I learned after watching the movie that, oh, that was supposed to be Harvey Dent this whole time. So, yeah. I mean, it didn't not... change much, but. It was never going to be, like, set him up as the next fucking Batman villain or anything like that. This this film was always no. going to just be like, well, it's appropriate yeah. he's the DA in the universe, so he's the DA here. It's mm. so Tremendously stupid underutilized. Yeah, well, we didn't, we didn't get much we... from him, even though he actually has more screen time than a lot of characters in this. Yeah. Uh, yep. We didn't get he much is, from him. Just, yeah. Uh, we didn't Go get on. much from him, and like the whole Two Face thing sort of like <laughs> fits the theme. Sort it of it does. Like, you you know, could use it parallels, you and they did nothing it sure. with it. Mm. Well, that, the only thing they did with it is jumping ahead. He gets he gets Two Faced. Oh my <laughs> god! Like, oh, I, when I saw that, I kind of like did giggle. I was just like, "No, I'll shut up." <laughs> like, yeah, all right. There it there is. It's just like. More. It's like if you got a bingo card for the for a Batman movie, you guys like, yep, crossing that one off. He gets yeah, his yep, exactly. there we go. Which is funny <laughs> when people sort of said that of the first film, when I would say it's way more applicable. Well, there's so much meaning yeah, behind <laughs> uh Alfred and, and Bruce and Thomas being in that film. There's so much to say about it, but there's nothing to say about Harvey Dead being here. He's just here. No, yeah. he's just here. He could have been anybody, he could have been someone else, just anybody else. Imagine they just said he's also with uh, Cobblepot, we'd be like Okay. <laughs> he's, nice though. he's Victor Freeze. Like, all right. Sort of like the the main takeaway from a lot of the questions that he's asking Gary is that they're they're kind of like ill formed and directionless. Like it's, it's like he doesn't even know where he wants to go with them. Almost like he's trying to ramp up to the case of like, ah, yeah, see, there's me, and then there's Joker. Um, or you know, alternatively, like, no, that's not even the case. You know, who who even am I? It's it's very uh directionless. Hmm. Um, and Gary yeah. doesn't really know what to do with a lot of the questions. Well, so well, not to say, it's, even... it's the Gary portion of it that is so meaningful. It's not really the Joker side of things. There's something to yeah. say about the Joker side, but it's still very messy. Mm -hmm. But, like, what's even the point? Okay, so if he fires his lawyer because he's given up on the pretending like it wasn't him thing, what is he even doing? What is his defense? Why isn't the trial over? Uh, the sad answer to this, I think, is that that's, that's not what he's thinking about. He's just fucking trolling. No, I mean, I, 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 I suppose, yeah, he's just sort of, I, I don't even, I don't know what he's up to in the scene, but, like, what is he, what is the judge, like, you know what I mean? Like, I, I, how, how do I phrase this? What is his defense now, if the whole point of firing her was because he is getting rid of the defense strategy that he's actually has a split personality disorder? 
Yeah, like, what's his goal here? I don't believe like, we get an explicit one, up? and I think, until he's decided, right? Like, if this whole process is supposed to be Arthur deciding what actually happened in the first film, then we get his conclusion in the end, the closing statement. And so up to this point, he's not even thinking about a defense, or, like I said earlier, the sentencing, literally just, he's going on his journey of figuring this out, so he's asking questions, he's, he's being chaotic. This is what I mean. It's almost like you're looking for meaning and then you find out it's the dullest answer. You're like, oh, that's that, I suppose. It's, you know, it's a journey he's going on that we didn't even need because it's done already. Well, and the then, of firing course, of his lawyer, you go ahead. Just what I was going to say, and then to conclude a, an answer that none of us agree with. And when I say us, I mean the audience. The, um, the firing of the lawyer should have been like the break point that a lot of stuff in the movie was building up to, whereas here it just feels like it randomly happens. And him using his uh, being the Joker to represent himself should be him finally like this. Is, it, it's him finally committing to something that we've been um, that, that the movie's been kind of building towards. But we don't know what his relationship is with uh, the little revolutionary people outside and the, the Joker adoration. Um, we don't know what he really wants. So the yeah, the, the part of the questioning here with Gary where is it leading to? What's it trying to say? The firing of the lawyer. Well, what is it trying to say? What does he want? He spent all this time, and we don't know why. And those he's credits are crawling towards us. Biggest decisions. I mean, I, yeah, mean, I think but... all we're going to conclude is essentially that like he's made a stupid decision as part of a performance that he can't keep up for very long, and that that's kind of the takeaway for why everything is so like rudderless and directionless in this like you know questioning because it's just yeah. like he he doesn't even know what the hell he's doing. I think that's, I like, also, meant to be the takeaway. <laughs> I would also expect the judge, obviously he should shut down the wearing makeup thing, he should shut down the, hey, stop speaking like that, this is insane. He should also shut down these directionless questions, you would think. Yeah, he know? takes ages on that front. Yeah, and then the other thing he should not do is let him wander around and just approach the jurors. Yeah, he, he's, he's he lets him get real down. close to Gary, too, who's admitted he's basically traumatized by the Joker. Say, yeah. So, like in 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 real life, you're not the 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 lawyers don't actually do that. This is like very much a movie thing. But you should definitely not let the guy who he's not even denying that he killed those people. Like he's a murderer, and he's just walking up to the jurors. You should not let him do that. <laughs> That's insane. You've already made but this sort of. No, he's like, oh man, I remind you, like, and all that sh that shit. I don't know. It's yeah. just... If it was like so, there's not much to be said really about any of the things he said, it's way more about Gary's reactions of like yeah. just answering the questions as 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 best he can, and and then eventually starting to be like you know like I was terrified, you scared the shit out of me. I thought like what the hell, you know what I mean? Like you 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 made me feel so small and 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 powerless. Or we're summarizing it that portion a... before we because there's plenty to talk about for that, I guess. Well, yeah, basically the, um, you know, he, he's, he's doing this questioning that seems to essentially be, like, not really going in any direction, but then it kind of leads up to him being like, oh, you know, when you saw me, like, uh, in, in my apartment, you know, did I seem like a different person, or was I the same old Joker that I've always been, and, and Gary's kind of like, you know, like, I never saw that side of you, um, like, I... Like, and and I suppose the thing is, 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 is like kind of two different answers because he says, like, don't do this to yourself, it isn't you. But then he also, you know, when saying, like, oh, well, you know, maybe you didn't know who I was, he's like, well, I never saw that side of you, which then prompts Arthur to go on a bit of a, a big old kind of like rant. Um, I, I, I don't know what to make of the rant other than it felt like it was trying to essentially emulate the, um, the, the, the rant on Murray Franklin's show, right? It's kind of like, but but like less authentic, which I presume was the point. Also, um, yeah. it's hard to tell if that was the point or not. Unfortunately, we might be in the situation where I don't know if that's just how it comes across, or if that was its intended. I think design. Um, I'd say that because it feels like it got very much undercut. Um, because mm -hmm. because he's like, oh, you know, people think they could treat me like shit, but I'm free. And then everybody cheers, and then, and then you know, Gary, like, basically cuts it down immediately, like, why are you doing this to me? Like, I'm terrified, you, I, like, I'm, I'm scared of everything, you made me feel powerless, 
Um, and, and, and that starts to, like, Arthur starts to kind of, like, break a little bit. He tries to make jokes about it at the beginning, but then he's like, wait, no, no further questions. No, no further questions. So, you know what I mean? Like, if it gets undercut like that, it makes me feel like the whole point of it was see, like, the the big rant met with the reality of the of the harm that was dealt to this individual. I think the intention here, as opposed to the first movie, in the first movie, it's sort of like, uh, Arthur is a mask that slips and we see Joker. And here it's uh, Arthur sort of uh, taking on, sort of putting on a mask of Joker. And that's how I think it's intended to come across as in acting like a joker but he's not the actual villain so you know this movie really tries to get across with this sequence that he's not this evil person we believe him to be it's it's done it's terrible well if we can uh, focus on the part that i think is strong and uh, i would almost want to isolate and put into the good version of this film is a, a really decent and interesting point to be made which is if jo if arthur's journey as joker in in all of this was a result of the trauma that he experienced and he feels justified in a lot of the actions he takes because society left him behind would step all over him would treat him horribly wouldn't care if he died doesn't care about the man underneath all that sort of stuff if um if that expression as a result of all of that then inflicts horrors those very same horrors that he believes happened to him unfairly on someone else that he's reminded in this scene was someone that he cared about someone that he treated well and he's destroyed them i do think that is a really good starting point as an angle to make him rethink exactly what he's doing as joker and what joker means the fact that this yeah. guy is saying to him you know, he, a lot of what he says is very applicable to Arthur, how Arthur felt with the world. And it's like, mm -hmm. you did that to, yes. to Gary, especially weird when you, you're supposed to care about him. And he cared about you. He liked you. But you've, you've ruined this man. Mm -hmm. And the performance really captures it. And you buy it, too. Yeah. Because um, in the first film, it's, it's yeah. darkly comedic, I'd say, in the, uh, in the scene with, 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 with Gary. But at the same time, it's very easy to look back on that scene and describe it the way Gary does here. And understand yeah, it. Imagine it from his perspective. And it yeah. does undercut um, Joker's sort of pizzazz, which is exactly what it's supposed to do here. But it's going to be used for different purposes, which we'll talk about because we're we're very close to some other this things. I guess the be... thing is, though, is that in terms of this, like tearing him down, this isn't like the thing that really tears him down. No, um... it's it's definitely not. We we have references to prove this is not what tears him down. However, I think it should have been. This should, if it you're should have been, yeah. Been Yes. It's um I mean, of course the the sort of the reversal, right, of like of of Arthur when he let Gary out in the first film saying, you know, you were the only one who was ever nice to me, for Gary to then like flip that back around and say that to him, but obviously like crying because it's because of course this one's tinged with a lot more negativity of like you were the only one who was nice to me and then you did this. Like, goddamn. Mm -hmm. Like that 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 was like quite destructive for my for my worldview and my outlook on on uh on life. I think the reason I personally think this is the most impactful scene in the whole movie is that this is the only time this film actually directly addresses and actually like presents the con the direct consequences of the actions taken in the first film in when it comes to Gary and uh no other time, the only times this movie addresses anything like that and comes to doing any of that, it sort of tries to either rewrite the history or, you know, misconstrue it in some type of way. And um, this time it's actually addressed and you can feel uh, the impact of Joker's actions from the first film. So I think it's wonderful. In a well-written deconstruction of Joker as a character, this was one of those key things that would believably and justifiably begin to like make him crack. It's mm -hmm. it, it, yeah, it, it it's like this this idea and this execution and this actor and some of these lines they could be rescued from this film and put in a way better one. Mm -hmm. It's oh, contradictory I guess something... to his his sort of like quasi code of honor that he has in the first movie of oh I'm not going to hurt you you're a okay you're nice to me. Or I killed those guys because no, like they were awful. Should, uh, that should be indicative of kind of like how the whole question of, ah, yes, there's a Joker and it's not Arthur. It's like, 
Well, no, because I mean, you know, after after he killed Randall, he let he let uh he let Gary go because he likes him personally. It's like yeah, because Joker wasn't like a distinctive identity, um, like. It, it wasn't a distinctive identity, because if it was, that probably wouldn't have happened, right? He wouldn't be able to recall, like, well, yeah, but you were nice to me always, so, like, I'm gonna let you go. But yeah. but again, it's like, you're inviting a question that didn't even need to be addressed, because nobody nobody thought the Joker was, like, an alternate personality. Yeah, uh, I and, guess and you would think that that would be a defense sorry. that Joker would say. Like, if, it, well, I guess you don't really even know, because we're not exactly certain what the Joker's like, what, what Arthur's trying to do here in terms of, like, representing himself? What's the point of these questions? Where is he trying to go with it? Because originally I thought, oh, he's he's going to try and use the defense of I only killed people who deserved it to maybe try and appeal to the, the like, the crowd outside of, like, yeah, those bad people, they're finally getting what they deserve and the blah, da, 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 da. Um, and, and, and then he has to be confronted with the idea that, yeah, you might be going out there to get the people that you think deserve it, but that has repercussions, that has consequences. You can't just do that sort of thing. The people out there are uh, some force of chaos that you can't really treat with. Um, but we don't, it, that's just not really the direction that it takes. I don't know what direction it really does take, actually. It, like I said, that aimlessness kind of comes into play with the questions that Arthur sort of asks to. Um, uh, puddles, so. Something I'm supposed to add is an important thing that happens is during his big rant, he says, you know, the, the guards at Gotham, they're fat and stupid, and, uh, Jackie is watching this and, uh, is quite bewildered and perplexed yeah. by this. Um, like, oh, this will turn out to be, this will turn out to be, like, the most important thing that happens, um, <laughs> in terms of its consequences. And why would which, he say I, I think, first of all, the he could have said anything much, much, much fucking worse, and the guards would still only have laughed in response. I was kind of like, of wait, why did he take that so badly? Like, is not, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, like, because they have the reaction shot, he's like, what the fuck? And I was, I was, I remember yeah. thinking to myself, like, he called you fat, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but this is gonna have... <laughs> This is I think have that the other guards would even be like, ah, he's right, you are fat. Ah. That's what I mean. I feel like you could have had that. The, the Brenna Gleason's Jackie could have just been like, ah. You know, like, taking no, it I mean, as they a... Had, they had other ideas in mind. They sure did. They wanted to take it. <laughs> so, um, that, that's, uh, as, basically, as Gary is saying, like, you know, you were the only one who was ever nice to me. Why are you doing this? Uh, Arthur, with a cracking, like, breaking voice, says, you know, I have no more questions, Your Honor. And then uh, Gary leaves, uh, at which point Harvey Dent says bafflingly that he rests his case, and that's the end. Um, and then Arthur's like, oh, uh, 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 the, the, the defense rests! <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then the judge is like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, I guess that's the end then. And everybody cheers for some reason, which I yeah. find odd. It's like, why are you cheering? He's just sabotaged himself like he's well, screwed. And, and it struck me on a meta level of like, did we not just finally manage to make the courtroom whole idea worthwhile and then we gave yeah, up? it's over. Yeah, like, yep. you only get, what, five minutes of, of, of Joker in the courtroom and then it's over. You could have done it's those like, scenes oh. for all the... Ca Why the fuck didn't he get to talk to the neighbor? Yeah. Hello? That, yeah. I mean, it feels like that's the opportunity, right? Have Joker talk to every Front single reality. person. The, the, yeah. the social yeah. worker. He could have been like, oh, I see how it is. Like, you know, oh, the world's against us until you have a chance to benefit from stepping on me as well. You know, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, nope. exactly. That would have been interesting. But, nope. Yeah, that's it's it. like, the, you don't, you never get the back and forth. I'm nope. sorry that the system failed you, Arthur, but that's no excuse for what <laughs> yeah, you did. Just or anything. Uh, eventually, you know, you've got to... Like you still have a, a responsibility, like just like I did, and I maybe she feels like oh. she failed him. Something. I Something. suppose on on that point as well, in terms of missed opportunities, this is the first time that anybody in the gallery like says anything negative. You hear a couple people saying like, you know, you're gonna fry you fucker and stuff like that, and it's like, oh yeah, shit, because you know, it's like we haven't seen it, but there are gonna be people in this courtroom who fucking hate him. Um, the people who, you know, like, the, the, the friends and relatives of, uh, of, of the people that he killed. Um, but, like, you don't see any of that, like, up to that point in the film, right? Of, like, the opposing side that's mm -hmm. looking to get him, other, other than Harvey Dent, basically. 
Um, which again, if it was like another missed opportunity, why wouldn't you take advantage of that for a greater portion of the film? I don't know, it's just like a courtroom's gonna be like a more dynamic setting than Arkham, at least the way that they chose to spend their time in Arkham. Well, the oh, movie just... feels oddly detached from the first movie. Um, oh, the yeah. fact um, that like the Waynes yeah. and everything, like what's going on well, yeah, with I the Waynes uh, and I kind of wondered if, uh, if Bruce Butler, was gonna, yeah. you know, like show up again, basically, or if Alfred, because it feels yeah, like Alfred, it'd be relevant, you know? right? You call Alfred, it's like, dude, this dude came to like yeah. Thomas Wayne's house. Yeah, he, he, would, he would have had to have uh, that was been weird. called as part of the case. That would only make sense. But for some reason, that's not the case. I don't it's get it. Establishing a pattern of mm -hmm. uh, behavior. behavior, for sure, yeah. And, and especially the idea of, like, well, what's the deal? Like, the idea that the shadow took over one night, it's like, well, what about that day? You know, what about all these other instances? Um, but, you know, oh, well. I mean, there's no time for that. We got another musical number. Because he walks out of court <laughs> in his mind with Harley. Uh, and then they, they start they start singing about building a mountain. <laughs> you, you know, like, yeah, like I, I, I'm with you. It, I didn't come a mountain, all right. <laughs> Once the sequence was over, I hadn't gained anything. I just watched them do a sequence, and I was like, "There it is." Yeah, they're gonna build a mountain. Yep, and they're dancing. <laughs> this actually felt like and one of the that's... few times they came close to giving Lady Gaga something a little more difficult to do. She's like playing two instruments yeah. and singing at the same time, which is shit that she can do. Every day, I because uh, one of the things about this film that struck me as weird is they didn't really take advantage of her at all. No, no. Uh, a lot. Well, a lot of the singing is like, um, what's it called? Like the the sort of you know, like not not singing Fox properly, singing. basically. Just speak the, singing. The, the, I guess. Yeah, speak singing. Yeah. That's that's it. And it's like, why though? She's like a singer. <laughs> why not? Why not get her to like? Sing I want to give her challenging real. shit. And I don't know why they wouldn't have given her the chance to write an original song. Do you remember the, I think it was called Shallows was the original song for the other film she did? Um, a Star Is Born. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it was, yeah. it fucking struck a chord to the audience. So the, the film did really well. People yes. see that, usually cite that film as evidence that she can act. I'd just be like, why aren't you, why don't you, why did you hire her? If you're not going to like take advantage of her talents. Actually get her to like sing, really? Yeah. I well, don't know. she has moments where she sings, really, and this is one of them where, like, the, it gets a mm -hmm. bit yeah. more boisterous, but, it's like, a after decent... the fire she's singing, and it's like, oh, yeah, she That's what I'm saying. She's it singer, happens you know? very yeah. little. If well, I'm not like, wrong... Musical numbers are like that, yeah. If I'm not wrong, the first, like, entire two-thirds of the movie, she's not even allowed to use her chest voice. Which is... Uh, you know. Well, yeah, because they don't do any, like, proper musical numbers until, like, later on. Um, yeah, I think I mean, the first proper one for her is the uh, the the all important one, right? The the one on the the talk show, the Imagine talk show that they have. Yeah. Oh wait, no, no, no. There was them dancing. Um, the one before that, where they were dancing, and before she went and visited him. Mm hmm. But still, it's not many. Lines. Most of them are most of them are just like the talk singing stuff, which I yeah, I just I don't get it. I'm not sure. I agree. Why was why why bother? Oh, that song if you're not use her. on the rooftop was written by her, but that one. How long did that last? Oh, okay. That was like a couple of minutes, I think, one or two minutes. And it didn't. I don't remember it being like made important, so to speak. You know, it's sort of just there. Right. Obviously, I'm not saying you have to do the same thing as A Star Is Born, but Shallows was like an incredibly important song thematically as well as uh, within the universe yeah. and out of it. Every time you say A Star Is Born, I think of Hercules. I'm just going to okay. roll uh, with you. All right. Hercules allowed. and Lady Gaga are similar. <laughs> that was a good movie, Hercules. <laughs> so, uh, That's yeah, so. Joe is on a roll. So Arthur. Not... Oh, sorry. He, he's not on a roll. I Arthur, said he was, but he's not really. Uh, I see. Yeah. Um, so Arthur, Arthur gets brought back to Arkham. And uh, once inside Arkham, uh, Jackie, who is furious, uh, him and a couple of other guards drag Arthur into the bathroom and they rape him. Yep. That should not make me laugh, but it does. It's just... Uh... So, I learned what all the memes were about. <laughs> I was mistaken. I was so mistaken when I saw... I I knew virtually nothing about this movie going in, but I couldn't I couldn't help but notice that there was a lot of, like, memes about Joker being raped. 
that were just going around the internet, and I'm like, that's mm -hmm. weird. And I was thinking, oh, does Lady Gaga take advantage of him or something like that? I was horribly wrong. Not even I joking. I was horribly wrong. There is a famously viral tweet from years ago that says, like, Batman has tried everything, but he hasn't tried raping the Joker. Oh, yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> And I think people quote tweet it being like, well, we got our answer. That does truly kill the Joker uh, more effectively than anything else. Oh, where do you begin with this? Um, um, should we, we need to get to the consequences of it, I guess, as well, right? So, yeah, so, the, so after this <laughs> happens, Arthur gets dragged into and thrown into solitary confinement. Uh, and the other prisoner that you may recall was mentioned before, Ricky, he's there. And he's like, oh, what are you doing? And then he starts singing. And um, Jackie, in a blind rage, drags him out of his cell and suffocates him to death. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is heard as the camera zooms in on Arthur, like, totally, like, blank face, zoned out, like, destroyed. As he's listening to the sounds of him gagging and choking and the other guards, like, saying, Jackie, holy shit, like, stop. Um, and so, yeah, he's he, he gets choked to death, um, um, and then blacks mm -hmm. out. Maybe you guys feel differently, but I got a pretty distinct impression with uh, all these factors put together. But uh, what's interesting about the puddles part of it is is that I feel like there's a scene that kind of cancels it out in terms of being an effective motivator for what's about to happen. But him listening to that and the rape, plus the the visuals of him washing his makeup off. Uh, post the dance in the first film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I just got a distinct, strong impression of, man, this whole Joker thing ain't worth it. People people suffer. Uh, and I was just like, what? What are you... Why did... Was this... How is this happening? Like, why would that even be considered? Like... Like, look at the... Look at the suffering I'm causing myself and look at how someone I like just died... And all of this because I'm becoming the Joker. I I don't even like. I was just like, did did the are they like for, outwardly forgetting what happens in the first film? The amount of crazy chaos and suffering there is in that as a result of his like rise as Joker. I don't understand why this would be such well, a motivating abandoned. factor for him We've to think so much of the first movie. That's 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 what I'm getting at because the next thing we're getting yeah, pretty soon now is him exist. essentially establishing the joke is not real. It's time to end. I made a mistake when I killed people. Like it's this the very whole, this whole sequence is just cruel. Like it's cruel. Well, I, so this, this is the big one. This whole sequence is the yeah. big one for fuck the first film. Okay, this this is what this actually means, and this is this is and and, and of course you could have done it in multiple ways. They chose one that was very just like, oh, you want to do that? Okay. I guess. I don't buy that this changes his mind. No, I don't either. I think if anything, I it think might hyper accelerate him. Yes. Yeah. I, I think that's what the audience would have wanted to see, was that he experiences one of the worst things in prison, barring death, I guess, and severe tortures that um, a lot of men go through, and is often thrown in as like a, a joke with a lot of movies, and he would instead overcome it. He'd be like, you really think that was going to fucking break me? Like, do you, do you know what my mm -hmm. life has been? And And then, on top of that, hearing a friend die would convince him to to stop to slow down i was like what? no not even close and he was killed by the guy who raped him so i don't know. i don't i don't buy that it's at a, all. it's a crazy authority figure that just did all of this it 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 does nothing but support the entire like journey yeah. that he went on in the first film also like i mean this is a very terrible thing and it's not even worth uh, comparing to but like we do learn, even in this film, it is confirmed that he does have a history of essay. Yeah. With his, so it's kind of like okay, like it just he has gone through a lot and a lot of similar stuff. Um, Isn't that established so, in the first movie, or is it just implied? Is it the? I think, I think it's, it's implied. implied it's but in this one, it's here. it's the dad, yeah, right? It's or the said stepdad, as part of the. Was it, so, I got, was it the mom? I, I can't remember. Very strong impression that that was exactly what you're meant to think from the first movie. Right. So they yeah. do mention it in this one, though, right? Yeah, they make yes. it explicit, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I don't buy that this like de radicalizes him. No, I think that's retarded. Um, I also just, I just, it makes no sense that the uh, the, the prison guard, as established, would do this. No, me, yeah, that's I actually a really good point. Um, 
I didn't get the impression of that at all, and I certainly didn't fucking get it from him calling them fat. And I actually think the 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 film is aware of this. It like has to. Do you catch the dialogue when they're setting this up? He's like, "You just had to go on TV and be a big shot. You just had to think you're better than us. You had to say you have no idea what it takes to bring joy to this place." It's like. What is this? Is it the ramblings of the writer you, trying to tell me oh, why this is okay? Same, he called uh, you fat, man. It's yeah, the same as, uh, well, that's what really stroking, happened. Uh, when you're stroking Ricky, it's like, oh, are the Saints, are they coming now? Are they coming now? And it's like, what the... Actually, what? kind of, yeah. If yeah, you're totally. Way, <laughs> but, yes, that's actually kind of true, but... No, yeah, yeah I, I didn't get it at all. I was, I was just like, why is he so mad? And why are the writers shouting at me that he should be mad? It makes sense. Trust me, it makes sense. This is his character. He would be mad about this. Like, no, he wouldn't. What are you talking about? No. Was this like a mental shutoff point for like anyone here? Because I feel like for me, yeah. I was already in a bit of a malaise at this point watching it, and at here I was like, "Oh, all right." A little mm -hmm. bit, yeah. Um, that mm -hmm. stare okay. emoji uh, that is a good expression. Like I said, that new one. <laughs> people, um, have, people have been using it in chat. It, it does represent. Like I'm not even kidding, really. It's this sense of like, what was that? What are, well, what are we doing? Why am I? <sighs> okay. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. So, um, which uh, brings bring well, uh, be before before the final court scene, uh, you just have Lee singing as she's putting on her makeup and singing the song. I feel like there's nothing really oh. to be said about this. Yes. Or... Um, I was just gonna say that the the reason why I wouldn't add the experience with puddles into this decision that much is because they showed us he has one of his most invigorating Joker experiences through song after. That conversation with Gary, yeah, which I think is a huge mm -hmm. mistake. <laughs> like, you don't want to oh, tell us that like that didn't affect him really much at all, and then you have that happen, and then it's like that affected him completely. It, there's memes about this being discussed left, right, center, but you, you guys know how this would happen with these events in this movie. It would be summarized as the Joker was defeated by rape. It's very fucking strange that you would want to tell the story that way. Yikes. Yeah. It, it's so, uh, just it's it's a it's it's such a shocking example of something that you see a, a lot in bad writing, like especially amateurish writing, where the main crisis point of the movie is just a bad thing that happens instead of anything that's motivated by what came before it or anything that's um an indication that they're farthest away from their goal. You know what crisis moments usually represent. You would think it would have to do with Gary, but it isn't. It's just that he got raped by someone out of the blue. It's like, yeah, because no, it went out of the blue. Call them fat. You did call him fat. <laughs> like, that's it is, not. You're right, though. That's wild, isn't it? Like, they do all that setup, all that emotional acting, all that, that, that strength of that part of the scene. But it's ultimately doesn't matter at all. It's because he called the guy fat and got raped, and his friend got killed because of aforementioned rape from the fat calling. That's it. That was the catalyst. He said, I don't want to play Joker anymore. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so, I mean, in court, he's he's got to provide his closing statement, and he uh, sits before the jury and stares into the camera for several moments. Yeah. And while that's happening, uh, Jackie is watching on TV, which will make you lead, like, oh, is he about to, like, explode and, and, and say what happened and talk about how, like, horrible it is in Arkham and, and like, how everything's gone, um... You, you basically, like, to sort of reiterate a lot of the, um, complaints and, and criticisms and, um... That that he levied uh, in in the first film, you know, like when he was on Arthur Murray, uh, not Arthur Murray, uh, Murray Franklin show, talking about how yeah. horrible it is out there and nobody well, knows wouldn't or that cares. Be, wouldn't that be interesting if the way that he looks at it is, you know, a lot of people got hurt from the things that I did that I didn't intend. There were unforeseen consequences that I I didn't want, but you know what? I can no matter what happens with this trial, whether I'm guilty, whether I'm found guilty or not guilty. Whether you guys think I'm crazy nuts so or not, um, here's what I do know. And he could say something about, you know, Arkham, the guards and what they did, justice for Ricky, that kind of thing. So at least he could say, you know what, I can actually do good in this different way than what I thought I could. Um, but Oh, dude, I but would way prefer the idea that he doesn't believe himself to be the Joker, but he will adopt it because he knows he can make change with it. That'd be interesting. Mm -hmm. But, uh... This is, what, this, this is what he says instead, uh, as, he, as he sits down, in a, in a very weak voice, he says, I wanted to come out here as Joker, and I was gonna go on an angry rant to blame all of you and everyone for this fucking miserable life. 
but it wouldn't matter because I can't do this anymore because I can't be who you want me to be. It was all just a fantasy. There is no Joker. It's just me. Whatever the fuck that means. Well, so here's the awkward part. There is no Joker in the way that this film tried to uh, create that as like a distinctive entity. It is just him. Because yeah, he it's was like the Joker. It always was He's, that way. Yeah, yeah, like he he. There is no Joker. He was the Joker. Like it's it's almost yeah, like can we? No, you, you don't understand. You you've actually said it correctly, but your meaning is wrong. He was the Joker. He transformed into the Joker. That's what happened. The whole film was his descent into becoming the Joker, and and essentially like letting the mask fall away and revealing like who he really was in a very dark, twisted way. Right. That that's like that was what happened. It's remarkable because of how much work is being undone that the, the first film did to justify why the clown iconography, why the name Joker, how he got attention from Murray, how he ended up on Murray's show, why Murray said what he said, and why he adopted that from what was essentially his comedy hero. All of these things were written, I thought, to structurally build up how we get to the point of him calling himself Joker and him being dressed as a fucking clown. But now... It's being said as though Joker were a thing already that he tried to steal as an identity or something. Like, like the meta bleeding in again of being like, I mean, is he the Joker? Is that the And yeah, to have this assessment at the end, it's it's almost fucking infuriating in the sense of like, what are you talking about? This is all like balked, and it, it all goes back yeah. to that opening of the film. I, I was already like, this is not. Why are we doing this with the film? Why why, why is this what's happening? Joker was a name he got from someone else, and it represents, I suppose who he is on that stage, but then he realizes that that is just, that is Arthur, that is Joker. Even irrelevant of anything to do with DC. Cutting it all out. Just the, just the idea of a, of a, a fucking clown, a, a guy who's trying to make people laugh, but l views the world in that way through and through. There is no taking anything seriously. It's all a fucking joke. We lost him. He's gone. Yeah. I mean, well, it seems like he's changed his mind. You know, the, the line, I used to think my life was a tragedy, now I realize it's a comedy. It seems like he, he's reversed around. It's like, no, it's a tragedy. Yeah. Yeah, what the <laughs> fuck happened? Yeah. Well, like, there was so much power he got out of, instead of reacting to everything as a miserable person with a miserable life, to simply be like, you wouldn't get it. This is all hilarious. That's Well, that's kind of the point of the line, right? It's the idea that the story that somebody tells themselves about the, their life and the situations that befall them can either like strip away all of their agency or imbue them with agency. And, and that turning it around to be like, well, it's a comedy. It's like, well, shit. Once, once, once you view it that way, it's like, I guess all of the horrible things that happen uh, can, be, can be something that he can laugh at and use as like fuel for well, action the, rather than... The churning suffering. of a society that did what it did to him and others to then be, like, have this backfiring that one of the biggest representations of jokes in the world gets fucking, like, executed on TV while trying to insult him for having lived the exact same life in terms of trying to make the effort to, to make things work. Like, there's always, there's loads of little pieces of dramatic irony floating around, and then, of course, the chaos outside, the the downfall of um, all the riots, every all this damage and everything collapsing, and then the Waynes having experiencing what they do. There's all this, there's all this shit to say about how, like it's the it's mm -hmm. the result of all the actions of a collective set of systems and people in charge who failed, that then brings down their own destruction, and it's kind of funny, like that that aspect, even though it's completely chaotic and at times horrifying. It was bold, damn it, and now we've reduced all of it down to, no, I, I, I just made some mistake. I killed some people, and that was bad. There is no Joker. Mm-hmm. I hate how empty the line, it was all fantasy, is. Like, it's so, it's meaningless. It does not mean anything. What are you even implying by that? Like, script-wise, what are you trying to get across with that? Did he imagine it? What what is that? That it the script treats it as some kind of like justification or like contextualization of why Joker does not exist, but it does not give you anything. It's just a fantasy. It's just an empty line. Because like oh he's mentally ill. So what do mentally ill people do? They they daydream and they fantasize and they make up stuff. And are there made up Joker? And that's just such dumb not dumb what writing. Not, not what happened. Not what happened. Yeah. He, uh, 
he he then basically outlines all of the things that he did, and then uh uh oh, well, Lee and a few other yeah just to just to because doesn't he say um I don't I don't uh, forgive me if I'm getting ahead of you just the the knock knock who's there no that's uh that's a bit that's yeah. a bit later oh okay that's um that's after so. He, he he concludes basically saying, "I just want to blow it all up and start a new right. life." Uh, after after explaining all of the things he did, and then Lee and a few other people just uh they leave, they storm out. They're, you see, Fringy, uh, the film was right. Yeah, we lost interest in this guy Logan. once he That's announced right. the truth, and yeah. she represents us. And boom, boom, boom. Very clever. Very clever movie. Very, very you, clever. As soon as he told you the truth that he is a troubled man who needs help, you weren't interested. You only liked him when he was Joker, which is so fucking funny because he wasn't Joker for like the first. Yeah, significant exactly. half if not more of the first <laughs> film and we cared about him because yeah. we cared about Arthur Fleck yeah, and the life he was living exactly. yeah. So, yeah a bit awkward that um, but yes the, the last thing that he says um, or he, he cries for a little bit and then he says knock knock who's there Arthur Fleck Arthur Fleck who and that's the, yeah, that's, and that's the that's point that, being made. Yeah. No one cares about Arthur Fleck. Yeah, no one knows yeah. who Arthur Fleck is. Once right. he's detached himself from the Joker, there's nothing left for him. He's he's fucked, and he's gonna get yeah, killed. Yeah, I mean, as long as Todd Phillips has ordained that that is the case, exactly. Then, yeah, that's the. It's like, <laughs> see, that's the, and it's like that wasn't the fucking story. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah, you made this up. This was your idea. You did this. You, you, you did this. this. <laughs> that's right. It was you. Um. So, uh, then, he, he's, yeah. yeah. I feel like this is maybe an attempt to, like, uh, I mean, who knows what it is, but, you know, to not glor glorify Joker as a character and sort of fix the first movie or whatever. But, um, I feel like this movie could have, um, done that and did not celebrate Joker and have his demise without character like assassinating him as a character mm -hmm. like you could have still uh, sort of communicated that message that joker is actually bad and don't glamorize him and have him defeated at the end and still I mean, deliver it's, it's that a, message it, without having a, to get rid of him as a character completely it's interesting that you say that because as far as i'm concerned the first film again it's one of my favorite things about it like joker creates his antithesis like yeah. he creates what will be his undoing. Um, I mean, I mean, it's you know he says right. Like I'm just thinking of a funny joke. You wouldn't get it. It's like I guess Todd Phillips didn't get it. Like that's that's mm -hmm. that is interesting. The idea that yes. in order for Joker to even exist and be created in the first place necessarily creates the force that will destroy him in the end. When, it creates the response. And how bold to say they both came from society just not caring enough about, like the people of society not exactly. working hard enough to care about each other. And then it creates the cycle. It creates the cycle of Batman and Joker, you know, in this tug of war. Of uh, of like reacting to and responding to each other, and and in a sense, one of those sort of eternal questions, right? For Batman, does does Batman's very existence essentially invite these sorts of uh these sorts of like crazy supervillains to to sort of exist? Does he does he feed into the cycle of their their turmoil uh, uh the turmoil that they bring about? Is his rule, you know, because he doesn't want to cross that line? Is he essentially just perpetuating? the same kind of harm that creates the circumstances that created him in the first place. Like that, that's kind of, the, it's, 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 I mean, it's part of the reason why I think a lot of people had the feeling of like, well, you don't need to do another Joker film. You don't yeah. need to follow it up is, is the, the idea that it really, it create, it, it like provides its answer and the answer to that answer. It's like, you know, this, this world created Joker, which in turn created Batman. It's like that's that's really mm -hmm. cool, and it, and instead here it's 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 like you said, Nutzer. It's like you've totally you you don't have to make a point against Joker by just mm -hmm. assassinating the character. Like I don't even <laughs> think that makes a particularly compelling case against Joker. You know, no. if it's like, whoa, I mean, as long as you turn him into something that he wasn't, what you created, and then tear him down from there, it's like, oh, sure, but that's like you haven't even you haven't even addressed the real meat mm -hmm. of, of, of uh, criticizing that character. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder if Todd Phillips knew all of this about the first movie at one point, and then has been sort of convinced by a lot of the insane vitriol that the first movie received that like, Oh, he actually does need to make sure like he's, he's convinced that a lot of people got the wrong message and that 
he's sort of maybe has a chip on his shoulder about proving that no 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 I didn't mean to glorify him. Look out look look at me showing just how much I'm not glorifying him in this. Yeah, movie. look, that I raped worth, him. Was that worth <laughs> potentially losing Warner Brothers like 150 million dollars? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. See, I don't know how also, much of this because people people have certainly speculated that this is something more like deliberately insulting to fans of the first movie. I don't know if I believe that necessarily. I think it, yeah. there's well, an insecurity uh, that this movie radiates, in my opinion. I've talked to uh, Frank about how we could be in a Neil Druckmann situation. He could believe this is coherent with the first film, and he could believe that everyone is overreacting right. to the second one, and that uh, he always intended this. This was the whole story. Which mm. I find unbelievable, the notion yeah, that sure. there is no world where at the ending of Joker you're like, yeah, and so then he's gonna, and and then it's gonna, he's gonna decide there is no Joker and then he gets stabbed to death in prison. Like, uh, what, what reason would anybody have to infer that this film was what was gonna happen? We should probably no, save I this don't conversation think, for I don't think so we're close all. to the I end of the film. Something changed. Yeah. I think something changed for him. I think something changed as well. That's I, I understand, though, That's... that it could be the Neil Druckmann situation, but I, I think he changed his mind. I think that he listened to uh, the criticisms of the meta, and that made him change his mind on what he wanted to do. That's mm -hmm. a vibe I get. Uh, but yes, we are quite close to the end. So, um, Arthur Yay. calls... Uh, yeah. Arthur calls <laughs> Lee, who doesn't answer, and he said the jury came back with a verdict in about an hour. And then he starts singing one of the songs from earlier, um, but she she ain't listening. Uh, well, she's uh, she's not she's not answering, but she's she's sitting in the apartment. And she puts a gun to her head, but you know, and then it cuts away. I, I mean, again, it's just like, yep, he's singing a song, and it's a song that has lyrics that are relevant to this story that is incompatible with the first film. But okay, um, and then uh, back in the uh, back in the courtroom, the jury delivers a verdict. Uh, and they just keep saying, you know, Arthur Fleck guilty of this count and this count and this count. And then uh, Arthur starts cackling, which uh, prompts one of the members of the gallery to, to jump out and start attacking him. Um, the chaos erupts. He gets separated from the crowd. He gets taken over near the wall and keeps laughing. And then the wall explodes. An explosion just tears through the wall, um, d appearing to have killed and injured several people. Uh, Arthur was quite close to the explosion compared to most people in the room, You're and he's o he's okay. He's fine. It takes yeah, him a little while to get up, but he's, he's up and dazed, at him. He's the all. only fella yeah. who gets out of that courtroom. He is the only. <laughs> Everyone one else is on pause. Yeah. Thus begins. Thus begins <laughs> the worst. Just like in terms of just this happens and then this happens and then this happens. Connected tissue. The worst instance of the writing in the film, as far as I'm concerned. Of just like getting characters where they need to be, like nothing here makes sense at all. It, like he should, he should be. He was so close. He was the closest. He was like one of the closest people, and he's fine. Meanwhile, like you know, Arthur, uh, 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 Harvey Dent was pretty far away, and he got his face messed up. Yeah, he got two faced. And Arthur, he did, and 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 it's like Mola said, Arthur's like the only person who's able to essentially like get up, get out, and leave. He's like. He, he, everybody else is basically on pause so that he can get out. Um, it's really, really bizarre. Um, but he stumbles out of the courtroom, and then, like, a Joker fan is like, oh, hey, it's the Joker, come on, we're gonna get you out of here. Um, the, the, the logic seems to be that when he said he wanted to blow it all up, somebody put a car bomb <laughs> next to the, the courthouse and then blew it up so that I guess they could get him out, even though it didn't look like they were making much of a concerted effort to do that. It's, it almost mm. seems like it's luck. They just stumbled across him. Yeah, and they're like, yeah, look, it's Joker. That's what it, yeah, that's and that's what it looks right. like. The random guy dressed him is like, oh, holy shit, it's you. Oh my gosh. It, yeah. Then he gets a car. It's, hey, I found the Joker guy. Help us yeah, escape. Go. And then they, they go driving for a little bit. Uh, and then when they get caught in traffic, Arthur gets out and starts running away. And the, uh, the, the guy's chasing after him, but he can't catch him because Arthur is too Why fast. Why does Joker get out and run away? I, I think he just wants to be away from them, and he wants to go meet Harley, which is which then raises a new question because yeah, he, he runs away and he, he escapes, and he it's it's much later in the night. It cuts to a lot later, and he, he's walking to the the Joker stairs, and Harley's walking there down the street. He still hasn't been captured. Yeah. Real quick, walking um, down the street because I just I consider it another clunk of the fucking script. He's listening to them in the car talk about how they're gonna burn it all down, and he's like, oh geez, and wants to get out. Like, I don't want to be a part of this. I don't like this no more. 
Oh, is that what they're going for? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Shit. He's, com- oh, yeah. he's relatively comfortable in the car in the sense of it's a safe place. But then he hears them talk about burning everything down, and he's like, oh, shit, I want to get out of here. I don't like this. Which, again, is just like, whatever. Whoever this character is, I don't know him. This, this guy who's <laughs> terrified about the notion of things going to ruin in the city. Yeah, that's that's Joker for you, I guess. Arthur doesn't like that. Mm-hmm. And he wants to run away. And then he goes to the stairs and, and, and leaves there, which is miraculous, really, in terms of a uh, coincidence that she knew to just wait there for an indefinite amount of time, because Arthur would definitely go back to the iconic Joker stairs. This this meeting can't happen, but it has to, because this is like the clearest declaration of the point mm. of, of the film, uh, along with along with what he said in the courtroom. Because, um, you know, he goes up to, the, you know, near to the top of the staircase, and he's like, yeah, let's, let's run away. Uh, but she's not interested. She says, uh, all we had was the fantasy, and you gave up. We were never going anywhere. There is no Joker. That's what you said, isn't it? And then, uh, and then Aww. she just starts. She starts singing um, after she well, reveals is, she lied about. The pregnancy, to be fair, and then she starts. Yeah, the most relatable part of the film, I'd say, where you're really in sync with the character when he says, "Please stop singing. Just stop. Stop <laughs> singing, stop please." Singing. <laughs> he just keeps singing. And he's like, "Stop! I want to talk. Stop singing." <laughs> But she just keeps singing the the like that's entertainment and then and then she she leaves and then the police just show up right as she leaves to arrest him. Yep, back into prison he goes. They don't grab her, I guess. No, they're not interested in her. I just find it funny that they arrive like five seconds later. Imagine if it took him a lot longer to find him, you know? Maybe he could have gotten away. Maybe he would have yeah, run no off. One, they didn't find him walking around the street all day wearing the same clothes. The same without, as Joe uh, yeah. So um. Yeah. Yeah. Famous see, that, exactly. I remember that was from the movie. I'm sure that's where it went. The famous Joker stairs. Um. So this brings us to the final scene of the film. Yeah. yeah. Um. Arthur is back in Arkham. Um. Someone in the background is singing "My Echo, My Shadow, and Me." Uh. Which I guess is meant to be relevant because hey, look, that's what it opened mm-hmm. on full circle, right? Mm-hmm. And so uh, a guard comes in and says, "Hey, Arthur, you got a visitor." And uh, Arthur is walking <laughs> through the hallway. And as he's walking through, there's the inmate. You remember that inmate? The one who was looking at him earlier? The sketchy so looking So he's one. like, it's right. He's a bit he's a bit crazy looking. And he's like, hey, I want to tell you a joke. And Arthur's like, oh, is it going to be quick? And he says, yeah, no, yeah, I, I can read make the script. It and so uh, the, the inmate says, so a psychopath walks into a bar and sees this famous clown sitting there all alone, totally drunk. It's pathetic. I can't believe you're here, he says. What a disappointment. I used to watch you on TV. What can I get you? And this clown turns and says, Well, if you're buying, you can get me anything. Perfect, the psychopath says. How about I get you what you fucking deserve? The inmate then Mm. stabs Arthur several times in the gut. Just put See, him out of his misery at this point. He You've said, already, he said you know, the line. Just... He said the line. <laughs> and then he stabbed him. I don't even he know why he like would. Like Arthur deserves to die because he doesn't like consider himself Joker anymore. Or you don't get the joke. That's what you he... don't understand. You don't Joker's betrayed joke. his fans by doing this. Okay. Even, even if I betray my fans, him. I hope they don't stab me in a prison. <laughs> I fucking hope not. <laughs> I guess there's one more um, bit to add just... on, right? Because it's we well, yes, end. yes. There's there's a little bit more. So um, as as Arthur like turns around and he's, he's bleeding profusely, uh, mm. we then cut back to that um that imagined interaction with Harley where she shot him, um, and he starts singing about wanting to have a son take his place, and then we cut back to back in Arkham. He, like, collapses onto the floor, and the inmate behind him, he starts cackling maniacally, and then carves a smile on his face. Like, you know, takes the blade and and cuts the smile on his face. Ooh. If you, Nolan. And then, uh, That's Life plays as you zoom in on Arthur's cold, dead eyes. (laughs) And that's the end of the film. I mean, what can I say? That that final shot yeah. of him being shagged and left in a fucking what feels like an alley in prison, you know, just to, to be forgotten. It's like that's what this film was. <laughs> it's just yeah. bye bye meeting. I just remembered for the first time since watching it that 
there was indeed a sarcastic clap by the end of it. That's the guy just stood up and clapped. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> well, just... um, let's like... talk about all of that, I guess. Uh, <laughs> you know, to just be <laughs> more specific, first of all. Like, why did this happen? Because that's kind of just asked. Is it, uh, you could go the meaning side of things, although just the practical. It's just this guy really believed in him as the Joker, and him doing what he did in the courtroom made him think, "I'm going to kill you, and I'm going to I'm going to be the Joker now." And it could be as simple as that, I guess. It's nothing interesting on that level to me. But like, if if the point being made is uh, Arthur indulged in "quote unquote" the Joker, or what people assumed was the Joker, and and the music in this film. To avoid addressing what was really happening, what really needs to be dealt with, which is like the author underneath, the man who made mistakes, the man who was desperate. Um, and so he finally decides, after being pushed to uh, limits again, after being gassed up by Harley, after going through the thing with, with Gary, after the rape, that he needs to be honest, be truthful, this is me, there is nothing else to think about other than the fact that I made mistakes because I was brought to a degree that I, I couldn't handle anymore and that um, I'm sorry and it was a mistake and I shouldn't have done it. And... um you know, he doesn't want to go as far as hurting other people as a result of it. He doesn't want to have a bad effect on the world, according to that little car ride, according to uh, his experiences with Gary, according to having that guy getting killed and, and the camera tightening up on him for that whole sequence. Like, this is all supposed to convince us that he's believed now that being the Joker actually causes even more suffering. So he wants to relinquish it. He's done with that. And he wants he wants to be helped. He wants to be known and understood as Arthur. And as a result, separating himself from Joker, like he's, he, it's like he's killing Joker, the idea, and then that's going to invariably kill anyone caring about him, which will in turn literally kill him. And, and the, all of this was brought on where he, it might not have been by him meeting Harley Quinn, I guess. I think it was an awful choice to have this random fucking guy be the one to do it. But that's the point, the guy isn't who... it? Yeah. I know, but I think it's an awful choice. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Um, well, I think all of that was an awful choice. Everything I just said is yeah. an awful yes. choice. <laughs> I what what's the what's the best you could say? The idea that his story ends tragically is probably not super unexpected, but man, this it's is how the most, like pointless, yeah. bleak, meaningless way you could possibly do it. Well, oh, the guy who ends up killing him was a guy we saw for a couple seconds once earlier in the movie. Not just meaningless, right? But if you had a pint of meaning, uh, he's been sapping it and dribbling it all over the floor throughout this this movie from the previous one. And it's like, stop it. Stop. Stop. You have to take the your meaning away, like that you got from the first film, because he keeps fucking mm -hmm. with it. Uh, it, it. It's like a black hole of meaning, this film. It's sucking the meaning of the first one into it and killing it forever, which is why... It's it... really, a really bad problem to have as a as a film, you know? like seriously dramatically like stripping away all of the interest and meaning that exists in the original film hence miserable yeah I, I mean it's it's part of the thing right of like well if you want the first film if you enjoyed the first film for the reasons and the interpretation and understanding that's basically just like accurate to what happened in that film this film's existence really only stands to get in the way, such that if you're going to enjoy the first film and 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 find it worthwhile, this film you kind of just got to pretend it doesn't exist, which I'm going to find pretty easy to do, honestly. Well, I think the more I think about it, the more I get a little angrier as opposed to apathetic about the film too. Because if if I'm truly to believe the notion that um. You know, the audience, they're not interested in the man behind the Joker. They're interested in watching a guy in face paint go nuts, cause chaos, and kill people. So let's give them what they want. Reveal that Arthur is just a man. Fucking kill him. Leave him bleeding on the floor and show him in the background. You got your real Joker on the way. The one you want. The one who's going to kill people and blow things up and fight Batman because that's what you care about. You don't care about, you know, the people who actually suffer. You don't care about the mental state of those who are trodden on in society. You only gave a shit... For a moment, because he adopted the role of the Joker. Which again, like I said, not the first film's point, as far as I was concerned. Certainly not what I took from it. I mean, yeah, like... <laughs> uh, yeah, I it, don't... I mean, I just... It, it really I like the first one more. <laughs> <laughs> I like the first one more. 
I think what most people take. seem to uh, most people seem to feel that way. I I don't think it is even remotely surprising that this film is is uh, not being received well by the audience and is failing. Well, it's um, not going to win over anyone who hated the first one either. No, of course not. No. So it's, no it's going like, to be like, oh, oh now I understand that you have you have the right opinions. Like, no, they're going to hate this <laughs> one too. Exactly. Who is this for? Who, who wanted this? Well, it seems like the answer is nobody. Um, I think Gary said this. It's something like when he got home, he tossed his uh, steel book of the first one in the trash. I don't know if he literally did that or not, but I'm I'm having a reverse reaction. I the first one is the first one. It will always be meaningful to me. I'm ignoring this one. Fuck this one. Get out of here. You're you're not interesting to me at all. You're only damaging the first one. I'll uh, happily enjoy the first one in future whenever I decide to watch it again, and we will laugh. Because of the tragedy of the second one, in retrospect, looking pretty funny, and how stupid it was, and how misguided it was, and how misunderstood the work from the creator himself was, which, again, not unprecedented, we've seen this before, I'm not gonna say it was as, as embarrassing as Ridley with Prometheus, right, like, and what he did with the fucking <laughs> engineers, but you get the same scale, the fact that James Cameron supports the new Terminators, or... Whatever have you, Shane Black being a part of the Predator when he was such an. Uh, the thing is, though, is like, this one is a bit more awkward because it's like Todd Phillips was on the cusp. No, this is the worst. I think had. this is the worst example say... we've ever had. It, it it it's actively attacking the first film like it doesn't like it. Well, and and, and uh, I agree. Uh, and the thing that I was getting at in terms of the idea of like Todd Phillips was like getting close to getting that cred, you know, as like a as like a filmmaker, right? From doing comedy movies to then do Joker to then like just exploded completely. I don't know what he does after this, you know? Like what's it gonna look it feels like you know what I mean? Like he was he was like on the cusp of of of, of being like, ah yeah, look yeah, at me I think go. So. And now now it's like he's it's undone over. it. Yeah, he's undone yeah. it. Because the shanking itself to me is almost like <laughs> Joker 2 doing it to Joker 1. Yeah, I don't know. It's just you watch it, it's like, holy shit. Like, jeez. Is this... Tell us how you really feel, you know? Like, my god. And it, it feels like slamming the door shut, right? There will be oh, no yeah. more sequel. Regardless of how much money it's going to make, which it looks like it's now going to lose money, there's not going to be a sequel. That is slamming the door shut. So imagine as you were like a batrillion gazillionaire and you just say like, you know, Joaquin, we're going to make... <laughs> Joker 2 for real this time. We're going to remove Todd, we're going to write it, and you're going to do everything I tell you because I'm going to pay you a trillion dollars to, to fucking do this properly. I, I often wonder why uh, the hyper rich don't fuck around with movies in that way. Just be like, I want to just, I want to make a fucking Jurassic Park movie. Here I go, you know? You know, like buy the rights or whatever mm. have you. I guess yeah, yeah. some of those rights are super protected, but there's plenty of ones you could probably buy up and fuck around with fun ways. Well, if anyone wants to watch a film, like this film, but done better, about, like, authoritarian, toxic, abusive, uh, sort of institution, breaking a free rebel spirit, just watch One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. I thought you were going to say That's watch Joker so 1. Much to... <laughs> <laughs> well, that too, but... In terms of but what no, this yeah, film right. tries to accomplish, that film is actually a masterpiece. And a masterclass of how how you break down a character completely. So... King yeah. of Comedy is a really good movie. It is very you know, good. King of Comedy is comedy really, is really good. Good stuff. That's, uh, yeah. I, it's, 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 it just is. That, that film impresses me in terms of, uh, in terms of its construction and, and writing. Um, not like this one. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> ironic <laughs> that it, he, he probably would have done better if he aped, like, King of Comedy and Taxi Driver even harder for this one. <laughs> at, least the end, at least the ending well, would have been better. Right? The thing is, is that Joker, the first film, I can see the similarities and influence of Taxi Driver and King of Comedy, but, like, it is a different movie. Like, oh, it, sure. It just has yeah. different... No, it's, I'm just uh, saying that, like... At least those had more satisfying endings, even though they ended. You know what I mean? Like this one, I don't know what he was yeah. up to with this one, because if, if you think about like all the ways that this could have ended, right? One is like he 
it says, no, it, it was me. I was the Joker. I did it. And then he gets executed. And maybe he becomes a martyr or something like that to the movement. Uh, Todd Phillips doesn't want to do that because he's clearly insecure about people taking the wrong message away. And so he can't have him be a martyr, right? And he can't have him be like fully reformed either. It seems it's like the worst of both worlds where like he renounces his jokerness and then he still dies. He doesn't even get to be rewarded for it. You know what I mean? Or like reward, like, I don't know what the reward would be for his sort of like redemption, but he's clearly not interested in that either. It's just the most bleh version you could possibly do. Um, if I may read just this i just got some things that i've kept in tabs ready for our uh, stream on this <laughs> first being oh, no. uh, this is just discussing the film with uh, todd phillips and entertainment weekly the murder trial at the center of joker folia du ends in explosive fashion a bomb goes off and destroys the courtroom after arthur fleck decides to defend himself and confess that the joker is not some split personality of his nor does he even exist it's been arthur all along and he's guilty of the murders he's on trial for uh, quote, he realized that everything is so corrupt, it's never going to change, and the only way to fix it is to burn it all down, director Todd, Todd Phillips told Entertainment Weekly. When asked about having Arthur confess to his sins, quote, when the gods kill that kid in the hospital, he realizes that dressing up in makeup, putting on his thing, uh, this thing is not changing anything. In some ways, he's accepted the fact that he's always been Arthur Fleck. He's never been this thing that's been put upon him. The idea that Gotham, the, the, the Gotham people of Gotham put upon him that he represents. He's an unwitting icon. This thing was placed on him and he doesn't want to live as a fake anymore. He wants to be who he is. A fake? This is what I mean. It's just like, what the fuck are you talking about? Arthur's decision to revoke the Joker is off-putting to Lady Gaga's Lee, who spends the majority of the film trying to provoke the Joker persona to fully take over Arthur's mind. She never calls Arthur by his real name until their last encounter where she leaves him, now uh, that it's clear the Joker does not exist. Quote, the sad thing is, he's Arthur, and nobody cares about Arthur, Phillips said. She's realizing, I'm on a whole other trip, man, and you can't be what I wanted you to be. Phillips also stressed that this final encounter between Arthur and Lee is real and not imagined, as some fans have stated in speculation on social media since uh, the Joker's sequel release, given that there's scenes that are not necessarily happening. He, he was quoted as saying, it, it is actually really happening, which I find very funny for any director to say to their audience after a film comes out. <laughs> <laughs> so, not good. It did happen. You could have drawn all of that from the film, but the fact that we're now getting pieces from him to confirm it, you know, that he doesn't know what the first film was about is a bit sad. There we are. It yeah. happens. I so feel I have... like so much of this movie could be saved if he just bothered to rewatch the first movie before getting into this one. I have uh, 14 fun facts. <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> Number one, all right. the idea. All right. The idea for the film came to Joaquin Phoenix in a dream. Yeah. No. <laughs> I'm yeah. afraid these are fun <laughs> facts. <laughs> these are not fun <laughs> lies. Okay. What is? Um, can you can you elaborate on what part of the idea came to him in a dream? I have not got anything more than that. I'm afraid. It's not to stated. Yeah. All right. Good start. Number two, contemplated putting on a Broadway show before committing to making a movie. Yeah. All right. Okay. Three, Todd sure. Phillips had free reign with Warner Bros. wanting him to do his thing, and the film had no test screenings. Man, Not how yet. many times is this going to happen as a thing, right? Of like, yeah, the, the, the they made so much money. Well, it's just funny <laughs> that this has happened with Warner Brothers twice, right? Patty Jenkins, Wonder yep. Woman 1994, total creative freedom and everybody fucking hates it. And then this comes along with all total creative freedom and everybody hates it. Isn't it iron ironic that so many of the stories that you hear about movies getting, like, damaged and worsened by the like executives and producers and you know so many fingers pointed at them and i'm i'm sure most of them like legitimately but here you have the complete opposite it's so well it's, it's just so... creative freedom like that doesn't like that doesn't tell you anything necessarily 
Um, it could be that the creator had some ideas that were really stupid. Like, I think <laughs> it's entirely possible. No, I, I Everybody said on, understands uh... the idea of uh, suits destroying a film, but they don't understand the idea of maybe suits saving a film sometimes. I think I said on a real BBC, it's like, this is a clear example that the studio interference probably would have made the film better. I don't see how it would have made it worse. <laughs> well, so, um, it, it's, uh, it, it's, I, is it part of your collection, the James Gunn thing? Well, yeah, uh, yes. Okay. All right. That is fact number five. Four is Lady Gaga signed on before the script was even finished, which is just kind ah, of like a, yes, you know, the uh, the sort of the old fashioned Liam Neeson agreed to do yeah, yeah to medicine <laughs> before there was a script. Uh, the class do that. Unwise to do that. <laughs> yeah. Fact number five: New DC boss James Gunn had zero involvement, gave notes to Todd, but Todd did not use them. It is uh, fascinating how James Gunn has inherited all of these failures <laughs> for the yeah. last like, What's funny several to me, years. If I were in charge of all of DC, and then it's like, oh, by the way, that Joker film, the 2019 was getting a sequel, and uh, you want to do a test screening? You're like, sure, or, or even read the script. You'd be like, what the f- what? No! <laughs> <laughs> what? No, 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 yeah. no, no, no. And you write all these notes, and then Todd is like, I don't need your fucking notes. So you're like, okay. <laughs> yeah. Oh, God. I, uh, I, I mean... Man yeah. yeah. No, go oh, on. sorry, it's like you had Um, I find it very fascinating that, with the exception of the Batman and the Penguin, every DC project since like 2020 has been a <laughs> catastrophic failure. Which is a catastrophic lot. failure. Not just like, oh, well, you know, it, it didn't do quite as well as it needed to, or it like, uh, you know, it got real close to breaking even. It's like they, they've all lost like billions of dollars. Yeah. I it really like reminds me of the James Gunn situation of like Bob Chappelle when he uh, oh, the, sort of inherited. Mm. Yeah, cuz like he was rooted out of Disney so quickly even though like he was blamed for all the shitty projects that were coming out even though almost all of them were like con like um Confirmed already or already, yeah, already approved the way, already by Iger, uh, and yeah, yeah. He was like Rob a Iger guy. was the one behind almost all of those projects, and Chappelle just accidentally inherited them. And when they all bombed, he he got the blame. The thing is, we're well into so. bombs for uh, Iger as well now. You know, so like they, they tried for a little bit to be like, yeah, it was JPEG, he he fucked things up, yeah, I'm yeah. back. It's like, no, yep. no. <laughs> that ship was sinking anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's continued to sink. Uh, number six, film had a huge budget, 200 million, including 20 million salary for Joaquin Phoenix and 12 for Lady Gaga. Bad! Bad so idea, 200 million. <laughs> and it should not have you cost think that much. <laughs> Do you think the dream for the idea for this movie came before or after the twenty million? Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. And um, um, I read somewhere that that's uh, this movie cost more than Dune. Yeah, Dune, uh, yeah. Dune cost two hundred million dollars. Kind of yeah, it was like one hundred and sixty something. That's like that. insane, yeah. man. Um, That's ridiculous. Number seven. The musical aspect was largely downplayed in marketing, with director Todd Phillips at first insisting it wasn't one. Now, this is not what? a defense of Todd at all. But after seeing it, I was like, I can kind of understand why one might have said it doesn't go the same way as a musical, but I'd mean it in a bad way. If someone was asking me what I mean by that, I'd be like, well, it's very clunky, confused. Some of the songs sort of cut off. They're all done in different ways at different times with different meanings, and sometimes the meaning is no more or less than the fucking dialogue we just had. Uh, feels like a lot of it is time wasty. Uh, I don't know that stylistically they all sort of match or whatever, and you sort of end up scratching your head a little bit. And um, there's plenty of big old chunks of this film that have no songs in it. So, you know what I mean? Like, uh, musicals... When I think of musicals, they're so much more conventionally slot in into the same section. This one feels like it's a fucking... It got dropped into a vat of acid. To be in... Yeah. Yeah. It it definitely it, I was surprised. I thought there'd be a lot more singing. I thought the musical components would just be a lot more, more. Yeah, like saying it's not a musical, I would never put that in the format of trying to defend the notion that you're heading toward a music. Like if someone said like oh, I don't like musicals, I wouldn't say to them, Oh, don't worry, it's not a musical. I'd be like, it's not really a musical in a bad way. It's kind of weird, and I don't think you're gonna like it, even if you did like musicals. 
this will not change your opinion on not liking yeah. musicals. Number eight. Christopher Nolan reportedly changed the ending of the first movie because it ended with Phoenix's Joker carving a smile. There was no resistance for the sequel with Nolan having left Warner Brothers. I find this one silly. Yeah. Like, you can't have him carve a smile. My Joker does that. As if it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> All right. That's silly. I mean... I felt like it was silly uh, at the end of this film to have it, um, but uh, you know a lot of people are speculating on this the the angle of it being shitty because it's like how could this possibly be Heath Ledger's Joker? And it's like I don't I don't I don't know if it I doesn't have they, to be. Just saying why would yeah? But like you know why does it have to be his? There's a context in which uh, it can absolutely work that um, another man who does the action similar to what we know of a different Joker did so because of the events of this film and this character, whatever. It's just that the way they executed it was fucking horrendous. I mean, I, from Nolan's perspective, I think I understand. I mean, I, I don't know. I would try to be a good sport about it, but at the same time, like, I think Heath Ledger's Joker is the only one out of the bunch who does carve that smile. So I'd be like, that's, why would well, you want to do that? Maybe the, maybe Make this up your is own thing like a poorly translated version of if what if Nolan said like I don't want you making the origin for my Joker yeah, leave it the knows. fuck alone if it was that I can understand that yeah yeah that's how I perceived it mm -hmm. um I mean I I like the imagery of him painting the smile with blood yeah, yeah. I, uh, I like that I think it would have been a bit more awkward if that beat played out with him <laughs> like I think I, I like him sticking a knife in his mouth and cutting it and be like oh that shit would, that would have been worse Jeez. yeah yeah, I think that would have been worse. So, in a sense, it's like cringe that you're saying like that you get to have a monopoly on Joker carving the smile, but I mean, it ultimately resulted in a better choice. Um, yes. So there you go. Studio interference yielded a better, <laughs> a better decision. So you know, it's complicated. Number nine. Also, maybe the motivation. Sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I think also like that smile is such a mysterious part of the nolan's joker it's never he gives so many different yeah. kinds of story arcs story. for it and i would understand why nolan would try to be like don't don't give a like a particular answer that people can like take and run with you oh yeah know? it is worth mentioning the jack nicholson joker gets um i forget what i think it's glass smashed into his face and it does cut up the two sides of his face Hence why he gets mm -hmm. the surgery to... So, like, it's not unprecedented with uh, Nolan or anything. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, so, number nine. Todd Phillips was secluded on a ranch during the opening weekend. We did uh, <laughs> talk about that. That's quite amusing. <laughs> uh, ten. The film was panned by fans and critics currently holding a... And I'm not sure how current this is, but currently holding a 33% critic score and a 31% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. Foster. Finally! The critics and the audiences can unite. <laughs> Yay. Well, wasn't it the, the there's the other score system that it's the lowest for a comic book movie ever? The cinema score was uh, a D, yeah. the lowest ever. That's right. Yeah, lower than Morbius. <laughs> and it's funny because people are saying like, oh, it can't be worse than Morbius. It's like, well, so here, so the reality is most Marvel films are probably, I've not seen Morbius yet. I'm sure it's terrible. Most MCU films are probably comparable in quality to Morbius, especially the Phase 4 movies, Phase 4 and 5. So I always find those observations funny of, like, Joker couldn't be worse than Morbius. It's like, dude, there's probably a lot of films that are worse than Morbius. <laughs> like, What's more crazy? If I actually watch Morbius. Uh, the fact to throw along with it, it opening domestically with 38 point, uh, 37.8 million, you're like, oh, and then it says lower than comic book films like Morbius and the Marvels. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Marvel. Look at how well the Marvels did. Marvels had a two hundred million. Well, I think I actually had a lot higher than a two hundred million yeah. dollar budget in actuality. Um, but yeah, geez, oof. It's not uh, been a good time for comic book movies. One success, a million failures. And then the oh, final. How far they've fallen from their dominance. Final fun fact set being it needs 450 globally to break even and it may lose the studio over 150 million and Warner Brothers Discovery is already 40 billion in debt. It's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. What yeah, a Warner Brothers is how, so how much how much in debt? 40 billion. Holy shit. <laughs> yeah. They're in trouble. That's a how lot of that... debt. How is that possible? I don't know, just very sound financial decisions. <laughs> <laughs> like, 
once you're once you're 10 billion dollars in the hole you're like okay guys let's chill and how how do they still exist also uh, you know, well, they're working we... on it, I guess. They're working on it. <laughs> they're trying to pay it off. <laughs> it probably is somewhat like that, like moving loans around, moving money around constantly, all different promises, long-term deals, and then different projects going up and yeah, going down. Wanna... It's super complicated. It's, it's uh... Yeah, if if you are owed money by them, if, like if, if Warner Bros. owes you money, then the best thing for you to probably do, at least for a while, is to say... We're gonna we're we're gonna essentially hopefully enable them to make money to start paying us back. What you're instead saying instead of oh if, you're in debt, if, so you're if, done. Uh, if they owe money to Water Brothers, they need to go around and say Joker Two's really good. Actually, you guys should go see it. <laughs> That's a good movie. Um, I just Definitely say really check it out. If you Google, what if it? they all went to the theater? They they bought a whole bunch of tickets to make <laughs> money for Warner Brothers so that they can get more money from <laughs> Warner Brothers. So they all went to the movie themselves. If you, if you Google it, the result is very funny. It says, at the end of the third quarter of 2023, Warner Brothers Discovery had a gross debt of $45.3 This is a large debt, and Warner Brothers have been working to reduce it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is a that large, is a large debt. debt. You're right. It is incomprehensibly yeah. large. You should be working on reducing it, yeah. <laughs> That's a good idea. Well, that, I mean, you know, making They're films like this two hundred million dollars is uh, not the smartest idea, I would say. But the first one made a billion, Frankie. It did, and they wanted that billion. But so many, lots of the Mo Mo Captain Marvel made a billion dollars. Aquaman made a billion dollars. Lots of things That's made a billion one. dollars that had really bad performance on their sequels. Like, it is actually Especially remarkable that like, DC's time. had nothing but failures for, like, the last five years, with the exception of, like, the Batman and Penguin, which exist in their own world, which I, I imagine oh. if that's making them wonder, like, fuck, maybe we should, like, really try and back this horse, you know? As they just FYI, uh, I recommend the first three episodes of the Penguin. Yes. First, yeah. Penguin, Penguin's, it's actually, it's been quite impressive. Yep. Uh, lots of, some really quality, uh, writing and some great performances. Colin Farrell just, like, sinks into that role completely. It's kind of weird. I really um, like him. Both the Penguin and Joker 2 needed to be great to justify themselves. One of them succeeded so far, one them, and the other yeah. one has failed <laughs> miserably. <laughs> <laughs> It's it's actually as remarkable, isn't it? Just like what a what an actual disaster for them right now. To follow up one of the one of the most profitable, if you if you compare the budget to the to the actual like profit, it's got to be one of the most successful comic book movies of all time by that metric. Fifty five million dollars to a billion dollars worldwide yeah. gross to two hundred million dollar film. That who knows if it's gonna even how high it's gonna get, like maybe what, like 200, 300 million dollars, so it's gonna lose a shit ton of money. Like, holy shit, what a disaster! And and then this, what this leads yeah. right into Superman next year, which uh, I presume it won't have any impact, like serious impact on that, but like, I don't know, man, that film's got to be good and it's got to be successful. Well, <laughs> final thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, that's the end. I mean, it's, yeah, I don't like it. Don't like Joker 2. Yeah. Agree. <laughs> don't yeah. worry, not expecting closing statements, just if anything, any, anyone else wanted to say anything, because I, I feel like we really have covered it. It's just, mm -hmm. it's annoying that that happened, you know? Would have been nice if that didn't happen, but there we are, it's happened. Yeah, it's uh you mentioned it the other day, Moller. It's been uh it's been a bit of a not great <laughs> in terms of, of a like, rocky year. You know? Yeah. I wonder how much of that is well, because you know, Star Wars Outlaws is a recent I mean, obviously there was no <laughs> expectations for that one, but holy crap. That was Well we've had highlights. Uh, we had Madam Web. That was fun. Deadpool the Wolverine was a huge <laughs> disappointment. For us, yeah. <laughs> for us. Yeah, that's yeah, that's yeah. We still got Arcane. That's coming soon. Oh God, please! <laughs> I hope it's good. If if it's not good, that it's going to be a really twenty twenty four. Going to become gonna the be Joker. A, we don't want that. <laughs> Fun year in terms of anticipated films and TV shows not padding out so very well. Oh yeah, Romulus. Arcane Fuck. is my last yep. hope. Romulus.
Ugh. Mm-hmm. I've brought two is Thank another. I'm, I'm really hoping that's good. Mm. Hoping what's good, sorry? Uh, Nosferatu. Oh, yeah. You know what's funny? This is probably naive of me, but I was like, that's obviously going to be good, right? Why would it not be? <laughs> so well, like, yeah, I certainly hope so. <laughs> it's like, it's I, shouldn't, I shouldn't think that way. That's just asking for... Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The monkey's paw has got plenty mm-hmm. of fingers left. <laughs> no, and it's not even the monkey's paw. Because the monkey's paw, at least you get something. You do it's get just something, like, yeah. It's just like shitty. When, that would like, be funny. It's the like, price you have to pay. But it, give me a Joker 2 sequel. Or give me a Joker sequel that gives you the Olea dude. And you're like, okay, monkey's paw, this was a bit much. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah. It's like, ah, I told you. You're like, no, come on. That's silly. Give me an ice cream at least. Oh, I saw mm-hmm. someone earlier say that jukebox musicals are never good musicals. Um, Singing in the Rain is one of the best movies of all time, and that's a jukebox musical, so you're wrong. <laughs> Singing in the Rain is great. Enjoy this. No, I, like, I, don't wanna, I, I don't like it if we end up making these broad, sweeping statements about how you should just not it's do a thing in a movie. Film. It's like... Yeah. This this movie's gonna regress yeah. a whole bunch of ideas because that's what I felt like the first one did the opposite of. It was like you don't make a movie solely about Joker, or you don't make an origin for the Joker, or you don't make a movie that uh you know, like the the ending isn't even clearly the good guy wins or that the world is better off. Like it, it bucks a lot of those sorts of things, and it did well. And people enjoyed it and found meaning, and it's like, there you go, see, it's tough, but you can do it. You just gotta really do it right. And then this movie happened and mm-hmm. fucked everything up. <laughs> this one's easy to write off as not For the Joker record like canon. we recommend against multiverse time travel resurrection but all of these things can be done in such a way that you're like fuck that was good man yeah, of course yep it's like yeah. like a lot of things a lot of ideas the, there's very few if any ideas that are like intrinsically bad so much of it is it's the execution how well do you do it I there think is we'll... it, it, it... no go on do it. I insist. <laughs> oh you my must. god. I think we'll live to see the day where Todd Phillips just wakes up in the morning and decides to rewatch Joker 1 and issues a public apology. <laughs> you get the Danny DeVito meme? I get it now. I get it. <laughs> but it's his own movie and years later. <laughs> I'm sure we'll see that one day. I don't know why, but I'm sure. Yeah, maybe. Well, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm yeah that's. Movie. I'm, <laughs> I'm happy to be that. done with this movie and never yeah. speak of it again, except as a terrible example of what to avoid, so that generations into the future will learn to not repeat these mistakes. Before <laughs> we go, Nutsa, what are you up to on your channel? What's happening over there? Why should people go and check out your stuff? Oh God, um, what am I? Do? I just. Uh... Like, 10 days ago, posted a video about Acolyte, which is so... so, so, (laughs) I'm sorry, I can't talk. Um, It's not cliche at all, of course. And yeah, I mean, I'm working on a few new videos um, that I'm not going to say yet, because I'm not set on anything. However... I'm very sleepy, so... Yeah. All right. I have a question. Well, <laughs> she, she's made question. several videos lately about the sequel trilogy. You went back over them to oh, see yeah, how they're those, holding up. Those. Highly recommend that. Those it's a little like, happen. hey, remember they happened? Let's let's truly see if they're still... They're bad. That's the conclusion. But well, you plenty of that, that, uh, unique insights. Well. well, wait. So you got that. I would, I would say that the audience would be interested in checking those out, especially because uh, our audience aren't too too big of fans of the sequel trilogy. They're like into it, but yeah. you know, it's like a... Yeah. Um, and then, of course, a, um, an acolyte breakdown as well uh, of what you most hated about it. Uh, with different, broke into different sections, be it each of the characters, the broad storytelling points, and some stuff about Leslie Headland, our favorite uh, showrunner. Thank you. And then, yes... Um, <laughs> A video that I, I kind of wanted to play on like a, a meme fab at some point that you made. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's a um, good video. I like it. It's very, yeah, very it's amusing. Well, thank you. Uh, go and this is very sweet. People in chat, if you search Dear Disney, you're homophobic, you'll get a very amusing animation that kind of gets into a point <laughs> that I think Disney are going to start rolling out more and more as the future goes on. 
which is, uh, you know what? Well, you know what? I won't spoil it. Go watch it. You'll find it very amusing, like I said. So, thank you a lot. Thanks for, thanks for coming on. It's been fun. Mm -hmm. When are, um, <laughs> when are you and Fringy going to do an animation collaboration project? Mm. Mm. I have no idea. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, well, I have no idea. Idea. <laughs> but that everyone sounds there, fun. Know. But I'm mm. not that confident in my drawing or animating skills, unfortunately. I'm not but, that confident you know. either, but yeah, <laughs> but still, maybe. And uh, okay, Mr. Capital Opinions, what about you, sir? What have you been up to? Oh, hello. Um, well, I'm working on a big uh, reaction response video type thing that'll come out soon. Uh, we stream on the channel every Sunday, talking about movies and stuff. We did one not too long ago with Muller and Fringy about how good David Fincher's Gone Girl is. Yes. Mm. Yay! Go check, check it out, that guys. Out. That was how long? It's Seven happened. hours or something? <laughs> yes. That was we a talked while. a lot about it. Six uh, hours, yes. We got to gush go. about Gone Girl, uh, which really yes. have an opportunity to do so, I suppose. So thank you for facilitating that. We enjoyed it. Oh, no, no problem. Uh, talk about movies mm -hmm. every Sunday. I think this Sunday we're doing The Sixth Sense, so sometimes there are older movies that maybe you haven't seen. We did Mars lot, Attacks so. recently. Yeah. What was the conclusion on we that? Did. Oh, it's fun. It's it a is a fun, fun movie. movie. I like That's a fun movie. <laughs> That's the short version. Yeah, so uh, come check it out. I love and the title for that stream, by the way. Maybe eventually. Ack, ack. Yep. <laughs> Fuck devs. Yep, eventually, before I die, that will be done. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay! I love that every time we're reminded of you working on it, me and Rags have like a bit of PTSD of having watched that show. Oh my god. <laughs> I can feel uh, the shudder through the shears. I hate that show. Terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Show. But hey, there you go. Plenty of creative projects on the way. You, you fellas in chat and ladies are probably familiar with these two, and we thank you both for joining us. Uh, Free and Rags, anything you want to mention before we, of course, talk about the, uh, um, the plumbos? Uh, because of other stuff that's kind of popped up and, you know, a little bit of EFAP prep and things of that nature, um, I should have a video. I thought it was going to be done by now. Uh, but like maybe like Monday probably is when it's all going to be done. I want it to kind of all be right to be like the, oh, these back to YouTube videos and stuff and to get that rolling out. So I want it to be right and be at a good time where I'm going to be around like for the day and stuff like that, uh, to, you know, just be around. So uh, probably around Monday ish. And then I'm planning to do, um, more stuff after that. That'll probably be a bit quicker for me to put out. And I'm thinking around Halloween. I don't know exactly what day I'm gonna be doing a a or an amnesia uh, the bunker stream on yeah. my channel for like a Halloween thing. And um, if the hoodie sale. <laughs> Wait, we'll measure that in a second. Uh, we'll do that. In a okay, second. okay, okay. So that that'll be kind of what uh, I would <laughs> say to look forward to. Probably about a Mondayish video. Then regular stuff after that, and then late in October, uh, Amnesia the Bunker stream. Mm hmm. Be yeah, very interesting to know what you think of that. Uh, it's unfortunate the result of uh, Afterbirth that we didn't Ugh. immediately jump on it. Um, but had Bunker released instead of Afterbirth, which would be kind of funny. We probably would have made an episode on it, me you and Mel. I mean, we did okay. Afterbirth. We probably not we in, not, not in the yeah. sense that I mean that it's so good we'd have to. I just mean in the sense that we probably would have whatever the game was. And what I'm saying is like we didn't because they killed our interest in them after as a, as yes. a development studio, unfortunately. So, um, oh yes. But we'll probably have a bit of a back and forth about it once you've played it. See what you think, and it'll be fun to watch that right. stream. Bringy, what are you up to? Uh. I mean, nothing at the moment, just, I mean, other than just working, basically, nothing, <laughs> nothing particularly, nothing to announce, really. Other than you plan to stream Amnesia the Dark Descent, no? Yes, but uh, I haven't figured out my plans for that yet, so I figured I'd talk about it when I figured out, you know, when and... and it is difficult to was. say whether all of us will be, what will be doing on Halloween night, because uh, open bar is Halloween night, so it's like, uh... It's kind of yeah, weird like, to aim things around. We're not even sure if we're doing an EFAB the prior night. We probably are. Because we want to do like a Halloween got, one. Probably. It is the worst time of the week for fucking and... Halloween night, you know? Why couldn't yeah, it be Saturday every year? Like, it's so rude. The holiday <laughs> part. We're like, oh yeah, like family and hanging out with IRL yeah. friends and things of that nature. So that, that'll that probably be what I do for most of Halloween. And I guess we got the EFAB before Halloween, so the Halloween stream will not be... It'll just... It's Halloween... 
it's the correct season. It's the it's the month, okay? So we may it's a spooky it's month. Season happens. It will probably happen at some point. We may month, be probably not happening while it's Halloween, at least briefly in Australia. That's the best we can do. Yes. Well, not Ooh. briefly in Australia. It'll definitely be Halloween in Australia the whole the whole time. Oh well, there you go. We win. Yeah, Halloween right. stream. Woo. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Reuploaded the next day, which is Halloween night. Until, Perfect. Yeah. Until later. Well, uh, with that said, we do have the plushies. Look at them go. <gasps> Beautiful. Yo, yes. yes. Speaking of Halloween, look. For those who look. are still unaware, no somehow, we have ran our Halloween special set with me as a vampire, the Ragzo Lantern. <laughs> That's the French. Yeah, Ragzo know. Lantern. Um, Via Wolf and, and Fringo the Ravo. He's Raven. You know, that's, it's, you could tell from yeah, that look. expression, he's the kind of guy who goes to clubs. And he's like, yeah, do it. <laughs> with his skull. <laughs> that's and the best. Yeah, yeah, you gotta be careful with it. It's a, it's a, it's a cuddly scythe. You know, it's not gonna hit look, you. It's, big, it's a fluffy one. Yeah, look yeah. at it. <laughs> um, limited edition, of course, you got 20 days remaining before they're gone forever. This, this Halloween, right. specifically the 2024 one. And a crazy addition to our little team here is an EFAB hoodie. Which if you're interested in Look. picking up, you get them all together, you get 25% off the whole lot. Just yes, which is a an appreciable nice. discount. An appreciable discount, so bear that in mind. And uh, I have been made aware recently that Wolf has promised that if each of the four plushies get over a thousand units sold, he will indeed stream Lord of Ring Gollum. Now that's uh, that's quite a, a treasure because I wanted him to stream. Ordering that game. more right now. I, ooh, look at that. Let me put in my credit card information <laughs> to buy even more because I want to see that. Wow, um, <laughs> playing Gollum. I know that that will be something everyone will be curious to see. Um, I suppose now, if if you is there anything you wanted to mention, Rex? <laughs> yeah, particular? I yeah, absolutely, sure. Why not? Hey guys, guess what? If the hoodie sales reach. 1,000 or more, I will do a stream of Lord of Ring Gollum as well. So we have not played it before. We are, we are, yeah, our Gollum. Too unofficiated. You know, well, mm, it was myself yeah, that's right. as J Longbone and Metal. So there's still plenty here who have not had their own experience that I just, I feel like it would be pretty intense and amazing to watch uh, Rags and Wolf playing it, but. We got some goals yep. to reach in, in, in order right. to get and there. By right? the way, the hoodie is the hoodie. I know it's a new thing, but I do have one here that they sent, so I could double check it, make sure it's a okay. It's a pretty good hoodie. Not gonna lie. I know I'm biased, and I want you guys to buy it, but it is a nice hoodie. Fits well, feels warm, nice material, and a nifty design. I think. Uh, so I would I would absolutely recommend the hoodie. If um, y'all could buy 999 of them, that would be <laughs> each <fucking> <laughs> solid, okay? Um, yeah, it's worth mentioning. It's like, uh, I don't really have one attached to this because I'm already set in one. Uh, if Metal reaches 10k subs, which he's getting precariously close to, I will be forced to play through all of Scar of the First Sin on stream with him when he visits this year. So that's going to be the fun zone that I'm up to. And I'm sure he's mentioned on a couple of his streams as well. But yes, uh, grab them while you can. They're right there, and they're very cuddly. Also, yeah. check out a Nightmare on Elm Street EFAP movies that have been dropping out gradually. We've just done the third, and the fourth Dream is going to be... Dream Warriors! will be tomorrow, I think, if my time yes. is correct. Yes. And then, of course, I'm also on Friday Night Tights tomorrow, and then the day after, we're doing the first half of Agatha. Oh. Agatha on Saturday <laughs> EFAP. First five episodes. Be there. It was here. We're gonna all go along. through it with a we're gonna go through it with a, a very thick tooth comb. A fine tooth sledgehammer. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't rings of power in that shit, okay. Well, oh yeah, for those who don't know, we've done the complete coverage of Rings of Power, which clocks in at like fucking thirty five to forty hours or something. It's it's oh insane. Oh my god. So, oh, it's like four and a half hours per episode. We uh, lots of Waldrick appreciation throughout that arc. Good stuff. Waldrick's great. Waldrick's great. But yeah, that's that. Thank you all so very much, and uh, enjoy the, the 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 this and and whatever happens next, and the rest of Halloween with Efab. We've got 
Plenty of things mm-hmm. coming your way. Woohoo! Oh, yeah. Right. We yeah. will see you later. Thanks see for showing later, up, everybody. everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye 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 bye.